Will the meeting please come to order? Will all members of the council, as well as the public, please rise for the invocation and remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. The invocation this evening will be offered by Council Member Brenda Haywood at the request of Pro Tem Sherry Weiner. Big, say something. She's mar it's showing on. Try it again. Good afternoon. There you go. Could you please bow your heads? Most gracious Heavenly Father, Father of the universe, Father of all that is and all that will be, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity as elected officials to serve our community. Heavenly Father, I just pray that as we serve, we will not serve out of selfish intent, that we will serve by your divine will and your divine way. Heavenly Father, give us understanding and give us wisdom and give us knowledge as we make a difference in the lives of our community. Heavenly Father, we just lift up the elected officials. We lift up everyone that's in all of the communities, Heavenly Father. And then, Heavenly Father, we just ask you in a very special way, Heavenly Father, to have us to serve in a way that will be meaningful to you. Heavenly Father, as we proceed in this meeting, Heavenly Father, I pray that everything will be done decently and in order. Heavenly Father, as it says in Numbers, Heavenly Father, thank you. Bless us. Bless us and keep us. Heavenly Father, we just want you to know that we do not take it lightly and we want to serve in a way that it would be meaningful in your world and in the lives of your people. We pray this in all of the prayers in the mighty, precious name of Jesus, we do pray. And all God's children say thank God amen. and amen. amen. I pledge allegiance. You may be seated. Without objection, we'll suspend the calling of the roll and ask the clerk to record the names of those members present throughout the meeting. Is there a motion for the adoption of the minutes of the meeting of July 17th? Without objection, the minutes of the meeting will stand approved as written. Madam Clerk, are there any messages from the mayor? Yes, there is a message from the mayor. Dear President Pro Tempore and members of the Metropolitan Council, pursuant to regulations of the Tennessee Comptroller's Office, the attached report on debt obligation must be submitted to the Metropolitan Council and presented at a meeting of that body before it is filed with the Comptroller. As approved by the Metropolitan Council in RS 2018-1254, this $183 million water and sewer revenue commercial paper program began on July 10, 2018 and will expire on July 10, 2021. Please find below a link to the city's investor relations page for additional information. www.nashville.gov slash finance slash office of the treasurer slash debt slash investor relations dot ASPX. Sincerely, David Browley, Mayor. Thank you. Okay, I want to uh, announce that there will be an election for the new pro tem and that election will be held August the 21st, 2018. We're now going to move to elections and confirmations. Council Lady Haywood. Elections and confirmation, we want you to know that the Agricultural Extension Board, we took a look at the reappointment of Mr. Bobby Edwards for a term expiring August the 1st of 2021. We voted five for and zero against. You've heard the motion for confirmation of Mr. Bobby Edwards to the Agricultural Extension Board. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Next, Absolutely. we have the Gas, Mechanical, Examiners, and Appeals Board. 
we have the reappointment of Mr. Mark Bandy for a term expiring August the 21st of 2022. The vote was 8-4 and 0 against, and we move for confirmation. Thank you. You've heard the motion for confirmation of Mr. Mark Bandy to the Gas Mechanical Examiners and Appeals Board. All in favor? Opposed? Motion passes. Council Lady Haywood. The next reappointment is for Mr. Jeff Zimmerly for a term expiring August the 21st of 2022. We voted 8-4 and 0 against, and I move for confirmation. Thank you. You've heard the motion for confirmation of Mr. Jeff Zimmerly to the Gas Mechanical and Examiners and Appeals Board. All in favor? Opposed? Motion passes. Council Lady Haywood. Next, we have the Procurement Standards Board. We have the reappointment of Mr. Don Harden for a term expiring July the 20th of 2021. We took it to vote and we have eight for and zero against. Thank you. You've heard the motion for confirmation of Mr. Don Harden to the Procurement Standards Board. All in favor? Opposed? Motion passes. If you would please stand as I call your name. For the Agricultural Extension Board, Mr. Bobby Edwards. For the Gas Mechanical Examiners and Appeals Board, Mr. Mark Bandy and Mr. Jeff Zimmerly. For the Procurement Standards Board, Mr. Don Harden. On behalf of the entire Metro Council, we thank you for your willingness to serve and to volunteer your time and expertise. Thank you. We're now at bills on public hearing. We're happy to hear from the public on each bill. You will be given three minutes to speak, and during that time, we ask that you for first share your name and address for us, and we ask that you try not to repeat what others have said in the interest of everyone's time. The first item is Resolution RS 2018 1315, sponsor Scott Davis exempts East Nashville Beer Works located at 320 East Trinity Lane from the minimum distance requirements for obtaining a beer permit. Councilman Davis. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I'd like to open the public hearing, please. I'm sorry? Thank you, Vice Mayor. I'd like to open the public hearing, please. We're going to do a I apologize. Report Committee first. reports, please. Thank you. Can Council Lady Roberts. Thank you, um, Ms. Madam President. Public safety voted four in favor, zero against. Thank you, Councilman Davis. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I'd like to open up the public hearing, please. Would anyone in support please raise your hand? Would anyone in opposition please raise your hand? Seeing no one on either side, Councilman Davis. Mm, I guess I'll move for approval. Having been properly moved and seconded, Councilman Davis, Anthony Davis. Extension, please. Councilman Davis has been recorded as abstaining. Councilman O'Connell. Thank you, Madam President. I, I, I have a vague recollection of this matter, but I believe that I have consumed a beer at this establishment previously, and I'm just, I'm kind of curious if I did so in violation of any local laws. Councilman Davis, you want to move approval? I'd like to uh, move approval for this very delicious beverage. Thank you. Having been properly moved, seconded, and drunk, all in favor? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. We now move to RS 2018-1316, sponsors Shulman and Verter, exempts Goha Ethiopian Restaurant located at 2413 Shoemate Lane from the minimum distance requirements for obtaining a beer permit. Councilman Shulman. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, committee report, please. Council Lady Roberts. Thank you, Madam President. Um, public safety and beer voted four in favor, zero against. Thank you, Councilman Shulman. Thank you, Madam President. Call for the public hearing. If anyone is in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. Anyone in opposition, raise your hand. Seeing no one in opposition, does anyone in favor wish to speak? Seeing none, Councilman Shulman. Thank you, Madam President. I would move for approval. It's been properly moved and seconded. All in favor? Opposed? Motion passes. 
RS 2018-13-17, Council Lady Roberts, exempts Harding House Beer Brewery located at 904 51st Avenue North from the minimum distance requirements for obtaining a beer permit. Council Lady Roberts. Thank you, Madam President. I'd like committee reports, please. It would be your committee. Public safety voted four in favor, zero against. The floor is yours. And I'd like to move for approval. We need to open the public hearing. Oh, sorry about that. I'd like to open the public hearing, please. Anyone in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. Anyone in opposition, please raise your hand. Seeing no one in opposition, does anyone in favor wish to speak? Seeing none, Council Lady Roberts. I'd like to move for approval. Having been properly moved and seconded, all in favor? Opposed? Motion passes. RS 2018-13-18, sponsor Kendall, exempts Minerva Cocktail Bar, located at 1002 Buchanan Street from the minimum distance requirements for obtaining a beer permit. Councilman Kendall. Thank you. Um, I'd like to uh, get the committee report, please. Council Lady Roberts. Thank you, Madam President. Public safety and beer voted four in favor, zero against. Thank you. Councilman Kendall. I'd like to open public hearing. Anyone in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. Anyone in opposition, please raise your hand. Seeing no one in opposition, does anyone in favor wish to speak? Seeing none, Councilman Kendall. Move approval. Having been properly moved and seconded, all in favor? Opposed? Motion passes. We are now on bills on public hearing. BL 2018-1170, Council Lady Lee. Madam Chair. Changes, uh, hang on, let me read the caption. Changes six point, I'm sorry, changes 6.03 acres from AR 2A to SP zoning for property located at 12452 Old Hickory Boulevard to permit up to 53 multifamily residential dwelling units. Council Lady Lee. Well, Madam Chair, I would like to ask for committee reports. It was approved with conditions, disapproved without by the Planning Commission 8 and 0 on February 22nd, 2018. Thank you, Madam Chair. Then I'd like to um, make a motion. Oh, open the public hearing, please. Thank you. All in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. Anyone in opposition, please raise your hand. Seeing no one in opposition, would anyone in favor wish to speak? Seeing none, I declare the public hearing closed. Council Lady Lee. I'd like to move for approval, please. Having been properly moved and seconded, all in favor. Opposed? Motion passes. We're now on BL 2018-1245, sponsor Sledge and O'Connell. This has been approved by the Planning Commission, applies a neighborhood conservation overlay district to 42.96 acres for various properties along South Street, Villa Place, Wedgwood Avenue, 15th Avenue South, Tremont Street, and Edge Hill Avenue. Councilman Sledge. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. Move open the public hearing, please. Would anyone in favor please raise your hand? Okay, thank you. Anyone in opposition? Go ahead and put your hands down. Anyone in opposition, please raise your hand. Okay, anyone in favor wishing to speak, please line up in, the, in front of the lectern. Go ahead and line up in front of the lectern if you wish to speak, please. I better go to this side. Maybe over on this side? Uh, yeah, right here. If you will, go ahead and come up to the lectern if you're first in line. Share your name and your address, please. I'm Walter Searcy, a 20 year resident of 1029. Villa Place, 37212, smack dab in Great Edge Hill. And I'm here today to speak in support of the conservation overlay, the least obtrusive overlay that a community can seek. Uh, the community of Edge Hill is the only urban community that heretofore has not benefited from an overlay. Uh, what are the benefits for us for an overlay? Well, the benefits are that we continue to preserve neighborliness. When we have a community that is no longer inhabited by neighbors, 
then neighborliness also disappears. What do I mean by that? Well, we have great visitors to the community, but because they're visitors, they leave after a short period of time. They don't become stakeholders in the community. We don't see their children if uh, for a brief period of time, and they don't get a chance to interact with our children. And we don't build the kind of integrity in the community that once it's lost, it is rare to regain. We still have some of that in Edge Hill, and we want to preserve what remains of it. We also wish to preserve the African-American historical predicates of the community, a community that at one time was known as the African-American Gold Coast of Nashville. And many of those residences, not enough of them, but many still remain. I live in one. Others of my neighbors live in others. And we simply wish the council to recognize the importance of this effort and to support community over investment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, council members and staff. I'm Karen Caladimos, and for 18 years I have lived at 907 Villa Place. My home is contributing, and it was built in 1905. I love history, I love antiques, my home fills my soul. Yes, owning a historic home is a lot of work, much like serving on the committee for the overlay. Still, both give me joy. The relationship with my home and its history, my immediate neighbors, all function to provide a sense of neighborhood for me. Edge Hill has given me so much, and that is the reason why I support the, support the overlay, in a sense, to pay it forward. As you can see from the timeline, we worked diligently to include the community during this two-year process. It began with and continues with relationships with our neighbors, with EVNA, and the coalition. We knew we had to establish a process and engage as many residents as possible to determine the best tool to achieve the goals of residents, known neighbors, and those we haven't met. Equally important, we had to abide by the coalition's mission, which is to engage residents to help shape the place we live, to problem solve, to address concerns as a community, to determine solutions that provide long-lasting improvements for our neighborhood's livability. The coalition and its subcommittee provided us a foundation found in the, that the neighborhood conservation lay, overlay was best to help protect Edge Hill's rich African-American culture and preserve historic homes. Overall, we held eight community meetings. We announced each meeting through the coalition listserv, the ENV, EVNA listserv, placed flyers on doors, and talked to our neighbors. Eight of us, including myself, were involved in canvassing from October of 17 to February of 18. As politicians, you know, you know that it's impossible for everyone to be home, no matter what day you choose to um, go out. So it took us four months. Our purpose was to provide information to residents, to assess whether or not the community wanted the overlay. We answered questions, documented if they supported, opposed, or were undecided. We listened. We did not insist on a yes or no answer. The goal was to know if enough residents wanted to proceed with the stated process. We also documented if the property was rental, a short-term rental, vacant lot, or a construction. During canvassing, each of us respected our neighbors. Our goal was to provide information, to address any concerns, to announce community meeting dates, to listen, to see if our neighbors wanted to go ahead. Once the survey was completed, we felt confident that the majority wanted this. We believed with 50 collected signed signatures of support and voiced 
support in addition to that, we could move ahead with the legislative process. Our council per members filed and we passed unanimously as historic and planning and now we're asking for your support. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, council members and staff. My name is Theo Antoniatis, and I live at 1720 15th Avenue South. For 15 years I've lived there. Um, I'm in a 1930s home that falls within the boundaries of this overlay. Um, I chose this neighborhood because it has a solid, a rooted presence uh, with all the hallmarks, hallmarks of a place uh, where one can put down roots. It has deliberate planning, thoughtful architecture, a strong community, a real history. So my wife and I did plant roots there. Um, we started a family, worked on our home for the last 15 years, uh, planted trees. We've loved living in Edge Hill. Uh, uh, we're learning about its history, meeting our neighbors, participating in alley cleanups, taking part in the community. A few years ago, though, it started to become glaringly apparent that there were some issues. Consistency, scale, uh, proportion, and historic protection were out the window. Uh, nowhere to be found. Uh, it started to feel a little bit like the Wild West in Edge Hill. Um, and so uh, I started to become involved in uh, finding ways to help mitigate uh, this. You've heard a little bit from Karen, and you'll hear some more about the process and the timeline, so I'll just add a few points to that. The main concerns we were hearing from neighbors were twofold. One, in light of the rapid pace of growth, how do we bring some sense of cohesion and consistency to the streetscape of our neighborhood, especially considering that height allowances were raised to 51 feet after Nashville next. Two, how to protect and preserve the history of Edge Hill as we watch historic homes being demolished. Um, together with elected officials, government officials, it was determined that this, a conservation overlay which you have before you now, um, is the only tool that accomplishes both of these. It's not an urban design overlay, not a contextual overlay. Historic has said it, planning has said it, this is the tool, please. Subsequently, Historic Commission took the necessary time to uh, survey the neighborhood and determine a contiguous area um, that would qualify for this protection. After that, a detailed professional architectural survey was done of each and every home by Catherine Hatfield at MTSU. After that, we worked with Metro Historic and asked them, how do we make this tool, which is already the least restrictive, um, more tailored to the Edge Hill neighborhood? Many residents, including myself, wanted more flexibility to add parts to their second stories. So uh, Historic came back and said we could have dormers on the front and the rear. Others had concerns about rear setbacks for properties that abutted commercial. That was taken into consideration. Even up to today, guidelines are being adapted to build consensus and meet the needs of residents. So um, we really truly need your support in this matter. The question before us, I believe, is this. Are we doing our civic duty right now to protect what has come before us and what is the legacy that we as a community are leaving uh, in this as we navigate this area, uh, era of growth in our city? So please, um, it's time for Ed Shell to get this consideration and protection that it deserves. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, council members and staff. My name is Joyce Harris. I live at 1401 Tremont, where I've lived for 44 years with my husband. The home that we live in was built in 1926, and it's been in the Harris family for 79 years, and it is a contributing home. And we want to save the sunlight uh, that we were able to do a couple, 10 years ago. So we want to continue to save the sunlight for our home. I am a retired and proud grandmother of four grandchildren. And I've been retired since 2014, and I rarely step away from grandparenting for anything. However, during the past two years, it has been very important to me and very worthwhile to work with the Edge Hill Neighborhood Coalition Conservation Overlay Committee. After the Edge Hill Conservation Overlay was deferred at the June 28th Planning Commission meeting, we understood that the deferral was decided upon to give the Edge Hill community more time to work together. In early July, I became a co-chair of our overlay committee, and the committee with other Edge Hill volunteers continued to work to be inclusive and transparent with our neighbors. Some of the tasks and activities that appear on our timeline that I would like to call your attention to include, one, just the development of a trifold that specifically answered Detail, detail, detail form questions about the overlay that were generated by residents. The brochure was mailed to all Edge Hill residents. A second activity that we are proud of is that we all became foot soldiers. 
and foot soldiers, uh, we were going around the community with a very brief needs assessment to not only talk about the, or hear about the overlay, but to hear from our neighbors about what they liked, what they didn't like about the neighborhood, what were some of the needs that they would like to identify. We actually completed, walking door to door, 82 needs assessments with our neighbors. On July 24th, we had a community informational meeting overlay over food over fellowship. A neutral panel of experts answered questions from all residents who attended and the questions came for residents so that the agenda could be resident driven. 100 <coughs> people attended. We mailed 249 postcards for that meeting. I know my family helped. Uh, in addition to these activities, we also conducted small meetings with other neighbors who had interests and concerns about the overlay. We corresponded with others about the things that we were planning, asking for people to be included in those activities. And again, all of these things followed after the directive of let's work together so that we could be inclusive, transparent, and begin to build some consensus with our neighbors. Thank, Thank you, you so much. I would like to ask that once you've spoken, if you would go back out into the mezzanine, there are people out there that need to be able to come in so they too have an opportunity to speak. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, council members, for your time. Uh, my name is Ben Tran. I'm a resident and homeowner at 1022 Villa Place, which is in the proposed overlay area. I am in strong support of the conservation overlay in order to preserve and enhance Edge Hill's community and history. You will hear from the opposition that overlay supporters have been unwilling to negotiate and work towards a consensus. But this is not true. We have listened and compromised previously and continue to do so. After the Planning Commission meeting last Wednesday night, concerns were raised neighbor to neighbor about equity, questions of equity, specifically for African American residents, and solutions to some of these issues. And in the few days since that meeting Wednesday night, supporters of the overlay have listened to and indeed taken the very ideas of the opposition and have been in active dialogue with the Historic Commission and Council Members O'Connell and Sledge. So in our conversations, we have proposed modifications to the overlay guidelines, modifications recommended by the Historic Commission. We have allayed concerns about financial disparity and restrictions on space. We have clarified criteria for historically contributing homes and non-contributing homes. We have agreed to form an advocacy group com comprised of neighbors on both sides to help residents with questions and issues about the overlay and to mediate on behalf of residents. To put a neighborly face to the overlay, which can be abstract and of specialized language. Significantly, this will provide us a forum to continue to discuss and communicate about the overlay. Our discussions and compromises have already had an effect. As evidence, I want to close with a message from my neighbor and fellow neighborhood advocate, King Holland, who lives on 911 14th Avenue South. Quote, I have recently learned about the ongoing dialogue between the two sides of Edge Hill's conservation overlay. These discussions towards consensus are necessary for an effective and fair overlay. As, pro as process and, cri and criteria are communicated to and for the sake of residents. The two sides idea to form a neighborhood support group for the overlay on behalf of residents is also a crucial and necessary step for the overlay. For these reasons, I write in support of Edge Hill's conservation overlay, end quote. I too am personally committed to continue working on the overlay because I truly believe in it and we can come to consensus. Thank you. Thank you, council members. My name is Matthew Sullivan. I'm a homeowner at 1002 15th Avenue South. I know many of you and uh, I love my neighborhood. I've uh, brought two babies. My wife and I brought two babies into the neighborhood and 18 years later we have two more and we're sending two to college on the ONE scholarship. So uh, we're 
we're grateful to be a part of the fabric of that community. And I think you all understand how special Edge Hill is. And we do feel threatened. Uh, there's a giant 10-story crane at the end of my block. Uh, I have family who come in from Ohio to visit. We walk around and they uh, say, what, what is that? What is that? Where did that come from? And then they say, don't you have anything to regulate what happens in your neighborhood? And we are unprotected at this point. So we have sought a sane and reasonable tool to, um, to keep Nashville the special place that it is. That's all I can really say. I've been a foot soldier for the last nine months. I've knocked on a lot of those doors. I've gotten, I've seen a lot of support for this overlay and um, just report to you that uh, Edge Hill is special. I hope to keep it special. Thank you. Hi, my name is Allison Schachter and I live at 1022 Villa Place. And I also wanted to convey that my neighbors, Ashley and Ben Shoemaker at 1500 South Street and Jim Epstein and Sherry Baird at 1300 Villa 1304 Villa Place also asked me to share their support for the conservation overlay. I'm so proud to be part of such a diverse, vibrant, and historic Nash Nashville community. The opposition will say we are a neighborhood divided, but that is not true. We are a real community talking to each other and working out our differences. There has been so much misinformation circulating recently about what the overlay does and does not do, and about the people that volunteered their time to shape, to, um, to shape this community. If you look at your, our timeline, you'll see how diligently we have followed this protocol, how much dedicated volunteer work has gone into this by grandmothers, by TSU students, parents, et cetera, and neighborhood leaders. There are maps circulating that don't capture an accurate account of the neighborhood and community support or the diverse people that live in these homes. Some have been scared by news that their property values will plummet, that they can't retrofit their homes for wheelchairs, that they can't renovate at all. None of this, if you look at the guidelines, you will see is true. And we cannot let this misinformation hide the spirit through which this overlay was created. For those of us who live here in Edge Hill, this neighborhood is an extraordinary gem, not only for us, but for the city as a whole. I love my neighbors, the community, the walkability and historic architecture, and we must preserve this for future generations. Imagine if the William Edmondson home was still there, how it would so beautifully tell the story of Edge Hill and Nashville's most important and nationally known visual artist, how it would be the cultural epicenter at the Mural School Park for not only Edgewood, but for surrounding areas like Wedgwood, Houston, and the 12th South neighborhood. Imagine if the Julia Stewart Bell home at 1021 15th Avenue South had not been demolished in 2017, a home that was the cultural and literary center for the African American community in Nashville, where writers, poets, composers, and musicians, many associated with the Harlem Renaissance, were frequent guests. The overlay will protect our community, will protect these beautiful historic homes, and Nashville's rich history for generations to come. Thank you. I am Randy Parks. I live at 1606 18th Avenue South. Uh, I am reading this statement on behalf of Joel Dark of 1027 27th. Thank you. I am reading this statement on behalf of Joel Dark. 1027 15th Avenue South, who is professor of history and associate dean of the College of Liberal Arts at TSU, who lives in the proposed over overlay area. Speaking last week in support of the Edge Hill Neighborhood Conservation Overlay, Planning Commissioner Brian Tibbs observed, once these houses are gone, and I always say this, it's gone. There is nothing left. We can talk about what used to be here. The Edge Hill neighborhood contains some of Nashville's most important history, but much of it is tragically very much a matter of what used to be here. The Edge Hill neighborhood started as an African-American community formed in 1863, 1862, almost immediately after the Union occupation of Nashville. It reportedly began on one street in a school built by Northern Quakers and grew quickly into a residential community called New Bethel, encompassing about one square mile. The Lawrence School, which later merged into Carter Lawrence, was likely this 1862 school. During the 20th century, urban renewal and the construction of Interstates 40 and 65 completely reshaped the landscape of much of Edge Hill and largely removed visible connections to its prior history. 
but the western part of Edge Hill, including the proposed overlay area, was the exception. The architectural quality of this area and successful community efforts to contain the expansion of music row preserved this part of the Edge Hill neighborhood. In recent discussions of Fort Negley and the William Ed Edmondson home site, the Metro government has made wise, long-sided decisions to protect, quote, what used to be here. The Edge Hill conservation overlay is a critical and perhaps final opportunity to do the same for a part of for a vital part of Nashville's history that is still here. Thank you. Good evening. First of all, I would like to thank the council members for their time and attention, which has been considerable uh, regarding this issue. I'm Dr. Dira Myers. I have lived for nearly 30 years at 1025 15th Avenue South. My first view of my 1896 home and the neighborhood of Edge Hill was love at first sight. I was delighted to find an old-fashioned, quiet enclave. Because I had an old dog, I walked two or three times a day the sidewalks of 15th Avenue South, and as a consequence, I met many of my neighbors within a matter of days, some of whom were in their 90s. And we had many, many conversations on their front porch. I learned about William Edmondson, Edge Hill sculptor who used debris, limestone blocks from homes that had and buildings that had been destroyed. And uh, I learned very recently that in 2016, one of his pieces sold at Christie's in London at auction for $785,000. He set a record for outsider art. I learned about Deford Bailey. He was the 20th century harmonica genius. He was also the first African-American country and Western star and was on the Grand Ole Opry from its very first program until in 1926 until 1941. I also heard about Tennessee Williams as a boy playing in Edge Hill because his grandparents lived right around the corner on 17th Avenue South and he spent every summer with them. I couldn't believe the richness of this neighborhood and I have had the most wonderful neighbors anyone could possibly imagine. A closeness that is rare, unbelievably rare, in today's world. But within the last three years, the fabric of that neighborhood is being ripped to shreds by predatory developers and by investors masquerading as residents. Uh, residences being, uh, homes being said to be residents who are, who are actually Airbnbs. I was very suspicious of some of the sales that I'd heard about in my neighborhood, but I don't base my beliefs on hearsay. I went to the property assessor's office and I found that my suspicions were true, that many elderly residents of Edge Hill had been targeted, that developers and others had waved checks in their faces and believing that these were extraordinarily large amounts of money. These people said, oh my goodness, I'll be on easy street the rest of my life. And they accepted the checks and they sold their property. One horror story. Thank you. $50,000. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Zilstra. I live at 1015 Villa Place, uh, which is really square in the uh, zone that we're talking about. Um, I've moved there in 2006 with my wife, and um, we are very strong proponents of this ordinance, as you might imagine. Um, but I want to talk today not on behalf of myself, but on behalf of my son. Um, he was born there in 2008, and um, he's had the benefit of many of the privileges of living in that neighborhood, but something special to him happened to that uh, neighborhood in the very recent days. Um, because he is the son of the president of the Neighborhood Association, he also gets the benefit of attending many of our neighborhood 
meetings. As you can imagine, some of those get quite contentious. And a nine-year-old sitting in a meeting looks around and says, what is happening to my neighborhood? So he stood up after the meeting, and he simply walked to the microphone and did something that almost nobody has done in this process. And he said to everybody there, I love my neighborhood. I love my neighborhood, and I would like you to love it as well. And I would like to convey that message to you, because it is quite simple that what we ask for you to support is the love of our neighborhood for us and our children. Thank you. Well, that was my husband, and I didn't expect him to talk my ch about my child like that right before I got up here. That was kind of moving to me, and I hope it was to you, because it was a really moving moment for a kid to realize that we, we have way more in common than we do that separates us. And even in this issue, that's true. So I'll back up a bit. My name is Rachel Zilstra. I've lived in the neighborhood um, since 2006. I have a contributing home um, that I'm really proud of and spending lots of love and money to uh, make it beautiful um, for the next 110 years that someone will live after us. Um, I have a deep, deep love for Edge Hill, and I own a company, I volunteer at my son's school, I do lots of things, but I spend so much time in my community that some people think it's my full-time job. Um, my job, my role in my community is in community engagement. Um, I. I work really hard to make sure our neighbors know what's going on in our neighborhood. We have a 300 plus Google group, kind of a private group, that we share information. Um, and um, if you reference your timeline, you'll see where it says EVNA, you know, sent out a notice. There were so many more notices that were sent out encouraging people. And although I'm personally very for the overlay, our neighborhood association didn't take a stand on that because um, it was too big of an issue. And I'm really glad that the Edgehill Coalition was formed with all of our neighborhood associations working together to be able to tackle um, an issue this big. And so I jumped in to volunteer with the coalition um, to help because I kept hearing it on my community meetings and through emails and I were always outside on our big southern front porch talking with neighbors, and we would hear the desperation and the need to protect. And so when the coalition was formed and looked for tools to help protect and preserve, I was all in. And my job has not to been to, uh, it's not to use my EVNA voice to convince my neighbors, because I think the information does that, but my job is to encourage our neighbors, whether they're for it or against it, to participate. Um, and we've been very neutral with that, because I do think that we need all of our neighbors to participate, and I've been really proud with the integrity in which that um, our pro group has uh, worked diligently to um, understand the needs of our community and to come together. So I ask you today to honor our two plus years of work, um, the diligence and the integrity in which we did that work um, by passing this today. Thank you. Uh, good evening, council members and staff. First of all, I'd like to thank you for your time and your consideration with regard to this historic overlay. My name is Vita Ciccolello, and um, I am a resident in a home that was built in 1930, uh, 1720 15th Avenue South, um, and a homeowner. Uh, I'm, I'm just here to basically passionately um, request that you vote yes today in support of this overlay. It is the only tool that uh, this neighborhood has at its disposal to protect itself for future generations um, um, I guess that's it. Everything's been said so eloquently. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead and come on up to the lectern if you're next in line, please. Hello, my name's Rodney King. I own a home at 907 Villa Place. I've lived there for 21 years. In early 2017, when we started the process of looking into how to conserve our neighborhood, the Historic Commission estimated that 30 percent of the homes in Edge Hill would be eligible. It turned out to be five. That's how much we lost in just two years. As you can't see from this map, our overlay only covers a small sliver of the neighborhood. The history is important. You've shown this to be when you voted to protect both Fort Dangley as well as the William Edmondson home site and community garden. We're asking you to complete the triad of preservation in Edge Hill 
and help us protect our homes. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead and come on up to the lectern, please. One more thing. Uh, I ask that our map be submitted. Go ahead and take it. As part of the record. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Donald T. McCord. I am for the conservation overlay. I've lived on, uh, lived at 15th Avenue South, 1008, for over 62 years in a home that my father built. My grandmother, my grandfather, my uncles, my aunts, cousins, friends, church members, my kindergarten school teacher, second grade school teacher, even a doctor that delivered me when I was born. Beautiful homes are still standing in our neighborhood and still looking good. Developers will come knocking on my door, dangling money in my face, trying to get me to bite on the bait to sell the home that my father worked so hard. For, and I tell them it's not for sale because there are some things money cannot buy. And one thing money cannot buy is mercy because real mercy comes from the heart. And we are at the mercy of this council to save the character of our community, the character that our forefathers worked so hard for to build not only in our neighborhood, but in our city. We are at your mercy to say enough is enough and not allow these developers to come into our city with their deep pockets full of money and greed and tear down our community and put up theirs. And most of them don't even live here. So please, sirs, please, ma'am, please save the character where we live, move, and breathe, our community and your community. Thanks and God bless you. Good evening, council. I'm Ronald Miller, 905 Villa Place a lifelong residence of Edge Hill. I probably live in one of the oldest houses in this Edge Hill overlay. Tonight I come representing the Edge Hill Coalition, which I am the co-facilitator. The Edge Hill Coalition is the past, the present, and the future of Edge Hill. Our members are organizations within the community that has put together many programs over the years, scholarships for the Edge Hill students. We talked about Merrill School, you've been here in the William Edmondson Park. It was members of the coalition, their group, that made the park available so that the fence and the yard and the fields would be plowed and pushed down and a track was installed. It was the coalition members that saved the polar bears. Tonight you will see opposition as well as the, us representing the polar bears. Through a grant, we saved the polar bears from being extinct. And what we're asking today is that our community be saved. Our members did the first Metro Police partnership the Civic Design Center in 2005, Neighborhood Gardens, first time home buyers. We are not new to trying to keep Edge Hill a community. We led a change in the, from an R6 to an R6A and many more. We worked together with our opponents diligently and still working with them. We would love to see this overlay pass to keep the character 
because we've always heard when I was growing up, Edge Hill was right. It was a low hanging fruit. I think it's time for us to move up the chain a little bit so we're not so low and be picked on. We know that we worked hard over the years to keep Edge Hill a community and the rich history and our neighbors are friendly and beloved. We that live there appreciate Edge Hill. We believe wholeheartedly that the support of the conservation overlay it, as we want to beautify and keep the history and the neighborhood to live on. These historic homes were built on strong foundation and we too stand strong in our conviction to preserve the integrity of the ATL community. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Rob Benchoff and I live at 916 14th Avenue South. Uh, I also own a non-contributing home within the proposed overlay area at 1016 15th Avenue South. I'd like to talk to you today about the early stages of the timeline for the proposed overlay. So several years before we started the overlay process, it was common to talk with neighbors about how the new construction was out of scale with historic homes in the neighborhood and how we were losing our historic homes. Uh, and people talked about what to do about it. Um, EVNA used to have a thing called Thirsty Thursdays, or we still do, where we talk, you know, people get together on porches and discuss various matters. And so uh, that was common discussion back then. So on March 13th of 2017, at an EVNA meeting, I addressed the group and told everyone that we were exploring options for overlays for Edge Hill. I told everyone there would be a meeting at the Edge Hill United Methodist Church on the 29th of March, 2017. And Rachel Zilstra, the president of EVNA, said that if anybody would like to work on this, to contact me or her. <clears throat> so, let's see. On March 15th, 2017, the overlay committee formed at the coalition to uh, work on uh, looking at various overlays. So on March 29th, 2017, our meeting with, uh, we met with Brandon Burnett from Metro Planning, and he told us about various types of overlays. And I believe in that first meeting, we talked about the UDO. And we met again with Brandon on May 4th, and uh, we discussed other types of overlays, such as the contextual overlay and the conservation overlay. And then on, uh, May 22nd, we met with the Historic Zoning Commission with um, Robin Ziegler, and she talked to us about the conservation overlay. And we started to see where the conservation overlay was probably the best fit because it would preserve historic homes and it would new construction be, would be within context of the existing construction. So, and then our first big community meeting where everybody from Edge Hill came was um, at the Midtown Police Precinct, and both of our council members were there, along with Robin Ziegler from Historical, and that was on 8 30, 2017. No, excuse me, that was on 9 6, 2017. So after that, we went out canvassing between 10 5, 2017, and 2 4, 2018, and uh, you've heard, previously heard about our canvassing efforts. So, let's see, our next big community meeting was at the Edge Hill United Methodist Church, and we'd already been canvassing. We'd put out flyers and told everybody about the meeting, put flyers on everyone's door in the overlay area, and we met to discuss the overlay, and again, the Historical Commission was there along with our council members. So then we had a, a third community meeting on 5-2-2018 with our count. Okay, thank you. My name is Caesar Harris. I live at 1401 Tremont Street. That home been in my family at least 80 years. I'm 70. I was born in Meharry. Uh My family lived at 2518 Jump Street. We still got our family home that's from 1948. Then that's my mother's home. I'm sure about a few days later, my daddy grabbed me as a baby, took me out south to Tremont Street. So, uh, his family can see me. Someday you know that home has is, is been in my family and really vital and important to me. I love that neighborhood. Uh, I just 
want to keep it traditional. And I've, and I've said, as the young folks say, if y'all, you all don't approve of the overlay, we don't have no restriction on what outsiders, investors, and most of the folks out there don't even live near, wasn't even born nowhere near Nashville. All they about is, I don't know, I'm not going to say. But uh, I just want to keep the integrity, and as the young folks say, don't let the dogs out. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Jennifer Jones. I've lived in Edge Hill for 19 years. I live at 1031 15th Avenue South on the corner of Tremont and 15th. I look at Caesar just about every day. Our families are friends. Um, I'm here to speak about preserving the history of Edge Hill. Um, I love my home. I love the character of the neighborhood. I love the story that it speaks, that it is still able to speak this small portion of it anyway. And my house is 1,060 square feet, and after reviewing everything and watching it, I have no fear that I'm going to make a beautiful addition that I'm going to love for the rest of my life. Granted that I live a long time, but thank you so much for your time and attention to this. And uh, I sincerely ask that you could um, vote in favor of the overlay. Thank you. It's okay to come up a little bit closer so we don't have quite so much time between speakers. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Carrie Gibson. I live at 1027 15th Avenue South. I've been uh, there almost eight years. Uh, you heard remarks uh, read out on behalf of my husband, Joel Dark, earlier. Um, I would like you to support this overlay, and I would like to echo uh, the words of my neighbors, uh, Caesar Harris that you just heard, uh, and Reverend McCord. Uh, when we talk about neighborhood character, we're not just speaking about bricks and mortar in Edge Hill. It's also about the character of a neighborhood that has survived an awful lot and hasn't just survived, but flourished. And the only thing I want to add is that one of the reasons that this matters to me is because the house that I live in was built by Reverend McCord's grandfather. His earliest memories are of the porch that is now mine. And so, for our family, our house is not just a building. It's going to be, it's one of the uh, contributing houses. But I hope that in the testimony that you've heard this evening, that the historic character of Edge Hill is understood not just to be bricks and mortar of these homes, but what they represent both uh, in terms of the story of the history of Nashville, Nashville and one of its oldest neighborhoods, but also the people that make it a community. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is LaRotha Williams, Jr. I'm Associate Professor of African American and Public History at Tennessee State University. And um, I don't live in Edge Hill but many of the people that I consider friends, many of the people that I've come to love since my arrival at Nashville, in Nashville, do. So that is why I'm here today. I'm in, here to speak in favor of the overlay. Could you, um, could you state your address for us, please? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Could you state your address for us, please? Oh, 920 Wonderland Pass, okay. Hermitage, Tennessee. Um, but I can speak to Ed Hill in that Every class I teach, we talk about historic memory. That is, we talk about what we remember and what we forget. Um, we talk about the development of communities from slavery to freedom, and Edge Hill very much figures into that narrative. We look at how these communities develop, but we also talk about how they don't develop in the way that they do by accident. Most of the things that govern the way Edge Hill looked in 1920, 19th century to the 20th century, those decisions were made right here. So this body 
plays a very powerful role in, in how Nashville will be viewed in the future. I humbly submit to you that a lot of the things that we listen to today, a lot of music we listen to today that make us bob our heads and tap our feet came from musicians down in Edge Hill. If you listen to gospel, if you listen to any of the music that, that, that led to many folks to consider Nashville to be the, the Vatican of the South, folks in Edge Hill had something to do with that. You know, those, a lot of those folks have gone on home. You know, we've buried them in Greenwood Cemetery. And the only thing that we really have left that reminds us of their presence is the built environment. So I'm going to submit to you and request that you do everything in your power to protect those bungalows that are in Edge Hill, to protect those churches, to protect those spaces, because they are very, very, mu very, very much important in how Nashville will be viewed today and in the future. Thank you. Hello, my name is Wynne Chip Boyd. I live at 1715 Villa Place, and I am for the overlay because I feel that it's an act of solidarity and recognition of history. Um, I hate for Edge Hill to be yet another neighborhood in the process of gentrification. Um, we know what that means when we look at Harlem. The history of Harlem has been largely erased, and that's, that's the most blatant example, but I really want us to remember everything that Edge Hill has represented and to not let money and profit be more important than recognizing the history of this neighborhood. And I'm very proud to live in a multiracial, multi-economic um, neighborhood. I think it's really important that we hold on to that because it's, it's rare. Thank you. Um, good evening, my name is Zaya Mutu. Uh, I live on Villa Place too, and I'm a 18 year old TSU student. So we moved in the Edge Hill neighborhood in 2008. We loved the fact that it was racially mixed neighborhood and one of the few in Nashville. Our position on the conservation overlay is that it is a way to respect the African American history of this neighborhood. I personally believe that those who have been here for 20, 30, or even 40, 50 years should have their voices heard first. They may have childhood memories in, in Edge Hill. That is a form of wealth which should be as important as property value. Also, a harmonious neighborhood, architecturally and socially, is more enticing for future families than more of the same new structures that we have, that we have today. So we have a choice to make for Edge Hill. Do we want buildings for short-term rental and Airbnb outlet run by people who don't even live in the neighborhood or even the same city? Or do we want to live in a real neighborhood? I believe it is better for us all to look at ways to live together in Edge Hill, preserving the old trees and the old houses and historical elements that we still enjoy. And the overlay will be a step in that way, in that direction, please. Thank you for your time. Good evening, Council. My name is Sarah Wells, and my husband and I live at 908 Bradford Avenue in Nashville, which is not within the proposed overlay, but it's within the Waverly Belmont overlay that was passed a few years back. I'm speaking on behalf of the overlay. I am for the overlay because I would love another small area of Nashville to have residents that can remain stewards of their homes and of their community just like we are in Waverly Belmont. Thank you, and I hope you will vote for the overlay. I'm Carrie Conley. I live at 2405 10th Avenue South. I'm also on the board for the 12th South Neighborhood Association. Um, prior to that, I was the lead to get the Waverly Belmont overlay in place. I will say what that overlay did for our neighborhood was bring the community together. Neighbors met people that they had never met before, but even more importantly, we preserved the historic character. I unfortunately was victim prior to that of a beautiful bungalow and seeing my wonderful neighbor who worked for the Metro Public Schools basically conned out of his home. Um, two gigantic tall skinnies were put in, no trees replaced. I have zero privacy. 
my yard floods because none of the trees were replaced. Um, and it's not even about me. It's the people that live in those new homes have already moved out because they're already falling apart and had such issues with the contractors. So as much, no, no homes are built like they, they were back in the day. There is, there is no way that anyone to this day is gonna build something that was built in the past. And I think more than anything, this isn't about money or it's, it's about community and thinking about our neighbors and what's best for the long-term diversity and, and economic, economical status of all these residents that have lived here for years, have been in Asheville for 13 years. So I'm urging you to please vote for in support of the overlay and please listen to the actual residents that live in their homes full time and have been there for years because they are the ones who are impacted the most by this. Um, but once again, I just think once it's gone, you can't get it back. And there's a reason why we need to remember and preserve our history. So thank you and I hope you will support the overlay. Good evening, council members. Um, my name is Jack Sullivan. I'm 19 years old, and for 18 of those years, I've lived at 1002 15th Avenue South uh, in the Edge Hill community. And um, I'm here today with my family, including my brothers and sisters, uh, Aiden, Maggie, and Nora, uh, as a young voice in support of the overlay. Um, I just graduated from high school, and I'm going to college next year as a beneficiary of the Organized Neighbors of Edge Hill Scholarship. and um, this scholarship was created by members of our community to support young people like me who have dreams of going to college and live in Edge Hill. And um, this is the kind of supportive community that I think that this overlay can protect and foster. Um, and I hope that we can help this neighborhood continue to be the kind of place that supports young people like me and their dreams and aspirations. And I think that the overlay can be a small part of making that happen. Thank you. Good evening, Council. My name is Carlos D. Ford Bailey, and I'm the grandson of the country music icon D. Ford Bailey. I didn't grow up in South Nashville, but my parents did. And he played on the Grand Ole Opry for 16 years. And once he had retired from the Grand Ole Opry, he opened a shoe shine parlor at 12th and Edge Hill for years. And he gave back to this community over the years. And I actually grew up on part of the South Nashville, just coming to visit him. His, he last presided at the Gurnett's home right here at Twelfth and Edge Hill, and he gave back to the community over the years. I had a chance to come out uh, on his behalf and just perform for this side of Nashville over the years. And um, he even took guns off the street. He loved guns, I have to say, but he did it for a perfectly good reason. He would um, buy guns from the guys just to get them off the street. He um, brought animals in off the street, fed dogs. He loved dogs as well as I do. And uh, just over the years, even my mother and father, they got married at 13th and South Street, right up under the big oak tree right there. It's a lot of memories for me out here. And uh, I'm just asking you to just stay with the overlay just for my memories and the city still has a lot of character at that end of the city. Thank you. So good evening, Council. And I'm Terry Chapman, and I moved back in to 1721 on 15th Avenue South, it's right across the street from Belmont College to take care of my mother who was diagnosed with a terminal illness. That particular house has been in our family for 44 years. And I can tell you that I fell in love with the neighborhood again just by going on a tour of the Belmont Mansion. Now, I had lived across the street from Belmont for many years, and I had never toured the Belmont Mansion. And there I learned about the freed slaves that stayed and farmed that Edge Hill land, and they built their families, and they built homes there. There's history in Edge Hill. There's still history today. It's one of the last historic African-American communities in this city. It would be a shame, a crying shame, for you to vote for developers to erase and to silence that history. There's a deeper controversy that looms very vehemently. Um, and, and, and basically, I'll just tell you the truth. This gentrification 
It has divided the neighborhood. There was a controversy there long before the overlay. There's a socioeconomic divide, and yes, there is a racial divide in Edge Hill, something that this overlay cannot remedy overnight, so don't get it twisted. Something else that really bothered me was a developer that stood in front of the Planning Commission on last week in front of African Americans to say that he purposely was moving people out of the community to move in better people. I got a problem with that. So I encourage you to vote for the overlay. We are fighting for history. We are fighting for more than just short-term people that come in and out with these Airbnbs who don't even live in the neighborhood. We are fighting for the conservation of our homes. I'm fighting for black history. So please vote for this overlay, because a vote for Edge Hill is a vote for Nashville. Is there anyone else in the queue to speak in favor? Okay, we'll now move to anyone in opposition. Please come up to the lectern to speak. Please share your name and address. Again, once you've spoken, if you would please go back out to the mezzanine so those that are out there can come in. Floor is yours, thank you. Good evening, my name is Jill Bader and I live at 1220 Villa Place. I respectfully request the council vote down the Edge Hill overlay. I am a Nashville native and a first-time homeowner. I moved to Edge Hill a year and a half ago and specifically purchased my home without an overlay with intentions to change my home over time as my family grew. My fiance and I are eager to stay in Edge Hill to raise our children. Since we met, we have been dreaming and planning and saving for this future in this community. For over 100 years, the members of our neighborhood have changed their homes to accommodate their changing families. We want this too. After examining the details of the overlay guidelines, we recognized it was not the right choice for my family. A majority of our neighborhood agrees and does not support this overlay, as shown by the map you all have received. How do I know we are the majority? Because I have personally gone door to door to nearly every home within the overlay with my neighbors, Charles Howe and John Moore, to speak to our neighbors. We found an overwhelming majority of residents we spoke with were not in favor of this overlay. Worryingly, we discovered dozens of neighbors' views inaccurately submitted to our city councilman as proof of neighbors' preferences. After discovering these inaccuracies, our opposition group repeatedly offered to jointly canvass the neighborhood with leadership supportive of the overlay to ensure an accurate accounting for each home so these errors could be rectified. We were denied this request by the leadership of those supporting the overlay. We also offered to halt our opposition work to work together on another zoning tool that would accomplish many of the goals of both groups. Members of our opposition group examined preservation tools to present, prevent irresponsible and predatory development, as well as ways to honor and protect Edge Hill's history. They looked at other neighborhood plans for growth and spoke at length with those involved on their pathway to a solution. But any discussion of tools other than the overlay were denied by leadership of those organizing. So we asked the vote to vote down this overlay because earlier efforts at compromise with this bill on the table have blatantly failed. We are the majority opposed. I had hoped to live in a community rich in diversity of thought and respect for others. I have been greatly upset by this entire process, personally targeted and my intentions and good name called into question by many of the neighbors I had hoped to raise my children alongside of. I am deeply, deeply hurt. I appreciate and love the rich history of Edge Hill. That's why I chose to live here. I value my neighbors' concerns about a growing, changing community of Edge Hill in a growing, changing Nashville. I share them. I grew up here. A neighborhood is more than our buildings, it's our people. And as such, I want to work on a different solution with them. But I remain committed to representing the over 100 neighbors that I spoke with in these months opposed, including Millie Smith, Lillian Betty, Rachel Schaub, and others. We do not want this overlay, and please vote as such. Thank you. My name is Charles Howe. I live at 1009 15th Avenue South. I've been asked to represent a number of the neighbors uh, that we believe are in majority that do not want the overlay. Frankly, uh, I feel like uh, a number of the neighbors woke up one day 
born-again African-American preservationist. There are also are people who are true believers in preserving history. But all of them together feel like they must baptize the other neighbors by the sword if necessary. They are not willing, they were not willing to compromise until this last weekend, I met with a number of them. We've discussed some possible ways that, that would mitigate these effects. But I've been told by a number of people that if I spoke out to represent the neighbors as asked, that those things would not happen. There, from the side of people against it, they feel they're being coerced with this process. These are property owners. These are neighbors that I know. I've lived there for 25 years. A number of these neighbors have lived here much longer, some, some two times, three times as long as I have. It is something that the neighbors feel is being done to them and not for them. It's not an opposition to preserving African-American homes. The homes at this point are largely owned by white people. Gentrification has already happened. The black people that still live there largely live in the homes that they've lived in for decades. They're much smaller homes. We have all resisted the tremendous onslaught of development and developers. That's why we're still there. We are not looking to tear down a neighborhood. We are not the ones that remain in our homes that are doing anything to any other neighbors. It's just that there are a lot of accusations, a lot of acrimony, and f frankly, if this passes, I feel that a lot of the people living in the neighborhood, the majority feel that this is something that will be done to them. This is probably the first time that a historic overlay is being put on an area against the will of the majority of the people. So if I advocate strongly for the people who are in the opposition it's because they have requested that of me. I have been charged to do that. It is something that I believe that we should vote down. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Elizabeth Crook. I live at 1509 Villa Place. My house was built in 1930 and someone had beautifully renovated it and preserved the exterior as it was before I moved in. I got to know all of my neighbors in probably the first week I was there. One of my favorites is Alva Jean Robinson, who lives across the street and who has lived in her house since 1953. She's called me three times to say, you are telling them that I am opposed to this, aren't you? She and her husband were both teachers in the metro school systems for years. A community is about more than just the buildings. It is the buildings and the people. One of the things that I have cherished, and I think everyone who has spoken has cherished, is the fabric of our community. We know each other, we speak to each other, we pat each other's children, we have each other onto our front porches. I have every belief that both sides of this want to protect not only the heritage of the buildings, but the heritage of the community that exists. I have no doubt that the people who started the coalition had that in mind and that they, in fact, intended for it to be inclusive. However, when I started going to the meetings, I realized that there was a large and equally diverse group of people who were dramatically opposed. Had I been on the pro side, I would have said, let's wait a minute. Maybe we didn't talk to everybody. Maybe we need to open back up again. And I think that that has certainly been the intent of those of us who want you, beg you, to vote down this resolution so that we as a community can come together and work through this again and do it right this time. Because now, even if we save buildings, we will have fractured the very fabric of our neighborhood. So I ask that you vote this down and send us back to the drawing table to learn how to play nice. There are many factors that have led to the gentrification. My neighbor across the street came back to create a home for his son and his, and his nephews. When property values started to go up about three or four years ago, uh, his siblings wanted the money out. He couldn't afford to buy them out, so he's gone. There is another family that were moved out of their house because they were renters and didn't own their house. So there are lots of reasons that have come 
about in addition to people who are greedy, yes, but I will bet you that there's no one out here in a white shirt tonight that wants there to be tall skinnies, who wants there to be a, a, a glossing over of the amazing history of Tennessee, of, of, of Edge Hill. Believe it or not, I got my master's degree from Tennessee State, partly funded by a minority scholarship because it was back in the 70s and I was about the only white face on campus. So I picked this neighborhood. It breaks my heart to see what is happening. And I hope that you will vote down this resolution so that we can come together and rebuild the fabric and the connections between people because after all, that's what's most important. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, I'm John Moore, and I'm here also in opposition to this measure. This is wrong. Our repeated offers to jointly come canvas the community with representatives from both sides to confirm an accurate account of the neighborhood's preference was refused by the leaders of those supporting the overlay. Our opposition also invited those in support to work together for the community consensus, but they refused. We appreciate the good intentions of the organizers to celebrate our history and protect the growing, changing Edge Hill and the growing, changing Nashville. We want this too, and have asked for the opportunity to, to discuss different zoning tools other than the one they chose that most of us can agree to. We personally went door to door to nearly every home within the overlay and found a majority of the neighbors not in favor of this overlay and dozens of neighbors preferences were inaccurately submitted to our city councilman. After discussing these inaccuracies, we repeatedly offered to jointly canvas the neighborhood to ensure an accurate accounting of each home to these errors so these errors could be rectified. We were denied this request by the leadership of the supporting uh, overlay team. I repeat, the opposition found flaws in their survey, flaws in their representation, too many flaws in, repre in residential buy-in. Can this pro overlay actually and truly and fairly request of the Metro Council a law for all the neighborhood based on that? You have to make sure that people understand, first of all, what it is you are proposing regarding this overlay. Here's a report that is pr 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 provided by the Historic Commission. And I think there's a section here that was provided by Bobby Lovett. It says Bobby Lovett on the first page. But anyway, I read a little section here, this paragraph. It says, middle-class whites began to move into the neighborhood between Hillsborough Avenue, which is 21st Avenue, and 15th Avenue. African Americans, who had outnumbered whites nearly two to one in 1890, and that's after, that's after slavery were soon living mostly in middle streets from 14th Avenue to 10th Avenues. There's nothing on here about Villa Place or 15th Avenue. So I question whether the, well, they may say that the African Americans moved here in the uh, 30s, maybe 40s, but they can't say they had anything to do with slavery. So um, I think I'm done here, but uh, I'll just say I'll stand with the neighbors who share my opinion our group does not want the proposed Edge Hill overlay as it is proposed. We want to re-establish, re start over, and get a 100% uh, assessment of every neighbor in the overlay and not leave anyone out. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Effie Booth. I am a reader for a resident of the Edge Hill community. I'm reading this letter on behalf of Kurt Taylor of 1409 Tremont. Dear city council members, please vote down the proposed overlay. I am one of a majority of residents who does not want this overlay. There are over 100 people in our group out of the 228 homes in the proposed Edge Hill Conservation Overlay who oppose this overlay. Our group is primarily residents, both old and new, of all different races and ages. Again, please vote down the proposed overlay. Thank you. Hi, 
My name is Vishnu Jayamohan. I'm representing 1713 Villa Place. And I respectfully, respectfully request your support to oppose the overlay. As something that's being promoted as a way to unite the neighborhood, it ironically has done nothing but divide the neighborhood and upset a majority of the neighbors uh, who are opposed to it. I'm saying this for three key reasons. One is the desire to preserve a community is not necessarily related to the size or shape of a building. Uh, I think it's probably not a fair characterization to say that folks who have built newer homes or renovated their existing homes don't want to be part of the community or are not part of the community. And so um, that just doesn't feel like a fair characterization. A lot of what we've heard uh, in this meeting before from the those for the overlay has been around short-term rentals. And I think that that's a separate issue that really doesn't relate to whether a home is new or old or tall and skinny or fat and short or whatever it is. The second thing is um, we've tried to reach out to the opposition. Uh, most prime example is we simply asked if we could have a transparent door-to-door -door count hand in hand with those that are uh, proposing the overlay and we were turned down. Yeah, you heard a meeting referenced, for example, in the Midtown Police Precinct, where, which was held by those that are in support of the overlay, and never once, not once, did they ask us or allow us to speak, uh, which we found to be very disconcerting, again, given how much of us, the majority of us, being opposed to this. Um, the third thing is I, I just really think the investment is what's revitalizing the neighborhood. It's making it vibrant. Uh, it's bringing great people to the community, and I love to see uh, that investment continue, and I'd like to make those own investments myself. I don't want to be told what windows to have or what kind of brick or whether I have to use brick, uh, and it's one of the key reasons that I moved to the Agile community. So with that, I urge you to reject this overlay. Just uh, take a look at the folks behind me and how many of us are just against this, and it's one of the most divided issues uh, as reported by the media and from what you've seen and heard from the last meeting. So clearly the whole neighborhood is not together, and that's no way for a neighborhood to propose something with that much division. So I appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, good evening. My name is um, Alan Messer. I am a resident at 1019 Villa Place. And um, I have been in, in the Edge Hill neighborhood for 40 years. I am a uh, resident owner of this property uh, for 24 years. I am against this, this um, overlay. And quite simply, several of us, including myself, were voted out of information um, regarding the overlay. Uh, we were pushed out of the um, uh, community um, um, communications association. And that's simply wrong. So I'm against this. I think it should be put down. Thank you very much. And, and by the way, I live in a 100-year-old house plus, and I honor that history. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Mike Slarve. I own a, a house at 1508 Edge Hill. My house uh, falls uh, on, a, on Edge Hill right across the street from the Edge Hill um, commercial center, Taco Mamacita. Uh, on my street, there are uh, the house, the two houses to the left of me, if you were looking at my house, would be 1979 and 2012. The house to the right of me was built in 2018. The house next to that is actually a church that was built in 1949. One of the homes attached to the church and part of the, the church is a, a older home, I believe was built in 1901. Then after that are homes that were built in 2012, 2017. So it's a very mixed neighborhood. There are tall and skinnies uh, on one side of me and on the other side of me is a uh, 12 bedroom, 12 bath monolith. I. Um, my home is, uh, was built in 1906. It is a craftsman style. It is beautiful. I love it. I do not live there presently. However, I plan on retiring there in a very, very, very short period of time. My plans when I originally bought the house, I'm an ex-general contractor, by the way. 
Uh, I looked at the um, zoning and I wanted to be sure that I could add on to the house because I wanted a, a bigger residence than is there. If this is approved, it will uh, eliminate all of my plans for the future. And also will, uh, basically there will be these giant homes around this uh, one little uh, um, craftsman style, which looks completely out of place where it is. I think that uh, in the neighborhood uh, in general, uh, there have been already a lot of homes that have gone up that are of the newer style within, from 1912 forward, uh, excuse me, 2012 forward. And I think that those homes um, have their own uh, flavor, of course, and architectural design that probably does not uh, match the design of a lot of the Victorian homes that are in the neighborhood. However, most of those homes that went up uh, replaced homes that were dilapidated and small. And very rarely do you see one uh, take on a, uh, or be put in the place of a beautiful uh, Victorian like my own. I do not know anybody who, who had a house like mine that would want it torn down. I mean, there's a lot of beautiful features to it. So I think that trying, okay, thank you. Hi, council members. My name is Dan Gotchberg. I live at 916 Villa Place. You've heard a bunch of arguments on both sides. I don't want you to get bored to tears, so I'm going to try to bring up a new issue that you haven't heard yet, and that's to what do, how does the city currently deal with the power it has over homeowners, and how should that inform your decision today? So I tried to get a permit this last month to fix out my attic, separate my kids into separate bedrooms. I, I showed up at the permit office, told to go away. They were full. They wanted to see me. I asked if I could make an appointment. No, we don't do that. Can I uh, submit the documents online that are required? Nope, we don't do that. Can I call someone to ask a question to make sure I have the right documents? Nope. Your only option is to go camp out starting at 7 a.m., and then they'll see you. Everything is geared towards making it easy for the city government without any sort of thought of you having power over homeowners. This isn't because city government workers are bad. Every time I talk to one, they're competent, they're diligent, but this is the best we're doing right now. We should have hesitancy to turn over more power over homeowners given the way the city is dealing with the power it currently has. Thank you very much. Hello, I am the grandmother of one of your residents, Tana Smith. She lives at 1013 uh, 15th Avenue. She's been there for several years. She went to school in the neighborhood and chose to buy a house in Edge Hill. She loves it. She walks her dogs, meets all of her neighbors. She doesn't want to change a lot of things, but she does want to build her own and make her home what she wants it to be and to, to have her family grow up in that area. And she is against it. She is in on a business trip today. She is a young, young woman, but she is definite in her ideas. She loves the community and she wants to participate in its growth and keep it and preserve it, but she is against the overlay. Thank you very much. Hello, good evening, Councilman. Um, my name is Trey Fanjoy. My family and I own the home at 1722 15th Avenue South. Um, rather than speaking about my individual situation, what I really, really hope to appeal to all of you is that what you can see from just sheer numbers, these stickers, this is a community that is beyond divided. The majority of people in the community oppose the overlay. And I am asking you to vote this down. Let's try to get this Edge Hill community together to find some, some kind of compromise, some kind of way to honor the community, respect the community, and work together. 
This has been the most divisive thing, and it's going to be something that's way worse than people not liking each other's architecture. Because right now, you have neighbors not liking each other. This community is so divided. You have dozens more of people with these stickers that are opposed to this overlay, and they can't even get in this room. You have tons of people sitting down that aren't even lined up to speak, and you can see how many people are opposing this. I ask you to vote it down and let this community come together and work it out, because there was a false survey that was submitted to the commission that started this whole ball rolling, and, and I was one of those people that was misrepresented on that survey. So you got this whole ball rolling, they got this whole ball rolling based on false information. This, the, everybody feels very hurt, very mistrusting, very divided. Let's vote this down, let's get everybody, who, those are in, in favor and the opposition to work together for a better community. Thank you. Good evening, good evening, members. I'm here, you know, representing Ms. Lisa Anderson of, of 1210 15th Avenue South. The reason why, you know, I am so much concerned about AGL is because when I was a student, I lived there, going to school there. And once in a while, I would just drive in the neighborhood to just see where I want to live. And we talk about that with my children. Currently, I'm on Riverside Drive, and I've been there from 1985 on Riverside Drive. The thing about it is that when people start saying no, there is nothing behind it. It's still no. You know, because the thing about no is that it is so meaningful that people are concerned that if you take that away from them, then what, is, what else do they have? And Ms. Anderson here is saying, their city council members, many of my neighbors and I are against the overlay as the conditions and restrictions particular to this type of overlay. This proposal has caused harm to our neighborhood. In light of this, please vote down the proposed overlay. Now we're talking about AGL. What neighborhood are we going to be talking about next week? You have that in your power. I think the only thing that we have in our power is either to either vote you in or vote you out. And you don't like us to use no against you. And at the same time, you know, these folks that are coming in, and we hear that every day they're talking about, you know, the buildings that they're putting up, the harm that is causing with transportation and everything. And now we are beginning to say we're going to move people out. Where are we going to put them? When we move them out, where are we going to put them? What do you think the, uh, these builders are going to pay them to move to another location? This is something that you have to think about. Because if it's not in somebody's neighborhood, it might be in your own neighborhood. And it's happening right now in Nashville because they call that progress and they come running here to you to either vote for them. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> um, my name is Sharon Bell. My property is 1028 Villa Place. I have owned my property for 33 years. It was built in 1920 and been a boarding house before I bought it, and it was condemned by the city when I bought it. 
uh, restored the house, keeping the original floors, mantles, fireplaces, windows, uh, everything I possibly could. However, I understand the need to modernize a house to be comfortable for a family. Um, also, I have seen many changes in the 33 years. Right around the corner from my house, there were drug dealers, lots of drug dealers. Uh, also, my house was uh, my house was broken into several times. Also, cars were vandalized. You know, this is so much better. Those of you who haven't lived in uh, our area for a long time, you know, you don't know how far. Uh, this area has come, and I love the revitalization of this. But I want to make decisions about my own property without having to, see, to seek a city commission's approval. And we all there have to adhere to the codes. Please vote down this bill and do not defer it. Please let us start afresh and come together for compromise. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Lauren Fredrickson, and I am a renter at 1218 Villa Place. And I've heard a lot of um, talk about turnover. And as I talked at large with my neighbors who are homeowners, um, was shocked to hear some of the things that they were saying were the voices of the landlords weren't being heard as a homeowner because they weren't, quote, the residents. Um, I've lived in my house for nine years. I'm a Metro Nashville public school teacher who's out past her students' bedtime at 8 o'clock. Um, and I am here just to talk about the community and how vibrant it is and how it's a provided affordable housing for years and years and years to other people like myself. It's a provided a place for teachers to live, to live near their students. Um, they spend a lot of time at school, and it stinks to have to drive out of county. But I have a lot of friends where that's a reality for them because um, they can't afford to live within their district anymore. Um, it's provided housing for graduate students who have then chosen to stay within the community and work um, in the court systems, who have worked in as counselors at schools, who have worked for Centerstone, which provides counseling services for students who um, are on 10 care and can't receive additional counseling services outside of the school. Um, it has provided opportunities for us to bond with the neighborhood kids when we're teachers at ho home during the summer and provide them odd jobs to try and keep them out of trouble. And so there is a community there for the renters, but I hope that you hear we're able to live at a place because we have landlords who care about us, who look at us and say, you know, this is something where we're not going to raise your rent every single year like a lot of people will. And I hope that you hear their voices because they're valuable and they are just the vital members of the community because they have provided um, places who, for people who are members of the community to continue to remain in the communities where they serve. So thank you. Hi, good evening. My name is Daphne Walks, and I own and reside at 902 Villa Place. I was misrepresented on the survey. I oppose the overlay, and I ask that you do the same. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead and come on up if you're next in the line. Thank you. Uh, thank you. My name is Edward Perez. I live at 1722 15th Avenue South. Uh, my wife and I, we bought the home roughly 22 years ago. And it is as uh, the woman earlier said, you know, when we first moved into this area, it was a rough, rough area. Um, we've seen a lot of progress since then. And for the city, in my experience, the progress has been a great thing. It's brought a lot of great people to the city. Uh, and progress is what it is. Uh, you know, you talk about historic buildings and historic stories. I mean, God, when I look across the street from me, I see Belmont University that just keeps getting bigger and bigger every, every year, it seems like. And then two streets over from where this overlay is proposed, we've got the most historic part of Nashville, in my opinion, that's all of Music Row. I don't even recognize Music Row anymore, and that progress has just gone up so fast. And I, there too, though, I think that's a great thing for the city. It's brought a lot of people into the city. Uh, and I can understand the intention of the people that we're wanting to put the overlay on. It makes sense in one way, and that is, uh, you know, to protect a community. But 
what this has caused and this information has really just upturned that community. You got so many people that are opposing it now. And so there's such bad heart and such bad intention wrapped around all of this. And it's a sad thing. It's a sad thing that everybody has to come here. We've been through so many meetings now, and there's so many people that are divided and, and against each other. And it just seems preposterous to proceed this way. I think people need to have the opportunity to have all the right information. And for the opportunity, most of all, for the community to come together. If this is to create the sense of community, this is completely not doing this. This is doing something else. Uh, again, progress has already been occurring in the city. It's ridiculous to think that you can stop and slow everything down. Again, most of the historic buildings in this city have already come and gone. I mean, we're on to something else. This city is growing. Uh, my area that I live in has certainly come up in respects to it being able to be a place that you can actually walk down and enjoy the walk with your kids. And, you know, and the other thing is, you know, when you buy real estate and you invest in your life savings, you want to be able to have the freedom to be able to do what it is that you need to do for your family if it grows, you know? When we bought the house, we didn't have a family, and, and now we do. So uh, I strongly op oppose this. Um, I hope you uh, vote this down. Uh, and I would like to see us as a community actually come together in a real heartfelt, bona fide way. Uh, so I thank you for your time and thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. And if you guys who are in line, if you'd scoot up just a little bit, it'll make this move a little bit quicker if you don't mind. Good evening. My name is Randy Hargrove and I live at 900 Villa Place. And I was one of the people that was counted as a yes for the overlay and I wasn't contacted by the overlay people, not any of them. And uh, from the facts that I've learned and watched the community grow and the new houses coming in, and it seems like the developers are saving the older houses when they can, and then if they can't, they put up a different type house. And I'm against this overlay, and I ask you to vote against it. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Randy Walks. I live at 902 Villa Place. Um, I would ask you to vote against this overlay as well. Um, at one point, I lived in historic Edgefield and have been witness to some of the restrictions and problems that being living in a community such as that can cause. And during the 10 years I've lived in uh, the Edge Hill area, the best part of this community by far are the people. Change is absolutely inevitable, and it's come, and it will continue to come. And uh, there are things that I don't like necessarily, but there are also tools. There, are, the Building Commission has tools that could have stopped some of these tall and skinny buildings that people don't like uh, uh, in the past and in the future. There are tools that are already in place, and I love the culture. I love the people, but. The way this has been uh, handled to date, uh, we were misrepresented as several of my neighbor neighbors also have been uh, in earlier uh, tallies. And uh, it's become a very divisive thing in our neighborhood. And I would encourage you not to defer this. I would encourage you to make a decision and let our community become what it is best at doing, which is being a vital part of our city. Thank you. Thank you. For those of you who are in line, just to give you a marker of where you should stand, there's a red carpet on the floor there. If you can just come up and stand in the red carpet, that would be helpful. Thank you. Good evening. I am Janet Parham, 1226 Villa Place. I have spent hours reading information relative to the neighborhood conservation overlay and attended many meetings regarding the same. I have educated myself concerning this issue and how it will impact my home and family. What I know for sure, passage of this overlay will impose limitations and restrictions on my property without my consent. The imposition of this overlay on the property of those of us in opposition does not take into account each family's current or future plans changing family dynamics or family finances. Now, I ask you, can it be expected of me 
to allow people I do not know, who do not know me, my family, or our plans for our home, make a decision that they think is good for me regarding the most expensive asset that I own. Does that make sense? Please put yourself in our places. The majority of my neighbors and I feel that our concerns are not being heard and have not been adequately addressed. Also, our opinions have not been valued and taken into thoughtful consideration as a means to work toward a middle or common solution to design a preservation tool which, with which the entire community can live. So I ask you, please vote no regarding passage of the Edge Hill overlay. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Sharon Hargrove. I live at 900 Villa Place, and I am opposed to the overlay. Thank you. My name is Susan Rogers. I live at 904 Villa Place. I'm also representing my neighbor, Troy Olson, and we're both opposed to this overlay. We live in tall skinnies. We're at the end of the street. Our home is used directly to jump South Street. We were never, we were misrepresented on the original paperwork that went around, several of us on that end of the street. Our neighbors directly behind us on 15th also live in tall skinnies. They're not in an, this historic overlay. We are not historic housing. And this thing has ripped up this neighborhood. And we lived here, lived here eight years, and it's just sad to see, you know, the, the animosity, the emails that are flying around. It's terrible. And I urge you to just, I think the representatives, uh, Mr. O'Connell and Mr. Sledge should be talking individually to everyone so they understand, the homeowners understood what was going on there and a lot of them don't still and it's terrible that you guys, it's gone this far and people don't get it and you guys are pushing something through that's going against the majority and you're elected to represent these people, all of us. And it's like, oh, well, we already picked our side so this is all just a moot point. It just is terrible to hear this stuff and I just hope you take a moment and really think about it and how many people it affects. It should be bringing a community together rather than ripping it to pieces. Thank you for your time. Good evening. My name is Phoenix, uh, 1007 Villa Place. Uh, my mother, Theresa Whitaker Bynum, also lives at 1005 Villa Place. Uh, her sister, my aunt, Charlene Whitaker, at 1021 Villa Place. And we're all opposed to this overlay. Uh, it hasn't, even, hasn't been passed yet, obviously, but we already feel violated by the threat to our rights to decide our, our, the futures of our property. Uh, the way things have, been, have gone has been expressed many times. Uh, we actually you know, kind of feel like we'd be better off if someone kicked in our door and tried to steal from us because at least then you have an honest confrontation with somebody who's trying to take away our rights and the freedom to decide our own fates, the future of our lives, our property, which, as I've often taught my son, no one is going to care as much about your stuff, your rights, as someone who's trying to take it from you. So learn what's yours and defend it. We do not want this to happen. We've got a lot of animosity going on. It has brought some of us together as we found the shifting lines, but a lot of these alleged polls that have gone on, I have not heard from. The, the, I've heard from the people opposed to the overlay, but nothing from the people in favor of it. No one came knocking door to door at my door. Don't know them for being on that side of it. Most of them, from what I've seen at these meetings, are, don't even live under the proposed overlay. But they're trying to decide everything for those of us who do. Please vote accordingly. Thank you. Hello, my name is Tina Camp, 1607 Villa Place. I'm opposed to the overlay for a lot of the reasons you've already heard. You can't say things over and over and not have them drilled into you. 
I want to say also, I went to many of the um, meetings that were about the conservation overlay, and I always wondered why nobody else got to talk or express opinions or ask questions about other opportunities there might be. You know and I know there are other conservation tools that can be used. It always was at the end of the meeting and we have to get out of here now. That's very disappointing to me in a community. I am not a supporter of tall and skinny houses, but I am a supporter of my own property and my right to do with it in good taste, always in good taste. What this has done to this community is very upsetting. This was a unified, very beautiful community. It is now very divided. I have had hostilities personally directed at me that were shocking. This is not, this is not Edge Hill community. This is not the fabric of who we are or who we need to be. I say, stop this now and start over. Start over for something that is for the common good of everyone here who has spoken. That is your responsibility as our council. And I respect you for your opinions. Please respect our opinions. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Daryl Harvey. These things are so short. Um, I live at 1401 Edge Hill Avenue in a luxurious 900 square foot brick ranch. It was built in 1970. It's representative of about 30% of the overlay, I would guesstimate. Uh, approximately about another third of the proposed overlay is already demolished and rebuilt, which leaves a third roughly for available housing stock. Uh, I'm opposed to this overlay for numerous reasons. Um, one of the biggest things with, with this overlay that nobody else has really brought up on either side and is doable for anyone, if people are so enamored with protecting their houses and housing stock, you can put deed restrictions in your own parcel. It is your decision. It is not mine to make for you what you should be able to do with your properties. But if you love your house that much, and it's historic, put a deed restriction in. Nobody's gonna fight you on that because it's yours. I think that's really, really important, and nobody's brought this up. Another part that I would also like to bring up is we are so close to the city center. Nashville has such a massive problem with transit. It is ludicrous to me how we don't have higher density so close to the core. If we have more density, which is what the Envision Edge Hill project, which is right next door to this overlay, they're gonna triple the density, which is gonna to totally change the character of the neighborhood anyway. They have no choice but to build up, but it's the right thing to do. We need more people in the city center because it's not as much of a strain on infrastructure. You guys know this costs millions and millions of dollars that is coming from the taxpayers. I would be remiss to I would be remiss if I didn't mention that. Thank you. Hello, my name is Paul Martin. I live at 1011 15th Avenue South with my wife and our five children. Um, I love Edge Hill. I grew up, my mother was a teacher at Carter Lawrence in the 70s and 80s. Um, we were blessed enough to be able to take our home, which was also going to be condemned and, and build up and make it work for our five kids. Um, I, had, I had an opportunity to do what I wanted to do and I'm, I'm here because I would like for my other neighbors to have that same opportunity. Um, I was represented as an investor even though I've only ever lived in that home in Edge Hill and I've never owned another home in Edge Hill. My wife works in interior design, I work in real estate. Maybe that's why, but that is our primary residence. I have friends who have wanted to purchase homes in Edge Hill but have, have had to hold off until they find out what's going on because they have growing families and 
it just 900 square feet in a small ranch doesn't work for a family of three, four, five, or people crazy enough like us to have a family of seven. And so I would ask that you vote down this overlay. Thank you so much. Good evening, my name is Nanette Dupree and I am an eight year resident of Edgehill. I live on Villa Place. Uh, my home will be 100 years old next year. Yes, we will celebrate it. My husband and I have diligently restored this home with no oversight of a committee and will continue to do so and preserve the history because we love our home. I'm saddened by what has happened to this community. These are people who have supported me in my darkest and happiest hours and I watch them divided and an anger brew that I've never seen before. Please vote this down, send the pro back to the table and let our community heal. Thank you. Good evening. My name's Jan White and I live at 1004 Villa Place. I implore you all to please vote this down. Vote no to this because I truly believe from the depths of my heart that the majority of the homeowners in Edge Hill do not wish to have this overlay. I don't think any of us want to see our entire neighborhood torn down and all tall and skinnies, but we have a varied number of house types anyway. I'm an architectural designer, and frankly, some of them aren't worth saving, some are. But I don't think we need to try to tell our neighbors what they should be able to do with their houses. So I implore you, and really, this is not good for this community, all this strife. It'd be so much better to vote this no, and then let us get together as a community and see if we can't come up with some sort of alternate alternate plan, and thank you very much. My name is Susan Hodges. I live at 1025 Villa Place. It is a 100-year-old home. We've only been there two and a half years. Can you push her microphone yep. down, please? My name is Susan Hodges. I live at 1025 Villa Place in a 100-year-old home. We've been there two and a half years. <clears throat> My husband is a native. Um, he has a family history that goes long back in Edge Hill. We celebrate the history, but we most definitely oppose this overlay. I received an email earlier today from the pro overlay folks expressing, this was accidentally, that the opponents to the plan were skilled political operatives, non-residents, and absentee landlords. This is most definitely not the truth. We are a family of five that are living downtown. We love our home. I work for my husband. I homeschool three children and have done so for many years in multiple counties. The worst thing that can be said about us is that we have um, probably lost relationships with neighbors that we have not even spoken to but know how we feel about this. We kept very silent initially because we are the new kids on the block until we felt that our longtime neighbors were being misrepresented. The process has lacked the humility that would allow for compromise. A transparent request from the pro overlay people would have entertained opinions with grace and have sought adjustments for something that would have worked for everyone. Even with the significant division, it is not being recalled by the pro overlay folks or by my councilman for adjustments or for reconsideration. The current codes and residential zones have supported a tasteful street, strong neighbors, all this in light of all of the crazy change and significant crime around it. I am not sure that any further restrictions are needed, but something else that was a little milder or that the community could come to grips with as a whole would not be out of order. We, we want to preserve the area as well. Uh, intercepting a natural and positive growth in the way, in this way, restricting homeowner property rights, it will place limits on the options, not so much on me, but on the weakest members of the community. Um, taking away their ability to adapt to rapid change, to maintain older homes, which is very costly, I have found, or to sell their home in a need or a, in, a, in an impossible situation. The history is being valued above the individual in this neighborhood. The time for aesthetic control has passed. The properties are a strong mix of architectural and um, architecture and design. When we see random people walking down the street that you obviously know don't live there, they marvel at the design. They stare and it's in awe. 
Um, I would argue that the businesses on Edgehill Corner and Belmont University and the Gulch are all contributing to the change, um, creating a progressive atmosphere. And as the young lady spoke earlier, it's bringing new professionals into the area. And they are teaching children in the schools, and they are working in the churches nearby. They need places to live. All this should be considered as well in addressing the property issues. We ask you to vote down the overlay. Thank you. Um, good evening. My name is Talbot Ottinger. Our home is located at 1225 Villa Place. Uh, my wife and I purchased this home in 2015. Uh, it's an old craftsman house, very nice uh, now, but before it was not. We had to gut it to the studs, spent several hundred thousand dollars on it, and invested a lot in this property. Um, I had previously uh, purchased a home in another neighborhood uh, several years back that was subject to an overlay. I tried to go through the process of getting things approved and found it was a very frustrating, costly, and delay everything I needed to get done. I eventually sold the home because I was so frustrated with it. So I'm here tonight with a lot of other people opposed to this because this is causing a lot of you know, strife among everybody. And as you've seen by you know, the countless people have already said that. So it's hard to reiterate everything that's said, but I just hope that everyone listens to the amount of people that are talking in opposition to something that's clearly not the consensus. I would urge you to vote this bill down because the passage of it, there's no turning back. We still have time to fix these things, but once this is passed, it's, there's nothing that can be done. So I appreciate everyone's consideration and, and listening to all the people that are here opposed to it. Thank you. Good evening, council, council members, vice mayor. Um, I have prepared statements, but I'm not going to use them. I purchased my property fully knowing the circumstances and the Nashville codes Title 16 and 17. Excuse me, could you state your name and address? I'm sorry, Robert Murray, 1004 Villa Place. Fully, thank you. Thank you. Uh, fully aware of what existed and what was going on. The 6A, I don't know exactly what that's going to do to the, the neighborhood overall. I understand it has a lot to do with sidewalks and a lot of boarding of zoning appeals uh, to that. But uh, I would never in my wildest dreams take it upon myself to impose upon you or any of these folks my personal opinions of what I think the aesthetics of their house should be or the rhythm of their neighborhood. So that's all I've got to say. I think it's a denial of a certain, of certain freedoms and rights that I was fully aware of when I bought the property, which are being taken away. Uh, thank you very much. I oppose this bill, this proposal. Thank you. Hi, my name's Doug Colton. My house is at 1506 South Street and I bought it almost 20 years ago. Today, we need all of your help. At the planning meeting just last week, a member of that commission said that in seven years, they had not seen this much opposition to an ordinance. The whole process has been unfair and unjust. And a lot of people are telling you this because it's true. The opposition has been excluded from community meetings. The pro-overlay group refused any joint agenda at any of the meetings. The pro-overlay group uh, misrepresented their support to their own councilmen. The pro side refuses to even show their votes for the overlay. There are 110 verified no votes out of 230 homes. Those are not undecided votes, those are no's. That's far more than the pro side has. The opposition has asked for a transparent vote and our own councilmen have refused to give us one. Why not show all of the votes when an issue is this contentious? There is simply not a consensus for this bill. We don't want this bill deferred. We want this bill disapproved. At the planning meeting last week, the councilman requested that the planning commission make its decision based on the viability of the policy of the overlay. That was very hard to hear because it was not decided by the constituents' desires. I'm, I'm aware that generally, deference is given to your local councilman. 
but this should not be one of those instances. This bill has been developed improperly. I implore you to do the right thing and make your decision based on what the community wants, and that's to disapprove this bill. Thank you. Hi, my name is Andy Webby. I live at 1504 South Street. I live in a historic home that was built in the 1890s, and I'm against this overlay um, for all the reasons you've already heard tonight. So I would just request that you please vote this down I think it's a bad idea and that the majority of the neighborhood does not want it. Thank you. Hi, good evening. My name is Chris Sofka. I live at 1023B Villa Place. I'm a native Nashvillian. I was born and raised here, and I decided to move to Edgehill about a year and a half ago because of its energy, cultural diversity, and unique combination of architectures. I love the buzz the area has with such close proximity to the city. When walking around the neighborhood, I see homes of all types. I see Southern homes, colonial homes, 70s homes, bungalows, Cape Cod homes, Spanish revival homes, and also modern homes. There is no one architectural style that defines Edge Hill, and that's why I love it. I was not informed about this proposed overlay until about four months ago, and I had never been contacted by anyone regarding the overlay, also having lived at my house for over a year at that point. In fact, our house was not counted in the January 2018 survey regarding the overlay that was submitted to the Planning Commission as public record. Information has intentionally been kept quiet from those who oppose the overlay. The majority of us are homeowners and residents, and we are not for this. I think development and personal choice of property-owning, tax-paying citizens in Etchill is only helping increase the safety and economic growth of the area. Please listen to the majority of our community and do not pass this overlay. Please do not defer, defer this. Please vote no on this overlay. Thanks for listening. Councilmen and women, I'm Dr. Sean Kelly, and I'm owner and resident of 1023 Villa, Villa Place. And I also speak on behalf of Ken Hinman, owner and resident of 1023A Villa Place. Um, as homeowners on Villa Place, it's been incredibly concerning that this overlay process has all but negated the voice of those 110 homes that are opposed. We bought our homes a year ago because we love this neighborhood and the aesthetics of the really unique mixture of architectures. Our homes are modern, and that's okay. The Edgehill neighborhood has evolved and buyers are becoming more invested in refined detail and excellence in modern construction. We think it's unfair for any organization to feel that they have the right to dictate which architectural designs a buyer can or cannot do on his or her own property. We feel this overlay would undoubtedly discourage the influx of young professionals and families. It would impair the diversity. It would halt the local economy and reduce the home values for those of us that have worked extremely hard for our own properties. This is my first home, and I think I've worked very hard for it, and I love it. I think, I think it's a beautiful home, and I'm excited for my future in it and the plans that I have for it. I've thoroughly reviewed the proposed overlay, and it's clear to me that it, it would actually limit my plans. To lose that freedom, to me and to Ken, are unaccept is unacceptable. The tactics of exclusion, intimidation, bullying, and, and unethical behavior that has allowed this proposal to advance, compounded by unwillingness to entertain an equal dialogue and find a consensus for the community once the application was submitted, as you've seen, has tragically divided the community. I think historic conservation, at least a strategy, is attainable in Edge Hill, but this is not the way to do it as it comes at the expense of our people, our community. We need to discuss conservation strategies as a community that encompass everybody's goals for the future and protection of our past. So we need to start over on equal ground, force ourselves to bridge the divide, find a consensus, and emerge the united and beautiful community that Edge Hill can be. Right now, that is not us due to this overlay. So please deny this proposal. Thank you. My name is Josh Garland. 1409B Tremont. I'm here also representing the Taylors at 1409A Tremont. Uh, we love our homes and we love the neighborhood of Edge Hill. We do not believe there is enough support in our neighborhood for this overlay. While we understand that there will never be 100% consensus amongst our neighbors, we're currently, uh, while we understand there will never be 100% agreement amongst our neighbors, we are currently nowhere near a consensus in regards to this overlay and I would like to ask the council to vote no on this unpopular bill. Thank you. 
Good evening. I am Whitney Jones. I live at 1226 Villa Place. I'm also speaking on behalf of Ms. Shirley Johnson. She lives at 1206 Tremont Avenue. We are opposed of the Edge Hill overlay. Thank you. My name is Kenneth Parham. I live at 1226 Villa Place. I am opposed to the Edge Hill overlay. Under no condition should a group of neighbors living in my community have the right to decide externally what is best for my family and me regarding my personal property. At no time did anyone make a mortgage payment for me, but yet people who I don't know and who don't know me want to limit what I can do with my own personal property. Uh, this proposed overlay is not beneficial to me, my family, nor to anyone else who is opposed of it. Generally, we complain about too much government overreach. This is one of those times. Metro government should not interfere with the wishes of the property owners in this matter. Some of us have lived in this area from very one year to over 50 or 60 years, and we know what's best for our property and for our families. So please respect our right to decide what is best for our families and what is best for our homes, and please vote no regarding this Edge Hill neighborhood conservation overlay. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Batya Carabell, and my address is 1703 15th Avenue South. I am here to express my strong opposition to the proposed overlay. I believe the property my husband and I recently purchased in Ed Edge Hill tells a story of many in the proposed overlay. The home we purchased was a family estate that had fallen into disrepair so great that the estate could not adequately repair it and was forced to sell it. In June, I attended the meeting of the Historical Commission and learned firsthand what a burden this designation is for homeowners. While residents of Edge Hill waited for four hours on a weekday afternoon to express their positions, I observed the presentations requesting the approval of the commission. Not only was significant documentation required, but a level of subject area expertise, which included architectural drawings for a successful request was necessary. I strongly believe that this will hinder many homeowners from repairing or renovating their homes. This will ultimately create a situation where homeowners will delay repairing their properties or be forced to sell them before they are ready. Perhaps more importantly, this process has been incredibly divisive to our neighborhood. Advocates of the overlay have distributed inaccurate information to residents that I believe were designed to mislead long-term African-American residents. This is unethical and it's wrong. The survey presented to our council members incorrectly represented residents who are opposed to the overlay as in favor of the overlay. This is unethical and it's wrong. Our initial planning commission public hearing was delayed to provide an opportunity for the community to meet, to share concerns and find common ground. Every attempt to have a frank dialogue was refused by those promoting the overlay. This is unethical and it's wrong. On August 1st, Last week at the Planning Commission hearing, intimidation tactics by advocates of the overlay significantly impacted both my neighbors and my ability to adequately express ourselves. This is unethical and it's wrong. Please vote this overlay down. It will further harm a community that has only recently become deeply divided because of this issue. Thank you. Vicki Swinehart, 1221 Villa Place. Thank you very much for hearing us. The last meeting I went to, I was told I didn't have a right to speak and that my vote didn't count and I shouldn't be at the meeting. Well, my house is not historic. It was built in 1958. The kitchen is about the size of your desk. It has nine rooms and a 1,300 square foot home. That house needs to be improved. If they do this overlay, we're stuck with a little teeny house. Now, you probably all live in a house bigger than that. So I really am strongly against this, and I appreciate your time. My name is William Swinehart at 1221 Villa, and I urge you to vote this overlay down. As she said, uh, the house is, was built in 1958, and there really is nothing historic about it. It needs improvement. It needs to be improved and brought up to current standards. It's surrounded by office buildings that are seven stories tall right behind it and restaurants and stores that are less than three houses away. Very commercial. It's so commercial that you can't even, that cars continually block the driveway every day and you can't even you know, get in your own driveway at your house. So it, it needs to be voted down and I urge you to vote it down and I appreciate you listening to us. Thank you. 
Good evening. My name is Betty Bader. I am the mom of Jill Bader at 1220 Villa Place. Um, a, a year and a half ago, my daughter was able to um, purchase her first home, and she grew up in an area that we raised her that had an, um, a homeowners association. We had codes and covenants, and she wanted no part of that. She wanted a home that she could do what she wanted with it. She chose Edge Hill neighborhood, which was fantastic for her. She was excited about it. Even throughout this very difficult time for my daughter personally, I have met some wonderful neighbors of hers, both pro and against. This is a great neighborhood. I support my daughter. I ask you to vote no. Good evening. Thank you so much for taking time with us today. My name is Jamie Carney, and I, along with my husband and our two adult children, live at 1024 15th Avenue South. Um, we oppose this overlay. Um, we've, been, we've lived in Edge Hill for 30 years. We've always felt welcome in Edge Hill until now. I, I come here so sad, so sad living in this community for 30 years and having people that are just being cruel and unkind, unjust, and discriminating. I'm here for my kids because we've put everything we have into our tiny 800 square foot house for years. We've built on and we've built on here as we could. We've taken our inheritance from my husband's parents passing away. We've put it into our home. We have done this at the pace that we were able to do this for our children. Um, multiple times I've tried to reach across the aisle and be a peacemaker. I truly believed that most people, and still believe, that most people in both these groups have more in common than not in common. But this process and the way it was pushed through unjustly has caused so much pain in our community. Please help us to get past this. Do not let this overlay pass. Um, we love living in a historic neighborhood. That's why we moved there. We chose to live there. We chose to move there when it wasn't as grand as it is now. We chose to live there. Um, we loved our kids growing up there. My daughter, 24, went to TSU on a presidential scholarship. Um, my son goes, to, she, and she finished her master's there as well. My son goes to Belmont on a full ride scholarship. This is for our children. Our home is for our children. We are not wealthy people. Many of the people who moved into Edge Hill when we did are not wealthy people. My husband works at the Nashville Rescue Mission. I work at a church. We've served. We love Edge Hill. We moved there because we chose to be here. And um, many of the people who have moved there recently have a lot more money than we do, let's face it. I love that they got to come into these, these huge historic homes and revitalize them. We were thrilled by that. None of us didn't like that, we all love that. But now several of those people, not the whole other side, but several of those people are coming and busting up our neighborhood. They're coming in thinking they have the right because of their wealth to um, dictate and legislate what happens in our neighborhood. And when I asked one of them, I said, you know, we don't need to legislate our neighbors. And he's like, well, if we don't legislate this, it's gonna be chaos. I propose that there's more chaos now. I propose that this overlay has caused chaos in our neighborhood, and please help us to make it stop. Um, we've talked to people, we've read the overlay. There was people at the Planning Commission who hadn't read the overlay. He said, one of the commissioners said, well, if you don't have a, a historic home, you could do whatever you want. That's simply not true. That's, that was the last vote that passed this to get to you guys. You guys could have been home if you would have read that overlay. It's. Um, We've read it, we've talked to people, please do not pass this overlay, please do not defer and keep this going. Let us be to the end of it and find some hope. Thank you very much. I am Chris Carney, I am Jamie Carney's husband. I do work at the mission, she works at the Village Chapel. We both live at 1024 15th Avenue South and have, as she said, for 30 years, um, Thank you so much for taking time. I know we're getting towards the end of it, and I appreciate all your time and your attention, particularly John Cooper, who took my call today and, and wrote down something, and I appreciate wherever he is. He, there's someone smiling. Yeah, John Cooper, thank you. <laughs> um, and I do hope, I'm going to be very interested to see who's writing the little fours and opposed over the actual overlay to see if there's a documentation responsible enough to uh, report what's actually going to happen here for each 
address that has appeared here as a homeowner. Um, I too love old houses. My wife has redesigned our house. Nobody believes it was a 1986 house. Uh, it, it, we built it. We, those additions she talked about were built into the neighborhood. We were respective of those things, those principles of the neighborhood. We moved from Philadelphia. We like that kind of thing. It was fun for us to do. We continue to do that. Um, I liked some of the 100-year-old houses that aren't 100-year-old houses, but reflect Frank Lloyd Wright. He's not a new uh, designer, but we see some new houses that look like that kind of thing. I don't mind that. That's cool. Over a adds many voices of judgment upon one and on another here, pitting neighbor against neighbor, more confused voices to an already overwhelmed and conflicting rules within codes that lump together to make f moving forward colossally convoluted. That, that gentleman who spoke early ab about the per permits, we've been through that same thing, and uh, I amen to that, won't go into that right now. Um, I love my neighbors. In fact, my neighbor is going to follow me right here, and I, I'm very proud to be their neighbors. They're wonderful people, both John and uh, uh, Robin Drake, and then on the other side, Stan and Alice Weber, who you all know from uh, Salama Ministries, powerful neighbors, powerful people who have, have renovated their house beautifully into the neighborhood and have been there a little bit longer than we have. And uh, we applaud their efforts, and uh, we thank you for... Uh, uh, the opportunity, again, here for, for expressing our views and stepping up to the thing. I've, I've missed a lot of these meetings because I work two jobs, but I'm passionate here. Uh, this, is my this is my house. It's personal. I respect history, and I want you to look carefully at what the majority, the word you've heard tonight from our group is majority. I'm new to this thing tonight. I pray that you will be concerned for that majority as you see fit. Um, this is a strange ultimatum that has been presented, a strange ultimatum that is not conducive to cooperation. I voted last week, and I hope you will vote opposed. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Robin Taylor Drake. My husband, Johnny Drake, and I live at 1026 15th Avenue South. We moved into our home almost exactly 20 years ago, and we have loved the neighborhood. We love our neighbors. Um, the neighbors on both sides of us have been there longer than we have. We've watched the children down the street from us grow up, and we feel like they're extended family to us. We have gotten to know a lot of the neighbors, some of the newer neighbors in the neighborhood, and, and some of the people who have lived there a long, lot longer than we have. And, we love our neighborhood and we love our old 100-year-old house that's a money pit, but we feel like this overlay has caused so much divisiveness that we just need to scrap it. We need to start over so everybody can have a voice, everybody can have a seat at the table and have input, and so that we do something that's respectful to everybody. And we just have to get back to being happy good neighbors to one another that are not calling each other names and having resentments toward one another. So I ask you to please vote this down. Don't defer it. Vote it down. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Denise Williams, and I'm here representing my family at 1012, 12, 15th Avenue South, and we oppose this overlay. We've been living there 40 plus years, and please vote it down. Thank you. Good evening. David Yates, 1502 South Street. I have been a property owner in um, the area for 30, in, I've been a property owner on South Street for 32 years. I am opposed to the overlay and agree with the, with the uh, reasons previously mentioned. One of the advantages of being at the end of the line is I don't have to go through and uh, repeat everything that's already been said, which has been done very well, I think. If I had known 32 years ago that the government could force an overlay that would dictate what I could and could not do with my property, I probably would not have purchased it. We already have codes administration, uh, codes regulations, planning commissions, uh, you know better than I do, the various agencies involved, which are generally reasonable and uh, 
mostly protecting health and safety. Since the um, uh, objection to the overlay appears to be the tall and skinny and the rental properties and so forth, um, I, uh, I think there are other ways to accomplish perhaps what uh, the overlay does, and in fact, I do think the overlay is an overkill as far as reservations. So I would ask you to please recognize that the majority of the residents are opposed to this overlay. I implore you not to vote for the overlay, nor to postpone the decision. You've heard all the arguments pro and con, and I leave it up to you to make a decision, but I am very much opposed to the overlay. Thank you for your attention. Good evening. I'm A. Theresa Whitaker Bynum, 1005 Villa Place, also 1007 Villa Place. Thank you for your patience. I am part of the history of this community. I'm property owner and part-time resident here. I still live in out of state because I am in the process of retiring. But I am a uh, civil rights activist. Uh, my family has lived here in this community. Uh, I was born in this community. I was born on 12th Avenue. I lived on Villa Place most of my life. My family bought this residence in 1962. I have inherited this property. I recently spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to start renovating this property with the expectation of retiring here. My son built his home on 1007, a place that was torn down by the city in 1970s. I am part of history of, that is being talked about. And so I'm not opposed to history. I'm not opposed to most of the neighbors in this neighborhood. I'm part of this neighborhood. But I am also opposed to people telling us what we can do with our property. We have a right to make the decisions about what we do with it. We spent lots of money investing in our property. This is heir property. My father passed it on to us. I'm passing it on to my heirs. We want the right to be able to expand and to enjoy our property. And we ask you to oppose this overlay because it is overkill. We have a right to make the decisions on how we use our property. We respect it. I have one of those historic homes, and I'm very proud of it. I intend to maintain it. We also have one of those homes that is not historic, but is affordable for our family on one of the other pieces of property. So we have, it, it's always been a mixed-use neighborhood. And I'm very proud of the fact that we have different kinds of homes in this neighborhood. That is part of the creativity of this neighborhood, and we think this should be respected. To have an overlay at this time is like letting the, closing the barn door after the horse is out. That's a little late for that. There have always been different kinds of houses in this neighborhood, and I think we should respect the fact that we need to let people do what they need to do with taste with their own property. Thank you for your time. Hi, good evening. Uh, thank you so much for listening to all of us so intently this evening. I'm Amy Colton, and I've owned my historic Queen Anne home at 1506 South Street since 1999. I'm opposed to the proposed overlay. My home is so much more to me than just bricks and mortar. As a number of people in this room know, I battled a horrific illness for 10 years inside that home. When I was bedridden for three years, staring at the ceiling, wondering, wondering if I would ever read, write, or walk normally again, my home was my support and my comfort. You see, I hear the pro overlay group say they have worked on the proposed overlay tool for almost two years. I say I worked on my life in my home for 10 long, arduous years. 
They at least owe me the courtesy of including me in the discussion as to the appropriate preservation tool for my home. I say Ivy Jean Robertson at 1506 Villa, who is now 95 and has lived in our home since 1953, deserves the courtesy of being included in the discussion as to the appropriate preservation tool for her home, as do all of my neighbors. Prior to this application for the overlay being filed, neighbors in our group were told we would sit down and discuss other neighborhood zoning tools together. That never happened. Instead, as we discovered in emails disclosed to us by a third party, the pro overlay group continued to press the council members to file the application behind our backs. When were Miss Iva Jean and I to be included in that process? We discovered a number of neighbors' preferences for their homes with regard to the overlay were mischaracterized by the pro-overlay group in the survey that submitted to our council members. Our group asked repeatedly for a copy of that survey, but we were denied. When we finally saw it and obtained a copy of it, we were able to see it did, in fact, contain a number of misrepresentations regarding what we said we wanted for our homes. When were Miss Iva Jean and I to be included in that process? When the leaders of our group offered to jointly can canvass the neighborhood with the leadership of the pro overlay group to ascertain an accurate accounting of whether neighbors really want the proposed overlay, we were denied. Why couldn't they give Ms. Ava Jean and me transparency? We made repeated attempts to compromise with the other group, and all of those were denied. The pro overlay group refused to meet with us to discuss any other tool other than the one they are proposing. Why couldn't they compromise? and discuss other tools with Miss Ivy Jean and me. The leaders of our group faced horribly disparaging and untrue remarks on a neighborhood-wide lift serve, and members of our group have faced threats. We also, as you know, faced voter intimidation at the last planning meeting. How were Miss Ivy Jean and I included fairly in that process? Thank you. Please vote down this bill. Thank you very much for listening. Is anyone else wishing to speak? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Council Member Sledge. And you need your mic, sorry. Thanks. Yes, sir. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker Pro Tem. So, um, first, given what you have heard pro and against asking for us to vote tonight and not defer, I'm going to move approval with a brief comment. That's all right. All right, so um, I, I'm gonna ask planning staff to place the map up um, so that everyone can see it while we're speaking because I do wanna give some context. And while that happens, I'd like to use a little bit of my time to just ask um, historic, the sort of key points of what are in the standards uh, or the guidelines of this proposed overlay, if you don't mind. Yes. The design guidelines are based on national standards, but they're customized for specific neighborhoods. So some of the things that are not reviewed are things like uh, replacement siding, replacement windows, interior work, and the kinds of work that would be approved would be demolition of existing additions, new construction of new additions, demolition of existing garages, new construction of, of new garages, um, and then, of course, non-historic buildings could be demolished and new homes built. Okay. And I, I think there was a question sometimes about dormers. Could you talk to what the guidelines speak about dormers? Uh, dormers are allowed on any building where there's a roof plane that can accommodate them. It's a great way to add space without the expense of adding on a foundation. Okay, thank you. Um, so what you're looking at right now, what I'm going to call the spine of this overlay is Villa Place. So you heard a lot of people whose addresses were Villa Place. I want to give some context, and the, and the what I'm going to call the southern half, the one that's the skinny part, that's District 17, and I know Councilman O'Connell will speak to the District 19 portion as well. So the southern western portion that is not in the overlay, the portion that's, that's next to that area, that is the South Music Row overlay. And it is a conservation overlay. It goes basically right up to the line that you're looking at here. So there is a portion of the area that is currently in a conservation overlay that was done several decades prior. Um, they actually have a higher um, entitlement as far as use. They have a higher use entitlement, um, and that is what you know as Music Row, South, South Music Row. 
Um, obviously, looking over toward the east, you have 12th Avenue South, and then if you go a little further, the, you can uh, get to 8th Avenue South, two major corridors. And I know some speakers uh, spoke to about density and being in our urban core. Um, Council, you voted actually just a few weeks ago on a very dense project on 8th Avenue South and Edge Hill, and I argued for it because it was on the corridor. Um, 12th Avenue South is experiencing a lot of density and infill right now, in addition to Envision Edge Hill. Um, the 12th and Wedgwood project that this council voted on um, that was affordable workforce housing currently under construction. A lot of framing has gone up in the last couple of months. So the density has occurred on the corridors around this uh, proposed overlay. So the question that is before this body is, then is, is this overlay appropriate for the area that we're seeking? And you've heard the historic reasons um, and you've heard neighborhood input for and against. And I think all of that input is valid. I don't want to invalidate any of it. I don't want to uh, impose. I don't want to uh, in any way, shape, or form make it as though uh, we have, uh, we're doing something that is of our own volition. If I would put my time back up now, I'd appreciate it because I know I'm going to get buzzed. Um, so what, what I'm bringing before you, council members, is um, an idea that there is there is a neighborhood that is wanting, I think overall, is not wanting to see its important historic structures demoed. I think that's typically an agreement point among most people who've discussed this. As we have gone through this overlay tool process and we have examined what the other tools are, no other tool that we have worked with or tried to find really does that, it just profoundly protects from demo. So we start with that baseline, that that's the tool that protects from demo. There has been a conversation that was taking place literally uh, up to an hour before our meeting starting about adjusting some of those guidelines um, to allow for two-story infill, to allow for a little higher addition. Um, in other words, to, to give a little, uh, quite frankly, and come to a compromise. As many of you know, those guidelines won't come before us. Those guidelines aren't amendable into what's before us tonight. Those would have to go back before the historic commission. I have indications from folks who are for this overlay and from some folks who have talked about this, uh, who are against this overlay, that those could be a good guideline change. I don't think it has changed anyone's minds tonight, don't get me wrong, but I think when we're talking about trying to bring compromise and some members have talked to me about trying to find that compromise, that's an opportunity. However, I think, again, that if we want to prevent the demo of significant structures in this area, this is the tool we need to consider. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member O'Connell. Thank you, Madam President. The conversation about the future of Edge Hill long precedes me. It precedes even a relatively recent uh, aughts era detailed neighborhood design plan for the area. Unfortunately, many of the long-term residents of Edge Hill have felt disenfranchised by Nashville's planning process after Nashville Next effectively erased that plan, and that's kind of where I picked up this conversation. From the beginning of my term, there has been a community-driven conversation unfolding in Edge Hill. I don't think uh, this, this is not a thing that either Councilman Sledge or I were elected specifically to come do. This is not something that we proposed. Multiple residents approached us uh, to discuss potential approaches to preserving Edge Hill's character. Uh, we started last year, as you're aware, with a simple alternative zoning that preserves walkability, but an ongoing pattern of demolition and development alongside changes in quality of life, many of them brought about by a surge in short-term rental activity in Edge Hill, left these same neighbors hoping for better tools. Uh, and many tools were in fact considered. Eventually, after considering multiple options, they settled on a neighborhood conservation zoning overlay. No idea starts with all neighbors. There were enough neighbors interested in this, even with the claims of misrepresentation you've heard, that Councilman Sledge and I agreed to start a formal public conversation, which has winded through multiple community meetings, the Metro Historic Zoning Commission, the Metro Planning Commission is now before us. I have personally met individually with leadership of those who oppose this, those who support it, and both together in small groups alongside the other community meetings that have been held. Trust among people holding opposing perspectives of this tool within the neighborhood has ebbed, and multiple conversations I've had with leadership of each group suggest that there is little middle ground available and little hope of broad consensus. To Councilman Sledge's point, there might be some compromises, but they will be within 
the scope of this tool. In fact, for all the talk of shared goals and other tools, there hasn't been proposed anything that is as effective or more unifying. A neighborhood conservation zoning overlay is the tool that accomplishes the goal of preservation in a community like this. For all the talk of shared goals, it is the demolition of National Register eligible homes and similar homes that has torn the fabric of the neighborhood to the point where people sought this tool. Tonight we've heard from opponents that there are shared goals. Those shared goals are apparently that it's too late for this, that small ranch homes are insufficient to the cause of growing families, that the urban core should be more dense. Do those sound like goals committed to the preservation of the 5% of Edge Hill's geographic history that is under consideration tonight? And beyond that, how do you effectively include someone or fail to dismiss someone who fundamentally disagrees? It's a trick I'm still trying to learn. Have I been frustrated by some of the process as it has unfolded? I have. That frustration spills over into actions of individuals on both sides. Regardless, I remain committed to encouraging further opportunities for fair and inclusive togetherness in the community. I cannot represent to anyone here tonight that a strong majority of the neighborhood supports this, even though you've heard from many residents by email or other uh, means of communication who were not able to appear tonight. If you are uncomfortable with a show of hands that does not represent a clear majority, then I do not want to coerce you into supporting it. We are at a point where no show of hands will be trusted by all and are thus left to make a determination about whether this proposal has merit for a community whose opinion of it is split and its important role in Nashville's history. I believe after a lengthy conversation it does and I plan to support it. Thank you. Thank you. We have some members in the queue for discussion. Council Member Sharon Hurt. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem. I am uh, so divided myself, I feel like them. And I thought that we were, is this what Nashville is about? Is this what the council is about, is dividing neighborhoods, being polarizing? I think not. I think, and, and I am a person who passed an overlay in a community because I'm a for preservation, I'm for conservation, but earnest, in all earnest, I cannot support this bill knowing that we had an hour and a half of people standing behind us opposing it. And there were valid points on both sides and I understand that. But I don't think it was fair for this to come back to this body, how many times do you meet? 10 times or 210 times? Whatever it takes in order for you to come back with something that is going to work for the greater good of the community is the way I see it. I don't like having this on my heart. I have had calls day and night, emails, day and night regarding this. I don't know who's right and who's wrong. But I do think that this council needs to get political courage. I don't think we need to continue to do councilmatic courtesy. I think we gotta stand up what is absolutely right. That's the reason that we ran for office, and we need to stand up and do what is right. Thank you. Councilmember Purdue. I call for the question. We've heard all we need to hear. We've been called for the question. All those in favor of the question? Aye. Opposed? We're ready to vote. I'm not sure what the motion is. Councilmember Sledge? Uh, just, just I'm clearly. renewing my motion for approval. Yeah. For approval, okay. We have a motion for approval. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? No. no. Okay, we'll go to roll call vote. Question, 
Council member O'Connell. Point of information, we just, I heard some chatter. This is second reading. This is second reading. There will be a third reading that will also allow for further council discussion. And there will be committee discussion. Thank you for pointing that out. So to the, to the people in the audience, every bill that we consider goes through a three vote process. Second reading is for the opportunity for the people to have discussion. There's two, two processes for the council to have discussion. One will be the planning committee, which will meet next, uh, two Mondays from now, and then the council will discuss it in two Tuesdays from now, and then vote on the third reading. That is typically when the council makes its major decision. Planning committee meets on Tuesdays now. That's a new change, thank you. Anything else we need to correct? Okay, uh, Madam Clerk, have we all voted? Yes, we need to close your machine. Tally the votes. Did everyone hear that? Motion passes on second reading. Now we move to BL 2018-1253, Council Member Pardue. This changes 40.15 acres from CS to IWD zoning for property located at Edenwald Road, east of Gallatin Pike. Council Member Pardue. Do we have any committees on this? Uh, not yet. Uh, I move for approval. Uh, how about moving for the open the public hearing? Yeah, that'd be fine. Okay. Thanks. Sounds like a plan. All right, would all those, as, uh, as we're clearing out, raise your hand very high. All those in favor of this bill, please raise your hand very high, thank you. Any opposed? Seeing none in opposition, would those in favor like to speak? Seeing none, I close the public hearing. Council Member Pardue. I move for approval. There you go. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Any opposed? Bill is recommended. Next is BL 2018-1254. Council Member Scott Davis changes 0.21 acres from SP to R6A zoning for property located at 869 Joseph Street. Council Member Scott Davis. I'd like to open a public hearing, please. Thank you. All those in favor, raise your hand high. Anyone in opposition, raise your hand high. Seeing none on either side, I will close the public hearing. Councilmember Davis. I move for approval, please. Been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? Bill is recommended. Next is BL 2018-1268, Councilmember Hagar. Changes 276.49 acres from R6 to RS5 zoning and from R10, R15, and AR2A to RS10 zoning for various properties along Warren Drive, Hiller Drive, Hickman Street, Hickerson Street, Keaton Avenue, Scenic View Boulevard, Shelby Street, Hillman Place, Rayon Drive, Inslee Avenue, Swinging Bridge Road, and Newell Avenue. Councilmember Hagar. Madam Pro Tem, ask for a opening of the public hearing, please. Thank you. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. Any in opposition, please raise your hand. Seeing hands in both, uh, both camps, would those in favor please come to the lectern to speak? You'll have three minutes to speak. Please give your name and address and try to be complete by the time the beep happens. Thank you, council members. My name is Linda Tucker, and I live at 110 Harrison Street in the little town of Oak Hickory. Uh, Nashville is not only growing, Oak Hickory is growing. And in our little neighborhood, we're having new homes built, and they are fitting very, very nice with what we want in our neighborhood. So I ask you to please vote yes on this amendment. Thank you. My name is Brandon Thompson. I live at 908 West Star Court. Um, speaking on behalf of the River Landing Subdivision Homeowners Association, and we would like to encourage you guys to support Councilman Hager's bill. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Vice Mayor Pro Tem and Councilman Hager and all of you folks that are in the council. I feel for you tonight. Uh, <laughs> I spent eight years in that seat of Councilman Hager's and some nights it was one and two o'clock when we got out. So you don't appreciate your job until you sit in those seats. And the general public needs to know that. But I'm here tonight to support Councilman Hager's uh, bill. I've lived in this area. My parents moved there in 32, and we've never left this community. Uh, raised four children there, my parents did. And we're here not against building and development. We're here to try to protect what we've lived with for many, many years. Back in the late 50s, uh, Randall's Phillips built a lot of brick homes there in the late 50s. And I was there before when these were gravel roads and fields, so I've seen it. It's had its ups for many, many years. Then back about 25 years ago, the area kind of deteriorated some. But now we have got a new generation coming into this area that's taken these homes and revitalized them, renovated them, and made it a beautiful community down there. But we've also got some people coming in that's not residents there. They're not residents of this county that's come in and building the little tall buildings, one behind the other, which Councilman Hager has pictures of them. But I urge you to support this bill of Councilman Hager because he's put a lot of hours into it. We've had a lot of meetings and uh, the whole community as a majority supports this. Again, thank you for your support and especially your dedication to being a council person. Because I was in with uh, Councilman Jameson up there, Mayor Briley, and Councilman Schumann back there back several years ago. So I appreciate what you folks do. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in support wishing to speak? Seeing none, would those in opposition please line up at the lectern? Please give us your name and address. Good, e good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Jim Osborne. I live at 303 Keaton Avenue. And um, I just want to express that I do oppose this measure, um, primarily because, um, well, I moved into the neighborhood 40, four and a half years ago and bought a house. Um, it was one of the old old hickory company houses for $45,000 with a spare lot, which is laughable, really. But in reality, the, uh, it was just a shell. And, uh, you know, through maybe three years of solid work, mostly my own, um, I brought it back and, um, and then I wish I could pass out this picture I have. You can submit it to the okay. sergeant at arms. Um, this is my next door neighbor's house. And for much of the time I've lived there, that's what it looked like. And um, it was a junkyard. Uh, he ignored codes and uh, just, he brought in trailers, RVs, stuffed them in his backyard. Um, my point here is that uh, this has been a neighborhood in decline. Um, and you can drive around now and, and see what I'm talking about. And the growth that's going on now is is bringing up the quality of the whole neighborhood. And uh, to see it stifled by this downzoning 
um, I really do not agree with at all. I think it's going to hurt in the long run, and I think many of the people who are pushing for this are going to regret it down the road too. So uh, that is really all I've got to say right now, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, thank you. My name is Erin McDermott and I live at 303 Keaton Ave. Um, I'm adamantly opposed to this down zoning and the maintenance plan amendment that has been proposed for our neighborhood. Um, first off, we had one meeting back in May that was, um, you know, where it was discussed that we would have a contextual overlay. We took a vote. There was no mention of a vote on any of the information that we were given. Uh, the people that were in an audience, there was about 30 people that voted for it and they were voting for all 180 homes that were being impacted by this, uh, the first proposed contextual overlay. Then, several months later, we received something in the mail stating that now the contextual overlay is not happening, and it's this RS6 uh, or RS5 rezoning or downzoning, and there's a maintenance plan amendment. We had never been aware of any of that. We were going under the um, assumption that it was still gonna be a contextual overlay. We had one meeting one meeting where people got to vote. It was never expressed to any of us that there was gonna be a vote. We were threatened with our lives at that meeting. This is what this does. This is what's happening here. That the fact that, that people can be making, like, it's just tearing apart communities. We are property owners. We wanna do what, with our property what we see fit, and we don't feel that it should be anybody else's uh, opinion. And the fact that I still don't even know, as an educated person, I've had 20 different conversations with 20 different people at planning, and I'm still not even fully aware of, of how this is gonna impact us. It's, it's, an, it's a process that is broken. And as you've seen, for the last three hours that we've been here, the process is broken. This entire situation is broken. We shouldn't be relying on our councilmen and councilwomen to be making these decisions for our communities. We should be having more meetings and we should be coming to a consensus, not this. This is unacceptable and I'm adamantly opposed to this. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Council Member Hagar. Uh, Madam Pro Diem, I think I need to have a committee report on this because it just went to the Planning Commission, do I not? It does say that it's approved by the Planning Commission. Okay. So, um, I want to give an exhibit to put in the record as well. Can I submit this? Yes, to the Sergeant at Arms, <laughs> who's busy. <laughs> That's all right. She's That's coming kind. away. Mr. Uh, Mendez will pass that on to the sergeant. And, and I've, I've showed this Thank picture you. to several council members, but what, what, a, what, I, what occurred was we initially talked about a contextual overlay, and then what happened was some of these lots were big enough where they could put four houses on one lot based on the situation. So we decided to change it to an RS, residential single, and I've got about three or four people, including Mr. Osborne, that want to be opted out of the RS, and I'm meeting with uh, planning on Thursday to take care of that. Now, I'm going to tell you, I've been threatened to be sued, and all type of threats and things said about me that I don't appreciate, and I was thoroughly disrespected about doing this, but as a councilman, my job is to protect these neighborhoods and people were not, when this first came out, it went on Facebook, ballistic, and everybody asked me for meetings about this, and we had meetings about it, and this is the best we can come up with. Council at Large, Jim Shulman was at that meeting. He was aware there was a majority vote that night to go to the RS um, zoning. So I'm asking this council to pass this to preserve what Rayon City and Old Hickory has down there at this time. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna ask if the planning staff can confirm that I've gotten the commission's report correct. That's, the, that's correct. The planning commission uh, did make a recommendation um, to approve. Thank you. And we have a uh, council member in the queue, council member Jim Shulman. Thank you, uh, Madam Pro Tem. Um, I just want to vouch for the councilman. I did go to that meeting, and uh, he did take a vote, and it was majority. Thank you. Thank you. 
I believe we have a motion on the floor for approval. Move for approval as substituted, correct? Or you want to do it at the next meeting? Okay. Move for approval. So then. there'll be a substitute at the next meeting. We're voting That's correct. on it currently. Thank you. It's good to know. Any counsel on that? Okay. All right. So we're voting on the bill as submitted currently, knowing there may be a substitute on third reading. All those in favor of the bill? Aye. Any opposed? Bill is recommended. Bill is passed. Sorry. Next is uh, BL 2018-1269, Councilmember Kendall changes 1.45 acres from OL to MULA zoning for property located at 511 27th Avenue North and to rezone from OL to RM20A zoning for properties located at 514, 516, and 518 27th Avenue North and 2700 Delaware Avenue. Councilmember Kendall. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Do we need a... We do not need committee reports, just right. the public hearing. Just public hearing. Uh, move open to public hearing. Thank you. Um, all those in favor, please raise your hands. High. Thank you. All those opposed, raise your hands. Nice and high. Seeing no one in opposition, do those in favor wish to speak? No. Seeing that, I will close the public hearing. Council Member Kendall. Move approval. It's been moved and seconded. Council Member Schulman, you're left over from the last bill. Okay. Seeing no one in the queue for discussion, all those in favor? Any opposed? Bill passes. Next is BL 2018-1270, Council Member Anthony Davis. He's been, uh, we will move that one to the heel. Several people will help me remember that. Moving on to BL 1271, Council Member Blaylock amends 1.28 acres from RS10 to SP zoning for property located at 291 Tuscombe Road to permit two family residential use. Councilmember Blaylock. Thank you. Move to open the public hearing, please. Thank you. All those in favor, please raise your hands. Nice and high. Thank you. Any opposed? Like sign, raise your hands. Seeing none in opposition, would those in favor like to speak? Okay. No. Seeing that, I will close the public hearing. Councilmember Blaylock. Move for approval. It's been moved and heartily seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Bill passes. Next is BL 1272, Councilmember Bednay amends 5.65 acres of a specific plan for properties located at 6,444 and 6438 Pettus Road and on a portion of properties located at 6424 and 6434 Pettus Road to permit the modification of layout and access points. Councilmember Bednay. Oh, excuse me. I move to open the public hearing, please. Thank you. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. Any opposed, raise your hand. Seeing no one in opposition, would those in favor like to speak? No. Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Council Member Bedney. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we had uh, meetings in the, the district about this particular corner. Uh, it's uh, an intersection in my district and Pedas and Orangeville Road that have seen a lot of interest from the community and developers. So we had uh, the, the people that the offered to develop this property went through a great lengths to try to accommodate the community. And so that's probably why uh, you don't see anybody in opposition. I, uh, I tend to think that the system works very well and I'm, I'm very proud of uh, all my peers here in the council for the work they do trying to work with their respective communities. I also wanted to recognize David Plazas that is watching us on TV. Uh, anyway, uh, I move. Uh, I have an amendment to move. Uh, okay. Anybody wants to second? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any uh, discussion on the amendment? It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor of the amendment? Any opposed? Thank you. You're on your bill as amended. And I move to approve the bill as amendment on second reading. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. On the bill as amended. All those in favor? Any opposed? Bill passes as amended. Next is BL 2018-1273, Councilmember Rosenberg amends 1.76 acres of a specific plan for properties located at 7860 Learning Lane and 8236 Collins Road to permit a self-service storage facility. Councilmember Rosenberg. Thank you, Madam President. I'd like to uh, open the public hearing, please. Uh, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. In the gallery. All those opposed? Seeing no one in opposition, would those in favor like to speak? 
Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Council Member Rosenberg. Thank you, Madam President. Move approval. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Any opposed? Bill passes. Next is BL 2018-1274, Council Member Hastings changes 1.0 acres from R6 to MUNA zoning for property located at 2608 Old Buena Vista Road. Council Member Hastings. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem. I would like to open the public hearing, please. Thank you. All those in favor, please indicate so by raising your hand. Thank you. Any in opposition? Yes, okay. So with those in favor, please come to the lectern if you'd like to speak. I did see someone in opposition, so I'll give you an opportunity to excuse me. All right, we're gonna back up. If you're in favor, raise your hand. Thank you, if you're in opposition, raise your hand. Otherwise, keep them down. Okay, I do see some opposition, thank you. So, we have some on both sides. Would those in favor like to speak? <laughs> thank you, please state your name and address. Hi, my name is Chris Koch. I live at 1013 Gilmore Avenue. Um, I'm the owner of the property at 2608 Buena Vista. Um, this uh, acre uh, right now uh, is home to one single mobile home. Um, it also falls inside a T4 neighborhood center land use, um, which was a result of the, uh, the week-long community charrette that was taken last fall and presented to Metro Council, I think, early this year. Um, and the neighborhood spoke and, and determined that they want to see development uh, along the West Trinity Lane corridor. Uh, this property is, is right within that uh, intersection of West Trinity Lane and Buena Vista to the north and Young's Lane to the south. Um, with the current zoning there now, uh, if, if the mobile home was ever removed and that land was improved, um, five single family houses could be built there with the current zoning. I don't think that is consistent or appropriate with what uh, a neighborhood center um, land use would be. Neighborhood center being a mix of residential, um, even you know like a neighborhood uh, restaurant, coffee shop, some kind of mixed use there um, with an R6 zoning uh, that, that cannot happen. So I'm asking for um, uh, the, the MUNA zoning which would be more appropriate with land that is in a T4 neighborhood center land use. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in support wishing to speak? Seeing none, would those in opposition like to speak? Good evening, members of the council. My name is Clarice Rankins, and I live at 2837 Buena Vista Pike and am a member of the Haynes Trinity Neighborhood Coalition. It is my distinct honor to be the opening salvo for the Haynes Trinity Neighborhood Coalition to present our opposition concerning this proposed relocation of the on-site environmental. I believe you may have a different bill in mind. This is a rezoning from R6 to MUNA. We'll give you another opportunity to speak. Okay. It may be late. <laughs> Anyone else wishing to speak on this bill? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Council Member Hastings. You'd like your microphone. Thank you, Madam President. We'd like to move for approval. Been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Any opposed? Bill is recommended. We will go back to Councilmember Anthony Davis, BL 2018-1270, changes 1.3 acres from CL, R6, and R10 to MULA zoning for properties located at 1528, 1528B, 1528C, 1530 Riverside Drive, and 1609 Porter Road. Councilmember Davis. Thank you for that, Madam Chair. I would like to open the public hearing. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you, any in opposition? Seeing no one in opposition, would anyone in favor like to speak? Then I will close the public hearing. Council Member Davis. Thank you, I'll move for approval. Been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Bill passes. Now we are on BL 2018-1275. Council Member Anthony Davis applies 1.37 acres of a historic landmark overlay. One moment. 
Okay, and you may take these two together if you would like to. Yes, All right, yes. we will take these two together. BL 2018-1275 applies 1.37 acres of a historic landmark overlay for a property located at 1431 Shelton Avenue, and BL 2018-1276 approves with conditions, oh, applies 1.37 acres of a neighborhood landmark overlay district for property located at 1431 Shelton Avenue. Councilmember Davis. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to open the public hearing. Thank you. All those in favor of either bill, raise your hand. Thank you. Wow. Any opposed? Yes. All right. Uh, will those in favor please approach the lectern, state your name and address. Good evening, um, Madam Vice Chairman Pro Tem. I'm David Kleinfelter with the law firm of Reno and Cavanaugh and our address 424 Church Street. Um, pleased to be here tonight, very briefly speaking, representing Rachel and Josh, who have the neighborhood landmark overlay that's before you. Frankly, the historic overlay is not, con I don't think anybody's going to speak against that. There's some issues on the neighborhood landmark. Um, just a few words and then let, let the uh, designers and, and supporters speak. Um, you might hear later that there's some question that this is an illegal, the neighborhood landmark is illegal. It's not. Your council can explain it to you or Metro Legal. Um, it is a part of your law. There are upwards of a dozen neighborhood landmarks that are operating wonderfully in, in Nashville, including one in my old district and Councilmember Pulley's district. They're, they're fine. It's part of your law. It's never been challenged. Not one of the dozens ever been challenged and overturned. Um, even if there was a problem with the existing uh, act or the way it's been applied, there's an amendment that's being offered. I mean, the concern is that, that the council can't delegate to planning specific uses. An amendment's being offered or will be offered by the councilman that will have the council specifically identify the additional uses that the neighborhood landmark ordinance spells out and says additional uses may be permitted. Um, the purpose of the act law is to allow for some uses in order to preserve a piece of property. Um, speaking of preserving the piece of property, this is something that will preserve lots. You'll hear about a conservation overlay. There is one, and that's great. This provides additional protections. This piece of property has three existing lots in addition to the lot that the house is on. But what's great about this NLO, the Elbert Landmark, is it'll preserve the property in its current context, not only with the building, not only with the design plan that Scott will refer to, but it also preserves and, and will prohibit construction of houses on lots where they currently can be constructed according to codes. So I think this is it's preserving a wonderful piece of property. You'll hear who it was designed by, and, it's, and I'll, I'll let the other people talk about the fun stuff. Um, it's legal. Y'all can talk, ask your counsel. I thank you for your patience, and I would ask that you approve this uh, tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Pro Tem um, and esteemed council members. My name is Scott Morton with Smitchy Studio Architects. I reside in East Nashville at 1005 North 14th Street. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Councilman Davis, uh, the Planning Commission and the Historic Commission and the community at large for their support throughout this process. Um, beginning in March of this year, homeowners Rachel McCann and Josh Gray began meeting with neighbors about the proposal to create both a neighborhood landmark overlay district and a historic landmark overlay district, two separate applications. The purpose of applying for both of these metro designations was first to provide for the adaptive reuse of this historic structure for the operation of a basement recording studio and detached dwelling unit as a means of generating revenue for the preservation and enhancement of this historic asset. And secondly, to add the highest level of historic govern governance and protection to the property that will ensure that the integrity and cultural significance of the property will serve future generations of the community. We met early and often with the community um, with significant support, including multiple neighborhood association meetings, two special community meetings, the approval at Historic Zoning and Planning Commission, and many door-to-door -door discussions with neighbors. This historic property is unique and important for the Inglewood community. Davidson County and the state of Tennessee due to its significance in the region's cultural and architectural history. The stewardship of the property and the proposed uses will help stabilize and improve area property values, foster civic beauty, and enhance the neighborhood by creating a strong sense of place within. 
The development plan requires that the allowable uses shall only be permitted if the home is owner occupied. This provision will maintain a residential component to the development and prevent the property from operating independently as a non-residential use. And due to the unique characteristics of this property, it will not set a precedent for non-residential developments within the community. No exterior changes are proposed for the main historic structure. A small addition to a rear detached structure will provide the adaptive reuse component um, to the main house as an accessory use. Additional design controls are included with the ordinance to ensure that the proposed uses are compatible and sensitive to abutting properties, including providing the highest level of historic oversight, requiring the home to be owner occupied, complying with the Metro Noise Ordinance, limiting the parking to four spaces and away from the street, limiting the visitors to small groups, and the prohibition of tour buses on site. The Planning Commission has recommended approval and has determined that the plan provides for an economically viable use of this historic home. In order to support its preservation and the conditions incorporated will ensure that the use is compatible with the surrounding neighborhood and appropriate given this location. The creation of a neighborhood landmark district for this property is a textbook example of what Metro intended with its creation of this mechanism and is paramount in preserving the cultural significance of the property for generations to come. We really appreciate the support we received from the community, the council, the planning commission, historic, and appreciate your time. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, thank you for having us. I'm Josh Gray, and I live at 1431 uh, Shelton Avenue, owner at Ivy Hall. Uh, we're grateful that Metro Nashville has crafted the neighborhood landmark overlay to preserve and protect important neighborhood properties. Ivy Hall is historic, associated with the Inglewood Golf Course, architect Edwin Keeble, and beloved Nashville surgeon Cleo Miller. The neighborhood landmark designation is meant to protect the neighborhood character and context by preserving existing neighborhood fabric while permitting reasonable use of a property, and to enhance the neighborhood by providing a strong sense of place. Our proposal for the exception of a recording studio does just that. Our basement studio, which was built originally for personal use, requires no alterations to the site, so the property remains residential in character and scale. It increases the sense of community as small groups of creative people whose mission aligns with the greater aims of Nashville come together to collaborate. Ivy Hall is an inspirational backdrop for such creation. In addition, it is quiet, soundproofed, and parking is easy, easily accommodated far from the street. Our application is a win for everyone. It makes Inglewood better with a historic landmark overlay that will prevent future owners from diminishing the historic character of Ivy Hall. It protects Ivy Hall and removes temptation for future owners to attempt a less suitable role or appearance for the property. It adds to the communal life of the neighborhood without compromising its residential character. And I'd like to say thank you to the planning and Anthony Davis and thank you for he hearing us tonight. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Ben Surratt. I live in Inglewood at 1301 Riverwood Drive and I would like to thank you all for your time this evening and I would like to just express my support for this bill that our Councilman Anthony Davis has put forward and I hope you vote yes. Thank you. My name is Shane Wilson. I live at 2923 Glenmead Drive in South Inglewood. I'd like to thank you for your time tonight. Thank Councilman Davis for his time working on this. I just want to express strong support and hope you pass it. Thank you. Hello, my name is Janice Elizondo. I live at 1429, which is 50 feet from Cheryl and Josh. Uh, I mean, Rachel and Josh. I was thinking of Cheryl, my old neighbor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just want to say that my bedroom is literally there front yard is at my bedroom window. I've never heard anything. I don't hear the traffic. I don't know when they're home and when they're not home. Um, as far as the historic side of it, I can only say that I've lived in my home over 20 something years and I've seen Ivy Hall go down. When I first moved there, uh, Cheryl and her husband were there and it was immaculate. And then we got some different neighbors and the dogs tore the woodwork up and it became a mess. And so now you have Rachel who's an architect and I just, and they're both musicians. I just can't imagine anybody else that could take such excellent care of this property. I've been stopped twice on the street for people saying, 
you know, thanks for standing up for your neighbor. And I thought, well, that's what you're supposed to do because it's only right. It's only right that Ivy Hall has owners that are like these people. Thank you. Thank you. If everyone will just come on up, then we don't have to wait for the for the Sorry. walking up time. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Eric Loomis. I live at 218 Engle Avenue in Goodlettsville, but I've been an Englewood resident for the last four years. And uh, I'd like to thank the council for being here. I thank Anthony for his hard work. And uh, I am an audio engineer and work in the music industry. Uh, Josh and Rachel, the owners of Ivy Hall, are both musicians. And I've worked in their studio recording their music with local session musicians from the neighborhood in Englewood who make a living working in studios. And I think that being self-employed and being able to make a living from your home is something that should be allowed uh, not only in the United States of America, but in Nashville, Tennessee, and Music City. Uh, I also, first house I lived in in Englewood when I first moved to Nashville was built in 1934. Ivy Hall was built in 1935. And I had to move out of that house because it got scraped and tall skinnies got put up in its place. And I very much value the architectural significance of Ivy Hall, the architect Edwin, Ke Edwin Keeble who built the home, and uh, the rich history that it brings to the neighborhood and that I would like to see it continue to bring to the neighborhood by being preserved with this bill. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sarah Clanton. I live at 218 Ingle Avenue in Goodlitzville, and I too have spent the past four years in Inglewood and have uh, had the pleasure of experiencing time at Ivy Hall. And I am in support of the historic neighborhood landmark overlay. 1431 Shelton is a magical place that in my experience has only enriched the Nashville community, specifically in Inglewood. So I thank you for your time, and I hope that you will consider voting, voting for this important piece of East Nashville's history. Thank you. Hi, my name is Amanda Young. Thank you so much for your time tonight. I currently reside at 503 Jules Lane, which is in Lenox Village, quite far from Inglewood. But I have been friends with Rachel and Josh, the owners of the Ivy Hall, since the summer of 2014. I am a filmmaker, so I'm heavily involved with the arts community and have many friends who are in music. That's how I met and became friends with Rachel and Josh uh, four years ago. <coughs> Being a filmmaker, I travel a lot for work. I've been to many regions all over the world, uh, many regions within the US, and various neighborhoods all throughout Nashville. Sometimes I feel as if there's no street that I haven't been on. When I first went to the Ivy Hall, I felt it was the most distinct property I've ever been to in this county. Um, there's something very special about it. You'll hear it reiterated from the people behind me, the people in front of me. Their owners are also very special people. They are exceptional people. They are wonderful friends. They are also wonderful neighbors who have went out and knocked on their neighbors' doors. They have listened to what their neighbors had to say. Um, their closest neighbors will tell you that there are no noise problems with their studio, which is part of what they do as artists and part of who they are as musicians, adding to the vibrancy of our, of our city and our great art community. Um, I, having uh, spent time in the Ivy Hall visiting with them as friends, can confirm from my own experience that you can barely hear the sound of musicians while you're in the home, and you certainly cannot hear the sound of any music while you're outside of the home, even within their driveway area or within their uh, front lawn area. Um, to anyone who says that noise is, is a slippery slope to something else, I can say they are wrong because there have been no noise complaints. Um, the noise cannot be heard outside. There is no slope to slip down. Um, so, let me see here. The, the historic overlay to Ivy Hall is in the best interest, not only of Inglewood residents, but also to the entire Nashville community. Um, the overlay is an important bind for the house, the neighborhood, and future owners. Um, in a changing city, which is often incorporating non-regional architecture, the Ivy Hall features very strong regional architecture from historic time period. And I feel these overlays that they are requesting in this bill perfectly fit this property. Um, I think that's it. That's all I've got for you. Thank you very much Thank for you. your time. Good evening. My name is Danny Young, and I reside at 3218 Toddway Court. 
Uh, I'm actually a professional touring and studio musician um, and am in heavy support of this historic and neighborhood landmark overlay. Uh, I feel that the studio is actually a perfect use for the property and really, really allows Nashville's talented musicians to experience this historic property in the best possible way. And I also do plan or would love to be able to record there someday. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to you. My name is Stephen Smith. I live at 1418 Shelton. I've had the privilege of living in this neighborhood for 38 years. And it has been a place that I've raised children, generations. My grandchildren come over. I get to play in a large backyard, which is unique and unusual. And to walk the street and see one of the most significant, and I'm not an architect, but I appreciate beautiful architecture. And here is something that's nothing short of a, a piece of art, Tudor design. It's, it's magnificently maintained, and I would say that Josh and his beloved wife certainly have raised it to another extent in the care and the, and the looking at it. When you see it from the street, it's one of those things you want to preserve, not just for them, but for the, for the whole neighborhood. It's the unique house in the neighborhood in which there are houses that are beautiful, but you won't see anything quite like it. And so I think it is rather unique and it is special for this dear couple who we call friends and neighbors, who we cherish, who from their very background, the dear Rachel, who was a professor and a teacher of architecture for years, the sensitivity to which they have even done what they did inside the house and the way the studio was designed. It is a joy to me that I can still walk down the street and hope and believe that with this approval, that will be seen by people after me, that it will be one of those jewels that will be preserved. And part of the preservation for me is, is having neighbors like this who will use it in a very sensitive way that neither harms or hurts in any way the beautiful neighborhood that I have been allowed to live in and know them as neighbors, never hearing but only knowing them as homeowners and as friends. And I hope that they may also be able to fulfill their dreams of, of pursuing in a very careful way a song that will come out of that same building. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Cheryl Bretz, and I live at 109 Merrimack, but I lived at Ivy Hall for 11 years. I lived at Stratford Avenue, 14, 1349 Stratford Avenue for nine years before then, and um, I would pass that. It, it is a jewel in architecture and uh, preservation, and I was on the mayor's, um, when uh, Mayor Bredesen was here, uh, Beautification and Environmental Commission for five years. I do a lot of volunteer work still in the community and with preservation and the Metro Historic Commission. And I worked with um, Dr. Carol Van West, which is a state historian, to put Ivy Hall on the National Register of Historic Places. And the American Institute of Architects said that uh, Edwin Keeble was one of 20 of the most influential architects of the 20th century. So it is a, it has clay tile roof and copper gutters. It's a magnificent part of the neighborhood. And all the neighbors, I lived there for 11 years and I felt like it belonged to the neighborhood. We had parties all the time there and invite, uh, uh, people could walk there from the neighborhood. We'd have picnics in the front yard and so it's, um, but it's very expensive to maintain. Um, for 61 years, people have worked from that home. The people we bought it from, Mr. Frazier, had two businesses he ran from there. Um, I had a business consulting business and also a medical claims processing business I ran. I worked there for 11 years, and, and it was wonderful because it gave me more money to keep the, maintain the property because it is very expensive. 
And it's, uh, I'm also, now I own a real estate company, and the property is very, was very difficult to sell because it's very expensive and it's very expensive to maintain. When they see what the utility bills are, you know, a lot of people are out of there. So uh, it, this will be uh, something that will protect the property and give it uh, a, 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 a uh, revenue to, maintain the property for the whole neighborhood in the whole area and I thank you so much for the work that's been done on this and I, it's truly a gift to the neighborhood and they're, they're wonderful people the people that own it now and I appreciate you voting in favor of this. Thank you. Hello my name is George Bretz uh, I'm at 109 Merrimack I'm also the former co-owner <laughs> and resident at uh, 1431. And uh, I think they've pretty much covered everything that I could possibly tell you about it, other than I've done upkeep and maintenance when we lived there, and this amendment would really help preserve the place uh, to where, where it needs to be. Uh, there's so many characteristics in there and, and things in the house that you just can't go to Lowe's or Home De Depot and replace. Uh, they have to be preserved. And uh, so I ask for your support on this and hope that you'll vote for this amendment. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Rachel McCann and I live at 1431 Shelton Avenue, Ivy Hall. Our closest neighbors and the larger neighborhood are in support of our application. We have 11 people here today to speak in our support. We had two more who had to leave because the hour got so late. And we've assembled around two dozen letters and over 200 signatures in support of our overlay application. The majority of these are from Inglewood. Ivy Hall will always need protection. It sat on the market for long periods of time during the last two changes of ownership and needed much repair when we bought it. We have done our best for it. A wonderful byproduct of the application process has been the many conversations with our neighbors. A lot of inf misinformation and conjecture has floated around, and our conversations and meetings with neighbors have put people's minds at ease. We've been so pleased to see a significant number of neighborhood residents change their stance from opposition to support after learning more about our goals and intentions. I love hearing, hearing creative, productive people come here to share Ivy Hall with us. It connects us to the neighborhood in a way that simply living here never would. Ever since the use issue regarding the home recording studio was brought to our attention, we have done and will continue to do everything we can to fully meet Metro requirements. Approval of our application will allow Ivy Hall to remain a vibrant part of the neighborhood and will create protections for Ivy Hall for generations to come. A heartfelt thanks to all the supporters who've come out to speak in our behalf tonight. Thank you to Councilman Davis for bringing the matter forward, and thank you to the council for hearing our case. Thank you. Anyone else in support wishing to speak? Seeing none, would those in opposition please line up at the lectern? Madam Speaker, Council Members, my name is Rebecca Freeman. I live at 1304 McChesney Avenue. It's about three blocks from this house, from Ivy Hall. I'm a resident of the Inglewood Place Conservation Overlay where the house is located. I'm a member of the Coalition for Nashville Neighborhoods, and I'm on the board of the Inglewood Neighborhood Association. And I'm here to ask you to oppose the neighborhood landmark overlay. The goal of this pro proposal is to insert commercial zoning in a residential neighborhood under the guise of protecting an historic property. The owners are seeking to use this house as a multimedia production studio, a land use not allowed under any residential use in zoning statutory district land use tables. The current development plan in, in this proposal does not limit hours of operation. It doesn't limit commercial truck traffic. It doesn't limit signage. I, I ask you not to be charmed or beguiled by the words historic or historic landmark overlay here. Um, we don't have an opposition to the 
historic landmark overlay. Our problem is with the neighborhood landmark overlay. The neighborhood landmark overlay allows a commercial use in order to financially preserve significant properties that could be endangered without financial support. And here nobody is really arguing or can argue that this house is in danger of demolition or deterioration. It's a 4,000 square foot house. It's a very nicely preserved house. The only thing that would destroy it would be if the current owners decide to subdivide the front yard. This house, like all metro buildings, is protected by codes and safety ordinances. The, these property owners owe it to their friendly neighbors and to the city to comply with those rules. It appears that they haven't done this. There is ample indicia that they've been record, recording musicians in this house since 2016. They opened the house in May to show off the recording studio that they've constructed without building permits or subsequent codes inspections or fire safety inspections. Codes sent letters to these owners in January and March ordering cessation of the property use as a recording studio and requesting an interior inspection. As of the date of the Planning Commission meeting, they had not opened their doors to Metro Codes. I'm asking you not to reward regulatory noncompliance with a financial boon, and that's what it is here. And I, on one other related issue, I would ask you to look at the broader issue that, that may address your district eventually. I'm asking you to look at the legality of the landmark overlay ordinance before this or any future approvals. The council, by using this ordinance, effectively passes the authority to the Planning Commission to permit land use that's not, not allowed under base zoning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the council. I'm John Summers, 5000 Wyoming Avenue, and I'm here as chairman of the Coalition for Natural Neighborhoods. Um, two points I want to make to you tonight. Clearly what you have here is an illegal recording studio that they're now trying to use the neighborhood landmark as a tool within which to legalize that commercial use. Uh, I disagree with Mr. Kleinfelter. I think there's some significant issues with this ordinance because it if you read what Councilman Davis has filed, there's nothing mentioned in there uh, in terms of uh, land use. Now, I understand he's going to offer an amendment, which, uh, which Mr. Jameson has prepared for him, but I don't think that solves the statutory issues that it's this body that has to rezone and the land use was set by the Planning Commission. And so I think this council needs to look at that ordinance. I think it has legal challenges to it. But I'd like to talk with you quickly about the broader issue of recording studios. This council has consistently said uh, we should not have commercial recording studios in residential homes. Time after time after time, uh, when I was on this side of the bar, I voted against it. And now here I've come and spoken to you at least three times now, I think, on this issue. If you approve this tonight, then you need to accept the fact that you're going, to, going down that road of legalizing recording studios everywhere, your district, everywhere. And if that's the route you're ready to take, then that's where you're going to be going. I'd also remind you that the Beacon Center is today, has sued you, and it's, the suit is still pending, uh, challenging whether or not you can prohibit recording studios and beauty parlors in terms of residential neighborhoods. And so if I'm the attorney for the Beacon Center, uh, if you pass this uh, and allow this recording studio, this is going to be another part of my exhibits in terms of the inconsistency argument that they're going to make about land use policies. So you cannot approve one recording studio and not accept the fact that you may be approving all <laughs> recording studios because you may have a judge tell you that based upon equal protection, if you're gonna allow recording studios under this zoning scenario, you're gonna to have to allow them all under all zoning scenarios. And you won't control that, Metro Legal won't control it, it'll be a judge that will control it. Um, I've talked with Councilman Davis, I, I don't know that I've ever been on the other side of an issue with Councilman Davis, I appreciate that he's trying to protect this as much as you can, but basically you have, you know, and individuals that have admitted to you tonight that they're running a recording studio there and they want you to give them the ability to continue to do that. I think you're setting a terrible precedent. Our members, you've heard from our members over the last year, year and a half in terms of commercialization issues in our residential neighborhoods, whether it's short-term rentals, whether it's beauty parlors, whether it's recording studios. Uh, it's really hard to 
be for one and not for be for them all. And so I think that this is really more dangerous than just this one bill. Thank you very Thank much. You. I appreciate your time. Councilmember Davis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we'll move that amendment that I have, please. So we are going to um, take the bills in order. And the first one is the historic overlay. Is your amendment to that one or to the neighborhood? It should be to the neighborhood landmark. Okay, is let's that vote, the one? vote okay. on the first one, then we'll come back to that. So we're on uh, 12, 1275. You want to move approval for that one? Let's, yeah, quickly move approval for that, and then I'll. Okay, is there a second? second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor of 1275, which is the historic landmark overlay. Any opposed? On the historic landmark overlay. The, the second one is the controversial one. Do you want to roll call over a, a vote on this one as well, council member? Okay, do Madam Clerk, can we open the machines? Point of order. Yes, ma'am. Uh, council member Karen Johnson. Everybody's back here saying, what are we voting on? Sorry, we are voting on BL 2018-1275. There was a request for a roll call vote. This is the one on the historic landmark overlay, which I believe is the one that is not necessarily contested. Any other questions or explanation? Okay. Voting machines are open. Everyone present voted? I think so. Madam Clerk, can you close the machines? 31 in favor, one against, one abstention. Bill, bill is passed. Now we're on BL 2018-1276, which is the Neighborhood Landmark Overlay, Council Member Davis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Now I'll move the amendment if Mr. Jamison would maybe give a quick explanation of that or? Yeah. That adds uh, two uses, the multimedia production use and the detached accessory dwelling or DADU to those uses otherwise permitted under RS 7.5, it's base zoning. Thank you. And Council Mayor Henderson, did you wish to speak on this bill or? Okay, I apologize for not seeing you earlier. Okay, Council Member Davis. So I'll just move the amendment first and then I'll speak on the bill. Once okay. We uh, the bill has been moved and seconded. Okay, all those in favor of the amendment? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, Councilmember Davis. Now, uh, move the bill as amended with uh, just a couple comments. Um, so, thank you. First, I wanted to say thanks to everyone for coming out, uh, both for and against. Um, I won't take too much of your time. I know we want to move forward here. Um, obviously, Ivy Hall is a very cherished and historic property. Uh, I will tell my colleagues here, we. I do feel I've built a consensus in the neighborhood. I think you could tell that uh, from uh, the amount of speakers, but uh, we're planning commission approved, and I do feel with several meetings we've built a consensus. Uh, if you just afford me the opportunity, we'll get to planning committee. If there's questions on the nuances of this, hash out any details, we can talk about the legalities. We feel with that amendment we've, we've solved any legality question um, uh, as far as neighborhood landmark overlays, but um, if we can just get to planning committee and then discuss further from there, I would appreciate it. And uh, again, thanks to everyone for coming out and for all the lovely comments. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, have, do you have a, one member in the queue? Council member Mina Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a quick comment to the viewing audience, uh, because this is a public hearing and second reading. Uh, passing is just a procedure. It does not mean final approval. So at the planning uh, committee, we will have thorough uh, discussion. So for that reason, I will be uh, supporting uh, this bill, but uh, we'll have lots of uh, discussion uh, on the planning commission. Thank you for pointing that out. Any other discussion? Okay, we've had a request for a roll call vote. Okay, we hit, you're okay, we don't need that. You just want to abstain. Then we don't need a roll call vote. All right, we will do a roll call vote. Um, Madam Clerk, please open the machines. We are voting on the bill as amended, dealing with the na National Neighborhood Landmark Overlay.
Has everyone voted? Madam Clerk, would you close the machines? 25 in favor, five against, four abstentions. Bill passes on second reading, thank you. Now we are to BL 2018-1277, Council Member Sledge, changes 0 0.38 acres from R6 to MULA zoning for property located at 358 Glen Rose Avenue. Council Member Sledge. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem. Uh, please open the public hearing. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you, and any opposition? Seeing no one in opposition, would those in favor wish to speak? No, seeing that, I will close the public hearing. Council Member Sledge. Thank you, and I'll move approval. Been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Yeah. Bill's recommended. Next is BL 2018-1278, Council Member Sledge. Changes 0 0.39 acres from RS5 to MULA zoning for properties located at 2207, 2209, 2211, and 2211B Foster Avenue. Council Member Sledge. Uh, thank you. I'll open the public hearing, please. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Any in opposition? Seeing no hands anywhere, I will close the public hearing. Council Member Sledge. I'll move approval. Um, Okay, I had a note about being deferred. Was that this one? No, no, no. Sorry, I jumped down too far. Okay. Okay, move approval. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Bill is recommended. Next is BL 2018-1278, Council Member Sledge. Changes 0 0.39 acres from RS5 to MULA's. That was the one that said it was to be deferred. Is that incorrect? Okay, the note is in the wrong place. Pardon me. Okay. We are on BL 2018-1279, sponsors Mendez and Syracuse. Amends the Metro Code relative to the definition of alternative financial services and financial institution and location restrictions. Council Member Mendez. I'm told this needs to go to the Planning Commission first, so I'd move to defer the public hearing until the first meeting in September. Okay, it's been moved and seconded for a deferral to the first meeting in September. All in favor of a deferral? Any opposed? Bill is deferred. Now we are on BL 2018-1280, Council Member Hastings approves the plans for a non-hazardous liquid waste processing facility to be located at 2832 Whites Creek Pike. Council Member Hastings. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, we'd like to open a public hearing, please. Thank you. Would all those in favor please raise your hand? All those opposed? Great. Would those in favor please approach the lectern? Please give your name, a name and address before you speak. You'll have three minutes to speak, and it's it's getting late. So if you would not repeat other uh, yourself or people that have spoken before you, we would appreciate that. Uh, Three fifteen Dedrick Street with Tune Edrick and White. I represent the applicant in this matter. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Councilman Hastings for the time he's given this matter, both in meetings and on the phone. Uh, and I'd like to clarify at the front end, perhaps the biggest issue is misinformation about what is taking place here. Uh, I'd like to separate fact from fiction. Here's the facts. Our client operates a recycling facility. Principally, they take in grease from restaurants. They also take in oil and water that comes from uh, car washes. Uh, the facts are that the current site uh, is in the same councilmanic district as the proposed site. Uh, the current site has been there for 30 years. It's an old facility, it's grandfathered in. So many of the activities take place in an outside area. Uh, there's basically 100 trucks a day that come to this facility. Uh, they come down 30 residential streets. Uh, the use is not consistent with the land use policy for this area. The proposed site, because TDEC standards are there, it's all enclosed, there's no odor. The trucks are basically routed down Briley Parkway. Not one truck goes by a residential area. The use is consistent with the land use policy and its use is basically across the street from a quarry. With respect to the issue of grease, I want to be clear. The Jackson law does not require councilmanic approval for the recycling of grease. TDEC has confirmed that. That's an issue that's been raised. Secondly, I asked the members of this council to check with TDOT and TDEC, excuse me, with respect to the reputation of our client at the current site. I think that's particularly important to be checked out. Uh, with respect to the zoning issue, I want to clarify this is not any zoning issue. The property we're moving to is zoned IWD. It's industrial. It's what it's zoned for. 
The Planning Commission has for years talked about the lack of industrial space in Davidson County. This is an industrial area where this would be perfectly well suited. Uh, with respect to the facts that I've given you, if any of the facts which I've given to you are not correct, I'm hoping somebody who's in opposition will come to this mic and say, Mr. White said, here's the facts. I'd like them to talk about any of those that are not correct. Finally, Councilman Hastings has suggested that perhaps it might be worthwhile to do a bus trip to one of these enclosed facilities. My client operates three enclosed facilities, Chattanooga, Knoxville, and Memphis. We're more than willing to do that. If that's something that's suggested, we'll commit to that right now. We'd urge you tonight to pass this bill on second and to ultimately approve the matter when it comes back for final. But again, it's facts versus fiction. These are the facts. I want to hear them disputed by people that come. Thank you for your courtesies. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm Roy Dell with Dell and Associates, and I'm representing the applicant as well. <clears throat> You're all council members and you know how things sort of get crazy at the end of your first council term. And that's sort of what's happened here. Uh, many times you'll find out that someone's posturing for election, they create some, put a post on the internet, post some photographs of an old facility like this, people get all wound up and that's really what's happened here. Uh, it's been the implication that, or it has been implied that this old grandfathered facility that you see, you've probably all seen the photographs, it's gonna be picked up and moved somewhere else on another piece of property. That's simply not the case. That'd be picked up and moved next to our neighborhood. That's simply not the case. What will happen is a facility will be built. It's a recycling facility. It'll be a well landscaped building. It'll look just like any other building in an industrial area. And um, it's gonna be placed in an area outside of the community where this one exists today. There are probably two or 300 trucks that run through 30 residential streets to get at the current location. By moving this out White's Creek Pike in an industrial zone property across from Macquarie, there will be no trucks going down any residential street whatsoever. The property uh, that this existing facility is located on was part of a large piece of property that was reviewed by the community during the land use policy change for Haynes Trinity. And it was identified as an area of mixed use. It's down by the river, and it more or less has been approved for a mixture of housing, uh, restaurants, hotels. There's affordability that's worked in there as well. I've worked in this community for many years. Uh, many years, uh, and I've heard over and over again, when are we gonna get the good stuff? When are we gonna get a restaurant? When are we gonna get a hotel? Well, you know what? It happens now. It happens on this property, but in order for it to happen, this facility needs to move. There are other uses on, these, on this large property as well that will also move. There's a mulching facility, there's another industrial facility, and there's a, a concrete batch plant. All of that's gonna move to a properly located area, just like this facility will as well. So. I've had this discussion in two community meetings. I can speak exhaustively about how this is gonna go into a great building, and for whatever reason, it's just not necessarily believed. People keep saying, look, we don't want that next to us. Well, it won't be next to you. This facility will go away. So I think the council member had a very good idea to probably take a group of people and let them see this, let them physically see what this will look like, and I think that they'll feel much better about it. I'm very close to this area, like I mentioned before. I've done a lot of work here. I've helped a lot of people here. I don't wanna see anything bad happen to this area. I've never represented a project in this area I didn't think was good. I've never represented a project in this area did not have affordability. So uh, my heart is in this. I think that once the people see what's being proposed, I really do believe that they'll feel good about it. So I'm hoping that we'll pass this on second reading. I assume we'll have to defer probably for a length of time. This has to be done within 30 days by state law. And so uh, I would appreciate you taking the council members lead. Thank you. Thank you. I know the hour is late, and I'll be very brief. Um, both Tom and uh, Roy have uh, expressed some of the same ideas that I was going to talk to you about. The uh, About this time last year, we did a uh, study of the uh, Trinity Haynes area with all the major stake, stakeholders, and that uh, policy change came back before the Planning Commission in, in this past January and was passed unanimously. Um, this move tonight would allow the um, present um, property that Combs owns that where the, um, it's been kind of an eyesore for a while and uh, that they can move then to a new state of the art. Uh, there's traffic now presently on um, Baptist World Center Drive and White, uh, White's Creek Pike. 
this will eliminate that. It'll strictly be on uh, the uh, Bradley Parkway. Um, so the this is a plus. Once once they are able to move out, that property is now is on contract to close, and a major development to be there that Roy had alluded to. So based on that, I would ask you to uh, to consider this and vote favorably for it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McLean. Can you state your name and address? Uh, uh, Thirty five twelve Murphy Road three seven two oh five. Thank you. Thank you. That was Jim McLean. Good Would you say your name and address? My name is Edward M. Simmons, Sr. Address is 1421 Royal Baptist Center Drive. And those are the facts. I am the senior driver for this company. I have been driving for them for over 15 years. And they have several other companies outside of Nashville, and I have visited all of them. And they are all enclosed with the exception of Nashville's plant. If this company is allowed to move forward, it intends to build a facility in conjunction with their other facilities outside of Nashville, and they are all enclosed, and it's a huge difference. I suggest that the opposers listen at the facts and get the facts and ignore the rumors, because I, I have been to all of these plants, and it's a huge difference. And I suggest that this move forward and where we can continue to serve the community and be uh, be uh, up, upstanding, to, I mean, be, I'm nervous, so it, I'm You're not used to public speaking, but I just suggest that they listen to the facts and not the rumors, and the, uh, the rumors do nothing but, but <laughs> it causes lies. It, it, it's, 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 it's rumor about lies, and I want to Stop him because I'm because uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I rep represent, um, I just want to be in favor of the proposal. Uh, my name is Emmett Jones, um, 1421 World Baptist Center Drive, and I just want to say that, uh, uh, working for the company, I have witnessed, uh, you know, the, the owner of the company, the plant manager, and everybody underneath that they uh, care 100 percent about the, uh, the community and the environment. And as you, as you know, and as you have heard, this is just this is the first plant. OK, and so 30 years, you can imagine in 30 years how the technology has changed. And we believe me, we have adapted to the technology. So we want a green environment as well. You know, we did, you know, we, <clears throat> we want to treat <clears throat> renewable sources. Um, the new site, <clears throat> I think, is a win-win situation for everybody, just to be honest. Um, and like I said, uh, uh, the owner of the company, the plant manager, um, I hear him talking all the time, we are open-door policy. If there's any questions, you know, I, I know I, myself personally, We'll go out there and, and try, you know, uh, the best of my ability to com communicate with the residents, make sure that everything is all right. And uh, I just want to thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else in support wishing to speak? Seeing none, would any in opposition please line up at the lectern? Good evening, council members, Madam Speaker. My name is Clarice Rankins, and I am a resident at 2837 Buena Vista Pike and a member of the Haynes Trinity Neighborhood Coalition. It is my distinct honor to be the opening salvo for the Haynes Trinity Neighborhood Coalition to present our opposition concerning the proposed relocation of on-site environmental. Uh, the council should have received our written opposition to this proposal. However, members of our community are, have arrived here tonight to present in person their opposition to this move. 
thanks to the Riverside Seventh-day Adventist Church, and some have arrived via uh, access ride, those who have disabilities. Some have carpooled. Others have used public transportation. All are here to ensure that you hear their voices and see their presence to know that they are very concerned about the issues surrounding this relocation. So without further ado, I relinquish the floor and give their, give their attention and your attention to them. I give you my friends from Haynes Trinity Community. Good late evening, council ladies and council gentlemen. I am Mary Carver Patrick. I live at 3825 Dubois Drive. I am a member of the Haynes Trinity Neighborhood Coalition, and we are opposed to on-site environments move from 1421 Baptist World Center to 2832 Whites Creek Pike. This move would clear the way for up to 15-story buildings to be built on its present site and move the facility a couple of miles north. The new plant would be placed next door to the predominantly African-American Haynes Manor community of 900 homes. We feel this is environmental racism at its worst, clearing the way for gentrification and moving waste facilities out of sight of downtown, but still well within three miles of downtown and in a minority neighborhood. According to their website, the on-site environmental facility processes and recycles restaurant grease and other liquid waste. The current facility has operated for decades, as they've stated, and has a past history of spills and releases. As recently as 2017, the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation investigators determined that on-site environmental violated Tennessee's solid waste management regulations by releasing solid waste onto a floodplain that led to Page's Branch. The violation notice said, oil, grease, and absorbent materials were being released over a burn, down an embankment, and onto the floodplain leading toward Page's Branch. This release covered several hundred feet in extent. Roy Dell has championed the new facility as being modern and enclosed, but we are deeply suspicious of their past history of violations, foul orders, and unsanitary grounds next to Page's Branch. The new location on Weiss Creek Pike also borders a floodplain next to Ewan Creek. Due to their past conduct, we do not believe they will maintain their property any differently than in the past. And we are asking you to vote no. Good evening, council members. My name is Joyce George. I live at 711 Work Drive in the Haynes Manor subdivision in which I have lived there 51 years. I have raised my children there and some grandchildren. Back in 2008, before Nashville became the It City, the Haynes Manor Association opposed Dale and Associates from building residential homes in close proximity to the Whites Creek Rock Quarry. This development was abandoned, and Dale and Associates introduced the park at Ewing Creek. With the help of then Councilman Harrison, the property in question was rezoned 
SP, specific plan, MI, mixed industry. It was the desire of the community at that time to utilize said property as an industrial complex, which would consist mainly of attractive one-story warehouses for retail storage or office space. Contrary to rumors, the community is not against de development in our area, but we want development that enhances our area. It is said that it is already zoned for this company, but that doesn't mean we will accept anything. This being said, I oppose the relocation of the waste processing plant. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Pro Tem and fellow council members. Um, thank you for your public service and for hearing us today. I'd like to start by asking you to vote no on this bill. My name is Zach Deer and I live at 681 Brick Church Lane in Whites Creek. I'm about a mile, mile and a half away from this location. I would like to dispute Tom White um, from what he said in the beginning in that this is not zoned IWD. It's actually, from what I can tell, it's an SP. And so I'm here today to actually dispute um, basically the SP. Um, under Metro guidelines, they specify that the specific plan district is not intended for speculative development projects, but rep represents the applicant's firm intention to develop according to a master okay. development plan in a single development operation. I think there are multiple phases was another part to that. Within the Nashville.gov Q&A section, it states that the SP district is intended to be used by applicants that have a project in hand and ready to go. I'll remind you that this is almost a 10-year-old SP from a day when Nashville was not a neat city. Um, since that time, there have been four to five transactions of the property, each without planning commission scrutiny. If this bill isn't killed, the SP should at a minimum be sent back to the planning commission for a vote. Another event has occurred since 2008, and that was Nashville Next. In case there are still a few members who remember that era, this parcel's policy is T3 Neighborhood Center. Either way, my fellow Whites Creek neighbors and I overwhelmingly preferred commercial growth to industrial. Thank you again for your time, and please vote no on this bad bill. Thank you. Good evening, Council. My name is Bobby Stockard. I live at 606 Chris Street, where I've been a resident for 55 years. My neighborhood is known as Trinity Hills, which is a member of the Haynes Trinity North uh, Neighborhood Coalition. We are one of eight neighborhoods and two churches and one college that make up this coalition. Our coalition worked with the planning department to put together a land use charrette that was approved by the planning commission earlier this year. We monitor all projects that are coming before the planning commission to keep our members informed. And we also meet with developers to discuss how we can work together to help improve our community. I live one mile from the grease plant in its current location, and I'll live one mile from the new location if it's approved. But I'm here to support my coalition neighbors to defeat the bill. The Haynes Mountain neighbors have already have to deal with the rock quarry and the asphalt plant. Speaking with former Councilman Harrison, he also told me that this thing was uh, approved for light industrial and not for this type of environmental industrial. Two weeks ago, our councilman uh, held a community meeting, which uh, Mr. Roy Dale and Mr. White both attended. This took place after the first reading had already passed on this grease plant. We heard a lot about a lot of new technology and how the plant was going to be with the new standard procedures and about the traffics that would not be running up and down the streets. But I found out that Mr. Uh, Combs is going to be selling this plant. He's not interested. He wants to get out of this. So if we get new uh, owners, they don't have to be obligated to all of these beautiful perks that they promised us. We asked our councilman at that meeting and also at a meeting a couple of nights ago to withdraw this bill, but he told us no. 
I appeal to the entire council to vote this bill down, and especially the at-large council persons whose responsibility is to represent the entire council, council I mean, the entire count, county, and especially when there is an absent of a council person. And I think we don't have a transparent or a, an accessible council person. Please vote this down. Thank you. My name's Winnie Forrester. I'm a president of the Haynes Heights Neighborhood Association, and we are also a member of the Haynes Trinity Neighborhood Coalition. Um, I'm going to address a couple of things that uh, Mr. White asked us to. Um, number one, I want to talk about property values and incompatibility with existing development. The Haynes Trinity area land use policy was indeed updated in January of this year. We participated in the Surrette and uh, worked with uh, the community and other stakeholders. Um, we felt the end result was a good solution because uh, we were able to downgrade the land use policy for the existing historical neighborhoods and we felt that was a win-win because we were able to protect our historical neighborhoods while giving the riverfront and the West Trinity Lane corridor which is um, thinly populated basically giving it to the developers so that they could bring what we want restaurants coffee houses and what have you so our area basically has become a developer's dream. And Mayor Briley the other day even said that he took the three finalists for the planning uh, commission executor director. He took the three of them down West Trinity Lane to ask them what the, how they would envision it. You know, so we feel it's just no longer appropriate to have industrial waste plants located in the middle of our community. We, uh, this SP, this 10-year-old SP is surrounded by thousands of residential homes. You've got the neighborhoods of Haynes Manor, Haynes Heights, Clay Mill Station surround this facility. Chateau Valley, Nocturne Forest, Brookview are also very nearby, and one half mile to the north of this SP is the newly built $400,000 Vista at Whites Creek and Parmalee Cove homes. So it's increasingly becoming more and more isolated, and you know, many of these neighborhoods have already had the values of their homes take a hit with the Whites Creek quarry, the loud blasting, the, uh, the asphalt plant that's next to the quarry pollutes the air. So we ask you not to subject us anymore to additional solid waste plants in, in our midst. We want the commercial and the retail shops. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ryan Holmberg. Uh, I live at 621 Malta Drive. It's in the Haynes Heights neighborhood. Um, I've only lived there for about four years and absolutely love the area. I've lived in Nashville for 16 years of my life and absolutely love it. Um, I think that this bill, I strongly oppose it because this area has so much potential and I think it would be short-sighted to pigeonhole it into a uh, industrial zone and squander its potential as being potentially a new uh, charming neighborhood for this town. So I strongly oppose and that's it. Thank you. Good evening, Council of Nashville. My name is Robert Williams, Jr. 2625 Walker Lane in Nashville, Tennessee. I built a home in 1997, transplanted here from a different location. And uh, one year after building my home, I lived in California and I thought I had an earthquake. 
but it was a rock quarry. Realizing when I built my home that I was only a mile from it. Since that time, I've been at that house 22 years, had to replace bathroom tiles twice, and just recently finding out that another industrial business wants to move down the street from me called the grease plant that's been in one location 30 years. At the last meeting I attended, this group said they had looked all over Tennessee, couldn't find another location. But White's Creek Pike, a mile away from where they are now for 30 years, is a perfect place. I find that very hard to believe. So tonight I ask you to vote no on this. We don't need any more industry like this in our community. Hopefully, we will be experiencing growth along the Trinity Lane, Whites Creek area that will bring a different blueprint to our neighborhood. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm Vicki Taylor and I reside at 2658 Old Matthews Road. And I'm also representing my mom who lives at 716 Ringo Drive in the Haynes Manor neighborhood. I'm also a part of the Haynes Trinity Neighborhood Association. And we ask that you oppose this move of the grease plant. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Beverly Brazelton Townsend. I reside at 709 Ringgold Drive in the Haynes Manor community. I am imploring you all tonight to vote no on this bill. We are tired of being the dumping ground for Nashville and other areas. How long? Too long. May I say that again? How long? Too long. There are many reasons why, and most people have already alluded to that, have said something about that. This morning I was sitting on my front porch, just like most senior citizens do in the morning, or they look for a peaceful place to read or meditate. And this ear on this side, I heard gunshots continuously for about two hours. That's Metro Police Department practicing. On this side over here, heard loud noises from the rock quarry, and I live several blocks from the rock quarry. I live Hanks Ringgold, uh, seven blocks from the rock quarry, the machines go, constant hum hum, noise pollution and things like that. So we are continuously getting lots of different kinds of pollution. The reason why we should not have this rock, excuse me, this new recycling plant for uh, oil, one thing is location. It's already a traffic jam in that area. There are a plethora of trucks that go through there every day. They're already running loose. We have UPS. We have FedEx, we have the Rock Quarry trucks, and poor Metro school buses. When they come out of Lane Drive, poor things, they pray that they get out in time before a big truck comes down the road already that they can get the children out and go to the school in which they're assigned to. And not only are the school buses, we as citizens, when we come out, we have to hurry up and scurry out of Lane Drive because you can't see over that hill. And when more trucks come in, what, they, what did they say, from 6, 40, 6 a.m. in the morning until whatever at night, there would be 30 plus trucks, too many trucks. Health issues, Haynes Manor and the Bordeaux community already host a lot of, we already have a lot of materials. Um, it's a toxic area. I wanna say that again, it's toxic out there because there's so many chemicals. The man talked about the, uh, rock, the, the sound like an earthquake. Every day you get jumbles and rumbles. Your heart palpitates. You get uh, rock dust from the rock quarry. The police department is bang, bang, banging all day long. It's sad what we have to go through. I am, I've been there 42 years and I'm called it still a young resident out there. A lot of the members have been out there 50, 60 years and they are tired. How long have we been tired? And how long? Too long. So I implore you all tonight.
Good evening. My name is Terry Short. I live at 3899 Crouch Drive in the Haynes Manor community. What I want to talk about is some unintended consequences of this um, environmental uh, company. Recently, UPS just built a massive parking lot for their trucks down on White's Creek Pike. And um, I live along Crouch Drive, so I've had two floods since the 2010 flood. And the last big flood that we had, runoff from UPS filled the middle of this big field, abandoned park behind my house. Normally the water comes from the creek towards the homes. Now it's beginning to flood to the middle. If this massive development comes, then what are the consequences? How much more flooding will we have? Who is doing the study to see how these, how the water, how whatever the runoffs are from these properties, where they're going and how they're directed? They're not going to the creek right now. We have White's Creek that also will be uh, possibly um, become contaminated because of the um, runoffs from this company. I also want to talk about the buffer. They said there's a 300 foot buffer which will set the property further back off of the road, but also further back into the floodplain. Again, creating a much larger hazard than we already have as far as flooding, and then how is this water gonna be directed and who's monitoring that? So I ask Councilman Hastings to pull this bill, support what the community wants, the community is tired of our representatives sponsoring these the developments. We keep telling them over and over again that this is not what we want, but instead somehow they figure it doesn't matter. They're insignificant, but I'm telling you we're not, and we're gonna start making changes in how we elect people and that there are people that represent us. Vote against this bill, thank you. Good evening, everyone. I want to thank you all for your time and for being here on this evening. My name is Gregory Fonsis. I am one of the ministers at the Riverside Chapel, Seventh-day Adventist Church, located at 800 Young's Lane. And in this moment, I'm reminded of the late, great Dr. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who said that the church must be reminded that it's not the master or the servant of the state, but rather the conscience of the state. And it must be the guide and the critic of the state and never its tool. So I came here tonight in solidarity with the uh, with this community in opposition to this bill. And as a member of the clergy, I'm here to serve as a moral conscience of this meeting to ask these council of leaders, where is the moral conscience in regards to this bill? I ask this because of our own councilmen, um, because if our own councilmen is if any indication of your collective thoughts, then I fear that there is a lack of integrity in this meeting. Uh, what has been mentioned thus far tonight has been this idea of fact versus fiction. And the the fact is that Councilman Hastings entered into the walls of my church this past Thursday and stated that he himself does not want this environmental plant in this community. However, he comes tonight to approve this bill because it's said to be a matter of the law. Well, the truth is, is that it is a matter of the law, but it's not a matter of the law of the land. It's actually a matter of the law of more human morality and ethics. Uh, moving the grease plant from the Baptist World Center to the White Creek Pike area is a form of intentional environmental racism that objectifies the members of this community as nothing more than inanimate objects as uh, without dignity and decency. It exposes them to unfair and unhealthy living conditions, and it just decreases their property value and morale. It will violate the human code of ethics due to its strategic and evil ability to paralyze current community members and future generations from being able to live in the human conditions entitled to us as American citizens. So, councilmen, councilwomen, I implore you this evening to vote this bill down, not just as leaders of our community, but leaders of our community with a high moral conscience and ethical character. Thank you.
Good afternoon, council people. Uh, my name is Isaac Burford. I reside at 3843 Crouch Drive, uh, zip 37207. I'm here uh, in opposition to the bill that's here before you tonight. I'm here because uh, I, I've been living in that community for over 50 years, and I've seen a lot of changes cut to go through, and it hadn't always been positive. Um, I've been to two meetings within the last couple of weeks, and we try to, to try to find out really what's going on. Uh, one of the public meetings, we had an opportunity to ask questions of the people that want to move the plant down, and we one question that was asked, not by me, but another one that really concerned me. The question was, how did you come to decide to move down at the location across from the um, work quarry? Had you tr looked at any other locations? And the man representing the company said, yes, he had looked at various locations. And one that really concerned me was one in Clarksville in Montgomery County. He said it was an ideal place until the uh, People looked at it, and had the planning commission looked at it, and they decided that the amount of sludge and so forth would impact their sewer plant, so they denied their request to put it in there. So they ended up back at this location here. It's on a, it's down there a mile from where we, where the uh, old location is, but it's going to impact us more. We have an old sewer system that's overtaxed. It's been there for over half a century, and we're having problems already there. And if you, uh, uh, for example, some of the homes are getting raw sewage coming back into the house because the sewer system is overtaxed. If you put that plant in there and uh, have the sewage from it coming into the already overtaxed, uh, sewer system, it'll completely destroy our community as a place to live. And so we ask that you deny their request to move that plant because it would be a burden on us. Thank you very much, sir. My name is Ruby Burford, and my husband and I, who just finished uh, speaking, we have lived at 3843 Crouch Drive for 54 years and raised our two daughters there. And I'm, I'm here to say that I'm opposed, quite opposed, to moving this uh, grease plant closer to us. Um, Last month, uh, we attended the meeting where we were told that this was the best place to place this uh, facility. But we were not told why it was the best, that they had looked and this was the best place for it to be. And uh, th there was also some discussion about a 300-foot buffer and I'm not an engineer or anything like that, but to me, 300, uh, 300 feet is, is not a lot. And that uh, they would do that didn't, I think that was the minimum that it should be. I believe that's what they said. And they would be happy to, you know, put that amount uh, where it wouldn't be seen. True. It may, but I don't see how that was possible either. If you put up trees and shrubs and things, it takes time for them to grow. So I don't think that was completely accurate. Uh, even though that be the case, that it wouldn't be, wouldn't be seen like the other location, which looks very bad. Uh, there was no mention of noise and the stench. As I talked with the young lady today who go, goes up and down the street, 
uh, Baptist World uh, Center Drive quite often, and she said that sometimes that stench was pretty bad. Uh, so I'm not in favor of, of this facility. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Barbara Galloway. I live at 745 Garrison Drive in the Haynes Manor subdivision. Um, I am in opposition of this plant being moved. I won't stand here and restate and rehash what has already been said. But I do appeal to the conscience of the council in thinking this over and considering this and, and, and opposing it. Thank you. Good evening, my name is, <clears throat> excuse me, Shirley Allen. I reside at 3828 Dunbar Drive. I have been in Nashville for nine years. And I remember <clears throat> first coming in that I heard these trembles when I moved into my home. I didn't know what was going on, so I ran out of the house. It was like an earthquake. And that was coming from the carry across from us, White Creek. It is amazing <clears throat> how we look at things and how we see them from different perspectives. And I guess it's based on what we have been used to and what we have been thinking in terms of <clears throat> wanting to see how things can grow. Right now, I'm opposed to the idea of this grease plant or factory being relocated in our area of the fair city of Nashville. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Sheila Clark. I reside at 614 Lane Drive. And someone mentioned they just wanted the facts. And the facts tonight is that we do not want this bill. We want you to vote no to this bill. Thank you. Hello. My name is Bobby Moore, and I live at 3911 Crouch Drive, which is in Haynes Manor, and I stand in opposition to this bill. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Linda Cloyd. I live at 2229 Whites Creek Pike, and I've lived there for over 60 years, and I would just like to oppose this bill. Thank you. I'm Dr. Karen Dunlap, and I'm a member of the Haynes Trinity Neighborhood Coalition. I live at 1533 Lock Road, which is near the current plant. So I am very much in favor of a move because I have smelled the stench, but not to my neighbors. Uh, area, not to where it's proposed now. And therefore, I ask you, too, to oppose this bill. Hi, I'm Hazel McLemore Schofield, and I live at 505 Palmley Drive, one of the subdivisions, new subdivisions in the area. And we only learned about this bill about two weeks ago. The community has not had a meeting. We have no information. We have no facts. My homeowners are half my age, and most of them had to leave tonight because they go to work and they have little kids. And we want to oppose this bill, and we also want to delay it until we can have a meeting with somebody who will speak to 100 homeowners plus the homeowners in the Vista uh, neighborhood. So we do oppose this bill. Good evening, council members. Thank you for your time. My name is Angela Williams. I live in Whites Creek, 7203 Old Hickory Boulevard. I stand with my neighbors today and old opponents, Mr. White, Mr. Dale, um, because Mr. White represented um, three years ago Vista development right on the other side of Briley Parkway, touting that residential was coming and this is all we need. And Mr. Dale, I believe, was involved with Parmley Cove, that 100 houses that took out the side of the mountain that causes a flooding problem down White's Creek Pike. I think they're very familiar to the area, um, but I'm not sure, I think, I'm not sure that the, I think it's all about the money involved. 
So <clears throat> the rock quarry um, is slated to close, I think, within the next 10 or 12 years. Um, it's been extenuated twice, and it is. It's running out of space, and uh, it, it is a problem in the area. But we have a chance to come back here, okay? So, um, and the other thing I think that is significant about this is that it, White's Creek Watershed is the largest watershed in Davidson County, providing the cleanest water source that we have. And I think we need to protect that. And I think Mr. Dale is well known for removing the topsoil and replacing it with, with rocks on acres and acres of land in North Nashville. And I think that has promoted more flooding. And I think they're very aware of the flooding issues. And I think putting a grease plant in the middle of a place that has so much potential in the North Nashville corridor for conservation and community quality of life, I think is a step backwards. And I think we're smarter than that. You know, as a crow flies from this location, we're less than two miles from the county dump, two and a half miles from two prisons. Uh, you know, I think North Nashville's had enough. And I think you can make a stand to tell the rest of the community that, it's, that the growth in Nashville is for everyone. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Pearly Murray Dunn, and I'm Vice President of the Haynes Manor Neighborhood Association. I'm sure all of you have gotten emails from me twice. I am opposed to this bill, and I've told you why, and I say ditto to what uh, some of the others have said. We are an older neighborhood, and we have uh, problems with allergies and so forth, and I know that I'm allergic to different smells, and this is going to be a smell. I talked with uh, my councilman. He called me. I thought that he was going to withdraw this bill, but he told somebody else that he wasn't. He told me he would. So I ask you to vote no on this bill because it is detrimental to our community. Thank you for your time. Good afternoon. I am Louise McLean, and I live at 619 Lane Drive, and I oppose this bill, please. I'm Mark Horowitz, live at 617 Pierpoint Drive. Been there about two years. Uh, uh, the first gentleman that spoke was saying about rumors versus facts and that they want most of the tru the trucks are all going to be accessing Brawley Parkway. Um, I don't think that's going to happen. If they take, I'd like to take a look at the route about all the trucks take. It really seems impractical that all the trucks would be accessing Brawley Parkway. But something else I'm thinking about, I'm somebody that's lived in a lot of cities. And I've lived in primarily, uh, just moved to the neighborhood only two years. But before that, I lived in Green Hills. Uh, actually, Hillsborough Village. And I'm thinking about what makes up a neighborhood. Um, one of the things that I'm missing in my neighborhood is buying fresh food, buying flowers. Uh, think about your neighborhood ac accessing that. The, the one thing that's happened in our neighborhood, this is going to seem abstract, is we have uh, a number of liquor stores, um, and then there's, there's a large junkyard. And one of the greatest things that happened was somebody put up a, built a daycare center. The whole energy of that really kind of brought the neighborhood up. And all of a sudden, somebody's going to put a restaurant where there's a laundromat. I doubt if a lot of you have laundromats in your neighborhood. So the point I'm making is that the complexion of a neighborhood, having um, a processing plant in there, although it may be safe, there's going to be trucks, a lot of traffic coming through, but this is not the type of neighborhood that I really want to live in. I oppose it, and the voices you've heard, I believe that they're on the same page. Thank you for listening. Good evening, I'm Tyrone Jolly. I live at 3072 Carrington Place. I grew up and lived my adult life until the first, about a year ago now in Haynes Manor. My job has allowed me the opportunity to deal with a section called odor control. Yeah, I work at Metro Water Service, sewer odor control. I have worked with chemicals, hazardous materials to control odor, 
filters, air fresheners, and scrubber systems. I have repaired and maintained scrubber systems. Yep, they do a pretty good job. And they work like most electronic equipment most of the time when they work. I'm here to tell you no matter what part of the city you're in or wherever, waste material stinks. And this is going to be right here in our neighborhood, smelling. We can call it a nice pretty building with trees and a buffer, but waste material has an odor. And that's going to be in our neighborhood. I understand the legal ramifications and how it was zoned. I was a part of when it was zoned and changed. And at that time, the intent was the better of, that was the better of two evils. I do believe that this change has been tweaked well to fall in the parameters because that was not the intent of when we had the law change or the build or the zoning change. All I'm just asking you is, if this was your neighborhood, would you want 350 feet behind your house some type of refuse plan? I oppose this bill. Good evening. I chose to be last because I live on Rebels Drive. And this building could very well be behind my front, my backyard. I'd like to say, I'm hoping that you will not pass this bill. I have a family, and I have Revels Drive neighbors. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to speak? Seeing no one else, I will close the public hearing. Council Member Hastings. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam President. And uh, I would like to thank everybody who came out to speak tonight, either in for or against. Uh, me, it's the councilman. Excuse me, we need a committee report. Uh, I forgot to remind you uh, about that. A committee that. report? Yes, Councilmember okay. Elrod. Let me find you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the Public Works Committee took no action except to re-refer this for third reading. And uh, after the councilman speaks, I, uh, I'll talk about that a little bit. So I'll that's, come back to you. that was our recommendation. Thank you, Councilmember Hastings. All right. Thank you again. Uh, again, thanks to everyone that came before. Uh, I'm trying to remember the order. I have to say what we're doing, and then we can go into a brief, brief explanation. Uh, the committee is referring to go into third reading, so we would like to move for approval on the floor. Uh, also, with with the approval on the floor, this is what what. Now I said that. Now I can you talk. Right. Brief explanation. All right. Brief explanation. What, what is actually going on with this, this uh, thing? This is actually a part of the Jackson Law. The Jackson Law that uh, uh, Councilman, uh, the Councilman who, who is now Judge Leonardo actually brought forth along with me as, as the sponsor of this bill. This bill would not come before my community if this was not in place. I have been working really, really hard since I have been in office to make sure that there are new credible things that are happening for my community. I would, we stood for it and we said no more dumps, no more trash, no more of those things that are coming out for my community because it's way, way, way too long. I grew up in this community. My grandfather was at the cor corner of Crouch and Rowan Drive. I know what's going on. I am not going to do things negatively to hurt our community. I respect the people that got up to speak today. I work with these, and I, I hear your me meetings. I hear your cries. None of these things are going to go forth. The first thing that is coming forth with this legislation is this. The legislation, the land use was changed by the former councilman before I got into office. That legislation stands today. Whatever that goes forth on this land, I don't care if it's, if it actually, we look tonight that it wasn't SP that changed it over, but actually on that land, anything could go there industrial, 
It could be, I think we, we saw some, some uh, uh, industrial office space and all of those other things. I wasn't here. I don't know. But the thing I can do right now is make it straight. I can tell the truth about the situation and tell you everything that is going off on before. What I did is I got with the, uh, the attorneys and, and also the developers tonight, and I told them, listen, if my community is not for this, I am not going for it. I am not going for it. We have the opportunity to third reading. They asked me tonight, they said, listen, we would like to take some of your community or whoever wants to go down to Chattanooga or whatever else to show them the process of this land and how everything is. And I said, okay, if the community wants to go, you can speak to them and you can talk to them. But by the third reading, and, and all of you hear me, by the third reading, if the community says no, and we will have a meeting, and I look to you straight in your eyes, just like I asked you for your support and your vote, if by the third reading, if that is not what we want, we will not have it under that guideline. But we have one thing that we do have to do that they don't need our approval. They don't need our approval to have the grease side of their business in our area. They don't need it anymore. They can move that over there. As long as the people who own that land sell them the, the uh, facility, they can move there. I can't do anything legislatively. Nobody can because the previous, previous councilman did it for us. I appreciate all of you guys coming out here today. I will work with you. We will have some more meetings. These guys that, that are representing those companies will speak with you. They will work with you. And if it's a no, it's a no. And that will be it on the third reading. Thank you very much. We'd like to close. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. We do have a few council members to discuss. Uh, council Member Elrod, do you want to speak again? Uh, yes, ma'am. I just want to reiterate the... Um, according to the Jackson Law, Mr. Jameson, if you're able, if you can remind us, there's certain, I think, findings we have to have. Is that right? There's certain criteria that you consider in, in approving or disapproving. So um, the Public Works Committee, um, of course, we had all received all of the emails that we wanted to hear from the public tonight and not, so the, pu the Public Works Committee did not take an action on it. Instead, we will be taking action um, on third reading, and we're the only committee that the this ordinance is referred to. So the committee, a committee has to take an action, so it would have to be the Public Works Committee. Um, so uh, we'll be doing that. I think we'll have to go probably go through some of those criteria um, if it does make it to third reading. So I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member O'Connell. Thank you, Madam President. As a follow-up to that, um, and I apologize to the chair here because I was, as a result of a lot of cross-scheduling and a lengthy committee meeting, I was in and out of the room a couple times. I, it is unclear to me, um, there have been a couple things said, I think, both in committee and, and sort of in this discussion that, that have left me unclear on. What are, what are the implications for uh, passage versus defeat of this in terms of the, the Jackson law and how it applies to something like this. I know this is not a zoning bill per se, uh, but you know, does, does success here mean it proceeds and, and disapproval mean that uh, this is limited or does disapproval mean that, hey, they can build most of this and not some of it? The, um the Jackson Law is not a model of clarity. When we adopted it two years ago, our office contacted TDEX Council and asked them to tell us it is clear that it applies to landfills, but it also applies to solid waste facilities and solid waste processing. What does that mean exactly? Would that apply to an anaerobic digester or not? So we literally published in the analysis everything that TDEC's senior legal counsel said it applies to, and the second column was the things it does not apply to. Then on a case-by-case -case basis, when we get these items brought to us, we contact TDEC's legal counsel. In this particular case, this is the second time that this facility uh, applied to TDEC. It was originally under Combs, Inc., and now under on-site environmental in both instances, TDEC submitted it to Public Works with instructions to proceed under the Jackson Law, and that is our direction that the Jackson Law applies. 
then you would take, if this were to be, let's say, hypothetically defeated, I would construe that as a law of specific application trumping a law of general application. In other words, yes, this area is zoned SP industrial. It's allowed for industrial uses. But if you have a law of specific application, you can't have a landfill, you can't have a solid waste processing facility unless you uh, successfully pass this ordinance. You could do anything else allowed under the SP which does allow industrial, but does eliminate a few other uses. But you could not proceed with a landfill or solid waste processing if this provision doesn't pass. Okay, and then I guess that leads to follow up uh, to planning staff uh, based on a comment that I heard during public hearing. Uh, I know this, the, the area in question uh, for the proposed facility is in an SP. Uh, is is the proposed use consistent with that SP? We had, this plan wasn't actually referred to us. This bill wasn't referred to planning. We haven't done a full analysis of this because it didn't go to the planning commission. Um, I would have to check with the zoning administrator to see what this use is actually classified as and to see if that would be permitted in the SP. So we just haven't done that analysis yet. All right, that brings me back to Mr. Jameson. Uh, we obviously have, I mean, back to your point on the model of clarity uh, and the relatively few instances we have had to, to test that and refine it uh, in, in this particular city and county. Um, should we refer this to planning? I think we should determine what the facility is and what classification planning would find in terms of the SP. Uh, that, and I think just a, a report from the director alone would be sufficient to add that clarity before third reading. Okay, then I might encourage the sponsor to do that and, uh, and go from there. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Scott Davis. Uh, Mr. Jameson, um, just for some clarity, Okay, um, if this council or the sponsor, if we don't act upon this within 30 days, is there a moot point or if there's some sort of 30 day clause on That's this? That's correct. Thing? Another uh, curiosity about the Jackson law is that you have to have a public hearing before the council and then the third and final resolution has to be within 30 days of that public hearing. So uh, there's a limited amount of time within which to schedule the, the third reading. Um, there is no prohibition on resubmitting it if you don't meet the 30-day deadline. You just have okay. to have first and second Well, just so, just so I'm clear, you know, what um, Councilman O'Connell was a great suggestion, but we couldn't get it in front of planning before that. Could we, because the schedule doesn't allow? I think what he's agreed to is not going before full planning, but rather getting the director or staff to simply submit a letter of how they classify this under the SP. Okay. Well, one thing I do, okay, thank you for that clarification. Um, <clears throat> I encourage the council member to please continue your community meetings. Um, I encourage everyone to look at both sides, but also visit the, where the current location is. I mean, it's a tough decision. And just right now, we've heard from the community and got, and we want to make sure that please continue the dialogue. So I know this is difficult, but continue the dialogue and thank you for volunteering and helping people get out to see the site. And you know, and that is it, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Jim Shulman. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem, just real quick. Um, there were lots of questions uh, in Public Works, as the Chairman indicated. I would suggest that if people do have questions, maybe they can submit them to Mr. Jamison uh, to try to get them answered before the, the, uh, the next meeting. Um, I am not comfortable at all with this. I'm still not sure exactly what's going on, but uh, so I'm going to submit my questions as well. I'll follow the Councilman from uh, District 2. Um, I like the idea of having uh, his constituents take a look, but um, uh, there's a lot of no's out there and people are not comfortable and uh, people are no, then I'm voting no. Thank you. Councilmember Bidnick. Uh, yes, thank you. Usually when we uh, are on second reading and there is a strong opposition like what we saw today, if we approve it and send it to third reading it's because we have an expectation or we wanna give something a chance to happen. 
uh, as I was listening to Councilmember Hastings, I didn't understand what what is that that we are being asked to uh, to wait on. And so, if I could get some clarification from him on what is that he is planning on doing before third reading to uh, for us to be comfortable with voting for it, because uh, I mean. Clearly, they seem to be very much against it, and um, and so I just wanted to know what, what is that that you are planning on doing. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman uh, Hastings. Thank you, Councilman, for for your question. I am not in a place to where I feel comfortable with uh, any of this right now, uh, because I I I am here to represent the people that spoke today. Uh, we are referring, the reason that we're doing this is because this is a very new law that is coming before us. Number one, the land use is already set for us. There is, this is more of a legal term. Uh, thing that is going on. Uh, we have been in talks with the state of Tennessee and then also some of the guys here. Uh, there's a lot of things that we just don't know. Uh, and they need to... Uh, overall figure this out. I'm not in a place to where I can speak on that, but whatever, what I can say is I'm going to refer it to the planning guys, and that is a great suggestion, and we're going to give more opportunity for the community to actually see the product and what they are expecting, not a hypothetical situation, but the real thing, and make that decisions on that, and then after that, if the, the community says no on the part that we have to approve, because there's a part of this that we don't have to approve. But on the part that I have to approve, I will say no to that. Council Member Mina Johnson. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem. Uh, yes, I, I think it, there was uh, so many requests because typically uh, these this is not a zone change, so it unfortunately does not go to planning committee. So what I would like to request to the planning desk is between now and third reading, if you could give us uh, some analysis about under the current zoning, what is allowed and so forth. And also I would like to request uh, probably to the applicant uh, exact location, uh, type of uh, Operation they are uh, proposing, if they have rendering, picture, and also the traffic route, uh, you know, at the public hearing and currently uh, during the public hearing, it was mentioned a 30 traffic will be going from the location uh, via Briley Parkway. And I just want to have those truck routes so we can fully bet it, uh, the benefit and the deficit uh, when it comes to uh, planning committee, as well as uh, public uh, works committee. So I would like to request those uh, information to applicant. More information will be better for us to uh, properly uh, analyze uh, this bill. Thank, Thank you. you. Council Member Hurt. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem. Um, did we just do a rewind? Because this sounds like we just <laughs> experienced the same thing just minutes ago and also a couple of meetings ago. It's, it's pretty, it just sounds so familiar to me, but um, I, I, I don't understand how we bring all of the recycling facilities, the landfills and industrial facilities to this community, and none of them are revenue generating, especially for the community. The community doesn't benefit from it, and it just seems that it is a dumping ground. I lived in this community for 13 years, and I was there when there were arguments about the landfills and dumping grounds and trash and all of those things. There is no way, absolutely no way that I can stand in support of this. And um, 
I also think that we need to have some consciousness about the things that we're doing. Thank you. Councilmember Elrod. Yes, ma'am, and I apologize for belaboring the point, but in the Jackson law, there are eight criteria, and, and I guess, Mr. Jamison, if you'll, there's the eight criteria is the, I guess a couple of questions, and I'll kind of spat them off, and if you're able to answer them, I guess, all together. Um, who determines their criteria? Is it the Public Works Committee? Is it the council? Um, is it the applicant? And then there is a, there can be, the applicant can have, can file suit in the Chancery Court, and there's a brand, and it, the court looks at it de novo, brand new. So what, I guess, to completely, um, I guess, thoroughly vet this as a council according to the Jackson Law, what steps do we need to take so that we're in full compliance, you know, whether it's approval or disapproval? So the statute itself, the Jackson Law, lays out these criteria. This is under Section 68211704B as in boy. Number one, the type of waste to be disposed of. Two, the method of disposal to be used. Three, the projected impact on surrounding areas from noise and odor. Four, the projected impact on property values or surround, on surrounding areas. Five, the adequacy of existing roads and bridges to carry the projected increased traffic. Six, the economic impact on the county. Uh, city or both. Seven, the, compa sorry, the compatibility with existing development or zoning plans. And last, any other factor which may affect the public health, safety, or welfare. The de novo review ref refers to the Chancery Court would take this as if they started all over and would not consider what the council considered, but they would make the determination on their own. Do we have to make, as a council or either as a public works committee, do we need to discuss those criteria like one by one um, in total? Uh, how does that need to go or how does that go? It's just implicit within the council's consideration of this legislation. It doesn't have to be recited or recorded. And just to be clear, whether we uh, approve it or disapprove it, it would be Metro Legal that would be defending this in Chancery Court or it would? That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Pardue. Call for the question. Okay. Jesus. You can call for the question. All those in favor of the question, say aye. aye. Opposed? Okay, that means we are, it is time to vote. We have a motion to ap approve on the floor on second reading. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? No. vote. There's a no vote on second. That's okay. the rule. That's the rule. Machine vote. Madam Clerk, please open the machines. are voting on the motion to approve. This is second reading. We're voting on second reading on the motion to approve. Sorry, the, the question was called. There's no more discussion. This is just second reading. That's correct. So yeah, for the voting audience, this, this means we will continue the discussion on third reading. All right, has everyone voted? Madam Clerk, would you close the machine? 21 in favor, 12 against, three abstentions. Passes on second reading. We are now on to the consent agenda. The <laughs> It's progress. We're gonna, we're gonna get there before. Six. We're gonna get to consent agenda before midnight anyway. <laughs> So the following resolutions are on consent agenda. Let me know if any of these need to be taken off. RS 2018, 1319, 1320, 1335, 1336, 1337, RS 
Are there any of those that need to be pulled from consent agenda? Yes, which one? Sorry. Mr. Glover. Uh, I'm asking that we pull 1329 through 1333 uh, simply because I, I, I won't be able to support these. It, the information I got changed from what I thought it was yesterday. So 1329 through 1333 Correct. are pulled from consent agenda. Thank it, you. Any others? Okay, I will now read the captions. Okay, these bills are on consent agenda. RS 2018-1319 appropriates $551,051.45 in community development block grants for funds for sidewalk improvements in North Nashville. RS 2018-1320 authorizes the Metro Department of Housing Agency to enter into a pilot agreement and accepts payments in lieu of ad valorem taxes with respect to multifamily housing projects located at 1427 Lebanon Pike. RS 2018-1321, sponsors Shulman, Bircher, Bedney, and Elrod, declares surplus and approves the disposition of parcels of property in accordance with the Metro Code. RS 2018-1322, sponsors Pridemore, Shulman, Bircher, and others. Also authorizes the Director of Public Property to purchase flood-prone property located at 484 Canton Pass for Metro Water Services. RS 2018-1323, sponsors O'Connell, Bedney, and others. Approves an amendment to the parking agreement between Metro Traffic and Parking Commission and 511 Union Nashville LLC for the use of up to 100 parking spaces for a fee in the library parking garage. Resolution RS 2018-1324, sponsors Shulman and Vircher, authorizes the Metro Department of Law to compromise and settle the personal injury claim of John Bates against Metro in the amount of $20,000. RS 2018-1325, sponsors Shulman and Vircher, authorizes the Metro Department of Law to compromise and settle the personal injury claim of Paul H. Lacey against Metro in the amount of $17,500. $17, RS 2018-1326, sponsors Shulman and Vircher, authorizes the Metro Department of Law to compromise and settle the personal injury claim of Latanya Flanoy against Metro in the amount of $20,000. Just a second. That is, that's it is okay. Yeah. RS 2018-1327, sponsor Shulman and Vircher authorizes the Metro Department of Law to compromise and settle the personal injury claim of Terry White against Metro government in the amount of $100,000. Okay, we are skipping those. RS 2018-1334, sponsors Shulman and Vircher, approves a grant from Oasis Center Incorporated to the Davidson County Juvenile Court for implementation of the Wyman's Teen Outreach Project as part of probation services to decrease risky behaviors and increase life skills among youth. RS 2018-1335, sponsors Shulman, Vircher, and Roberts, approves an interlocal agreement between the Emergency Communications District for Nashville and the Metropolitan Government for services and reimbursements of costs pertaining to enhanced 9-11 services. RS 2018-1336, sponsor Shulman, Vircher, and Roberts, approves the Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grant from the United States Department of Justice to the Metro Police Department for technology upgrades, supplies for direct support to basic police in-service and specialized training. RS 2018-1337, sponsor Shulman, Vircher, and Roberts, approves a contract between Metro and Intergraph Corporation to provide ongoing support and maintenance for the integrated advanced records management system in pursuit records management system. RS 2018-1339 sponsors Roberts approves a clinical affiliation agreement between the Volunteer State Community College and the Metro Fire Department for the participation in clinical training of students enrolled in the emergency medical technician programs of the institution. RS 2018-1340 sponsors Shulman, Virtue, and Gilmore approves a grant from the Tennessee Department of Health and the Metro Board of Health to promote the proper use of all recommended vaccines and respond to vaccine preventable diseases in collaboration with the CDC and other partners. 
RS 2018-1341, sponsors Shulman, Vircher, and Gilmore, approves a grant from the Tennessee Department of Health to the Metro Board of Health to provide programs and direct patient care to meet the public health needs of Tennessee citizens. RS 2018-1342 approves a grant from the Tennessee Department of Health to the Metro Board of Health for the Healthy Start Home Visiting Program to identify and provide comprehensive services to improve outcomes for eligible families who reside in at-risk communities. RS 2018-1343 sponsors Shulman, Vircher, and Gilmore. Approves an amendment to a grant for the Tennessee Department of Health to the Metro Board of Health to ensure federal preparedness funds are directed to Tennessee Regional and Met Metropolitan Emergency Preparedness Programs to prepare for, respond to, and recover from public health threats. RS 2018-1344, sponsors Shulman, Vircher, and Gilmore. Approves an amendment to a grant from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency to the Metro Board of Health to fund an ongoing program to protect air quality to achieve established ambient air standards and protect human health. RS 2018-1345, sponsor Shulman, Vircher, Gilmore, and Allen, approves an amendment to a contract between the Metro Board of Health and Vanderbilt University School of Medicine to participate as a member site in the CDC Tuberculosis Trials Consortium Studies. RS 2018-1346, sponsor Gilmore, approves a contract between the Metro Board of Health and Columbia State Community College Health Sciences Division to provide clinical experience opportunities for students enrolled in its veterinary technology program. RS 2018-1347 sponsors Gilmore, approves a memorandum of agreement between the Metro Board of Health and Vanderbilt University Medical Center to provide clinical experience opportunities for its students enrolled in the Dietetic Externship Program. RS 2018-1348 sponsors Gilmore, approves a contract between the Metro Board of Health and the National Academy of Medicine to provide access to the Charisma Salus database system for patient tracking and prescription tracking. RS 2018-1349 sponsors Gilmore, approves a contract between between the Metro Board of Health and Middle Tennessee State University to provide clinical experience opportunities for its undergraduate and graduate nursing students. RS 2018-1350 sponsors Gilmore, approves a contract agreement between the Metro Board of Health and the Centers of Medicare and Medicaid Services to provide information about the full range of qualified health plan options and insurance affordability programs for which consumers are eligible. RS 2018-1351 sponsors Withers, authorizes the mayor to enter into an interlocal agreement pursuant to the Workforce Innovation an Opportunity Act is required by the State of Tennessee to establish a new local workforce development area. Spon uh, RS 2018-1352 sponsors Shulman and Vircher, approves a contract between Metro and Kronos Incorporated to provide time and attendance and advanced scheduling software hosting equipment and technical support. RS 2018-1352 53, sponsors Shulman, Virch, and Withers, approves an amendment to a grant from the Tennessee Department of Labor and Workforce Development to the Nashville Career Advancement Center to establish programs to prepare adult service recipients for employment. RS 2018 1354, sponsors Shulman, Virch, and Withers, approves an amendment to a grant from the Tennessee Department of Labor and Workforce Development to the Nashville Career Advancement Center to establish programs to prepare and carry out adult services to benefit service recipients. There are more. RS 2018 1355, sponsors Shulman, Shulman, Vircher, and Elrod approves a waste reduction grant from the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation and the Metro Public Works Department to purchase trucks for Nashville's curbside recycling expansion. RS 2018-1357 sponsors Van Rees and Shulman, recognizes Don Diener for 22 years of dedicated service to the Metro government. RS 2018-1358 sponsors Shulman, recognizes Bill Garrett Jr. for his 20 years of outstanding service to the Metropolitan Government. RS 2018-1359 sponsors Withers and Shulman, recognizes recognizes David Smith for his eight years of service as juvenile court clerk to Metropolitan Government. RS 2018-1360 sponsors Karen Johnson, Vircher, and Lee, recognizes Lakita R. Stribling as District Governor 2018-19 for Rotary District 6760. Resolution RS 2018-1361 sponsors Murphy, Mina Johnson, and others, recognizes and encourages the participation of women at all levels of government. Now we need committee reports. Council Member Shulman, can you give the budget and finance report, please? Let me. Sure can. There you go. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem. Budget and finance approved RS 2018 13 19 8 to 0. And then 2018 13 20 through 13 27 11 to 0 approval. RS 2018 13 34 through 13 37 approved 11 to 0. RS 2018 1340 through RS 2018 1345, those are all numerical, 11 to 0. RS 
and RS 2018 1352 through 1355, 11 to 0 approval. Thank you. Health Hospitals and Social Services, Council Member Pulley. Health Hospital and Social Services Committee recommended RS 2018 1340 through 1343 for approval, four in favor, zero against, and RS 1344 through 1355 in favor, zero against. Thank you. I think you only went through 1350. Um, public Works, Public Information, Human Relations, and Housing, Council Member Withers. Thank you, Madam President. The um, Personnel, Public Information, Human Relations, and Housing Committee uh, met this afternoon. We considered Resolution RS 2018 1320 and recommended approval 540 against. We also considered resolutions uh, RS 2018 1351 through 1354 and recommended approval four in favor, zero against. Thank you. Planning, zoning, historical, Council Member Bidney. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the committee. Uh, uh, discuss uh, 1321, 1322, 1323, and recommended approval 1140 against. Thank you. Public Safety, Beer, and Regulated Beverages, Council Member Roberts. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem. Public Safety, Beer, and Regulated Beverages voted 1335, 1336, and 1337, four in favor, zero against. We voted 1338, five in favor, zero against, and 1339, four in favor, zero against. Thank you. Public Works, Council Member Elrod. Thank you, Madam President. Public Works recommended approval of resolutions 1322, 23, and 1355, 10 in favor, zero against. Thank you. Rules confirmation and public relations, Council Member Haywood. Resolution 2018 Can you use your mic? Oh, awesome. I turned it on for you. I think I'm taking a nap here. I apologize. I'm missing. <laughs> uh, yes, Resolution 2018 1357, 1358-1359, 1360-1361. We reviewed them all and we voted eight for and zero against and I moved for approval. And with that said, and all committee- I'm gonna have to inter interrupt because I, okay. I skipped ad hoc affordable and then I'll come oh. back to you to move the consent okay. agenda. Council member Mendez. The ad, the ad hoc affordable housing committee met on resolution 1320 and voted in favor six zero and none against. Thank you. Council member Haywood. Okay, we voted 8-4 and 0 against. With that, I move approval. Of the consent agenda. Okay, and uh, with that said, all committee reports are in, and I would move to approve all resolutions on the consent agenda. Thank you. Been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Consent agenda is passed. Now we'll move to bills that were not on consent, resolutions that were not on consent. Uh, we'll begin with... RS 2018-1308, Council Member Scott Davis. Let me find you. Thank you, Madam President. Committee reports, please. Com committee reports. I'm so sorry. I was so excited about all the resolutions that I read. Okay. <laughs> RS 2018-1308, uh, sponsored by Scott Davis, requests the Davidson County yeah. Sheriff, Nashville Fire Department Chief, and the Director of Public Property Administration to declare properties at 500 and 506 Second Avenue North to be surplus. Council Member Scott Davis. Um, thank you, Madam President. Committee reports, please. Okay. Council Member Shulman. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem. Uh, budget deferred to the first meeting in October, 7-4, you're against. Council Member Roberts. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem. Public Safety Beer and Regulated Beverages voted to track with budget and voted to to the first meeting in September 540 again. Okay. Council Member Scott Davis. I'd like to um, defer to the first meeting in October with a very, very brief explanation. Okay. You recognize? We're giving time to help work on this. Hopefully, we can come up with some solutions to help with some of the funding shortfalls. And let's continue working on the budget. Thank you. Thank you. 
been moved uh, to defer to the first meeting in October. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Bill is deferred. Next is RS 2018-1314, sponsors Rosenberg, Blaylock, and Henderson, provides amendments to the charter of the Metro Government of Nashville and Davidson County and setting forth a brief description of each amendment to be placed upon the ballot. Council Member Rosenberg. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, this is the charter amendment resolution. Uh, we started working on these in April of 2017, 16 months ago. We, we will need committee reports. Sorry, committee report, please. Council Member Blaylock. Thank you. The charter revision approved this um, RS 2018-13-14, um, 640 against. With some amendments, maybe. With all, and all the amendments the same, but Thank you. 640 again. Councilmember Rosenberg. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we're 16 months into this. It's been discussed at five charter revision committee meetings, three charter review commission meetings, and is being brought to the floor for the fifth time tonight. Uh, if I could, Mr. Jamison, can you explain how the process works, please? There are six, <clears throat> there are six proposed charter amendments under one resolution. Each one of those will be considered and has to individually be approved by this body by 27 votes, two-thirds. Then of those that meet that threshold, they will be uh, submitted for passage in the final resolution, which also has to be approved by 27 votes. And does that re require machine votes for each of those then? Uh, yeah, it's pretty good. Thank you. Councilmember Rosenberg. Thank you. Um, so starting with Charter Amendment A, uh, this amendment would revise the line of succession for the office of mayor by calling for a council election of a temporary mayor in the absence of the vice mayor and further prohibit that temporary mayor from seeking election in the next election for mayor or vice mayor. So under the current charter provision, in the event that both the mayor and vice mayor become unable or unwilling to serve, the position of mayor would remain vacant until a special election is held. So if the mayor and vice mayor run off together, we have nobody to sign legislation, nobody to lead departments, and nobody to handle or hit by a bus per Councilman Elrod. Or a scooter. Yes. <laughs> and, and nobody to handle other mayoral duties. Uh, under this am amendment, only in the event that both the mayor and vice mayor become unable or unwilling to serve as mayor, the Metro Council would uh, elect a qualified resident to serve as a temporary placeholder until a special election is held. In an effort to ensure our body would not be making a political decision for the purpose of giving someone a head start on the special election for mayor, that individual would not be permitted to run in the subsequent election. They would be a true placeholder. Um, did we have an amendment to this amendment? Um, yes. Uh, which I believe was just a housekeeping amendment. So I'd like to, I guess, move the amendment and the amendment to the amendment. You Please. move the amendment to the amendment first. All it does is change a section number where it was meant in, instead of saying 15.01, it, it should say 5.02. And that this was a late filed. Yes. So I'd like to move to suspend rule, which? Uh, rule 11 on the. Yes, that one to uh, to introduce this housekeeping amendment, please. Okay. Do we do we need to hear from is the rules committee on that? No. You'd say is there an objection? To is there an the objection to suspending the rules? Please no. No. Hearing none. Great. Thank you. I'd like to move the amendment to Amendment A, please. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor of the amendment to and Amendment then A? Then you'd go to rules. If they oh wait. Considered. Then you'd go to rules. And now I go to rules. Okay. Any opposed to that amendment? And now I would go to rules. Go to rules, make sure they considered it. Did the rules committee consider this late filed amendment to the amendment? Oh yes, we considered it and we voted eight to nothing that it, we were in favor of okay. it. Thank you. I should have done that now before have, we voted. Now you have the amendment to the amendment. Okay. Back to you, Councilmember Rosenberg. Um, I'd like to renew the motion uh, on amendment to the amendment. As Please. amended. As amended. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> He's amending his charter amendment, yes. just a housekeeping okay. amendment. Housekeeping amendment to a charter amendment A. Okay, now that we've had the report, we will vote on the amendment to the amendment. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Very good. Councilmember Rosenberg. Um, I move amendment A as amended. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Amendment A is I think you're going to need two-thirds. 
Oh, we need a two-thirds, so. You're going to need a roll call. You want a machine vote? You need a machine vote. Okay, Madam Clerk. Unless you can count. Councilmember Freddie O'Connell for a point of information. Just, just to make clear for everyone, it, approval of these with 27 votes ensures that they are on the next ballot for consideration by uh, the voters of Nashville. Is that correct? That is correct. Assuming we pass the final resolution by 27 votes once we so get to the end. So each amendment itself needs 27, and then the final, the resolution also needs those 27 votes. That is correct. Okay, and so we you. will have a machine vote every time. Madam Clerk, will you open the machine? On Amendment A, as amended. Is there, pardon me, question? Mr. Swope. When you say it's on the next ballot, is that on the special election ballot for vice mayor or on the November 2nd ballot? Such a good question. November 2nd. We have, we have to have 80 days ahead of time, so okay, it's, good, it's a November ballot. Nobody's going to show up for the Thank next Thank you election. for clarifying that. <laughs> okay. The machine is open. There's we are voting on... Show up to vote. It's county. I'll be we are voting on so. Amendment A as amended, and we do need 27 votes, so... Right. Madam Clerk, uh, has everyone voted? Madam Clerk, can you close the machine? That'll work. Okay, Council Member Rosenberg. Thank you, Madam President, and good morning. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Charter Amendment B. Uh, this amendment would require, uh, this is the ballot language, would require a special election for mayor when more than 12 months remain in the unexpired term, vice mayor more than 24 months remain in the unexpired term, district council member when more than six months remain in the unexpired term, and clarify that no special election for council member at large be held. So under the current charter provision, in the event of a vacancy in the office of mayor or district council member, with more than 12 months left in the term, a special election is held. And in the event of a vacancy in the office of vice mayor or council member at large, no special election is held. Under this amendment, there would be no change in how we handle special elections for mayor. The most substantial change is that in the event of a vacancy in the office of district council member, with more than six months left in the term instead of 12 months, a special election would be held. Uh, there are several reasons for this. One is that while we have a succession plan for mayor, there is no succession plan for district council member. The other is that an entire community can be left with no representative for a full year. It's true that a council member at large is assigned to oversee a district, and they do so to the best of their considerable abilities, but there are distinct differences. Number one, the at-large could be from the other side of the county and not have a full understanding of the ins and outs of the district when it comes to zoning and other hyper-local issues. Number two, our at-larges run to be at-larges, not district council members, which is a significantly different job and they presumably did so for a reason. And number three, the district would be left without anybody to vote their interests on countywide matters. The at-large remains responsible for voting based on the interests of the entire county leaving the district without a voice. This amendment would guarantee that no district is left without a voice for such a long period of time. I would note that an amendment was suggested by the Charter Commission to change six months in this amendment to eight months. There's an amendment that's available for anybody that wishes to move that amendment. I'm not taking a position on this distinction and leave it to the will of the body to amend if you see fit to do so. Uh, so I will move uh, Amendment B, please. B. That's what I said. No, I got a lot more. <laughs> this was Amendment B, is that correct? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay, Madam Council President. Member Mina Johnson. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, just a question to the uh, sponsor of the bill. Uh, just technicality, it says uh, remaining uh, vacancy, uh, 12 months, 24 months, and 6 months. So... If more than six months, because generally when we have a special election, it takes five weeks. So even six months maybe remain by the time election is over. So that sub term of the service will be less than six months. It's possibly. 
depending on that. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, yes, Councilor, that's exactly the case, and that is the reason the Charter Commission was recommending that it be changed to eight months to consider the fact that there would be a lag time there, and it would allow them to have more. Uh, with a six-month period, you, could, you would have somebody just covering four months. By making it eight months, they would then have six months to right. serve. Thank you. So have you uh, introduced the amendment uh, to the amendment B? Uh, I, I did not catch if you in introduced amendment to amendment B to change to eight months. The council member noted that that amendment is out there and can be offered oh. by someone else, but he has not done that. If I may, uh, I would like to introduce amend B, amendment to amendment B to increase increase uh, the time to eight months. To eight months, thank you. So there are several members in the queue. Do they wish to speak on the amendment? Council Member Karen Johnson, do you wish to speak on the yes, amendment? Yes, I do. Okay, you're recognized. Okay. One of the things I do want you all to think about is um, when this falls um, at the time of a regularly scheduled election. So if you're saying eight months and someone um, is not fulfilling the very end of their term, and you can pull papers to run in February. You're gonna hold a special election and you're gonna elect somebody for essentially three months and then the period for qualifying or pulling the qualifying papers opens up the gate this person's just been there three months, and then all of a sudden, all these people are running for a term-limited seat. <laughs> I just, I don't think this has been thought through totally to factor in all of the issues that would come with that. Yes, I'm an exception. I'm gonna call out the elephant in the room because my term ends next year. My district did not want a special election for somebody to be there three months because people can pull papers to run for this seat in February. And I mean, then that term will expire. Well, that, that the qualifying period for them to run is what, May? I'll, I'll ask Mr. Jameson to comment on the, on the timing of when people would, would be able to pull papers. The, the timing is from Oops. the expiration of the term, not the next general election. It's the, the time you're measuring is from the vacancy until the expiration of the term otherwise. And can you explain That's, what the what the election the commission would, would do with fall? regard to setting the timing of when that election I would happen? You, Pardon me. <laughs> what? What, can you explain how the election commission would set the timing of when that special election would happen? When a vacancy occurs, um, then what is the next step that the, that the election commission is required to to do? There, there's a state timing under state law under the amount of time they have to set the special election, and I don't, I don't recall the the. 75 to 80 days. 75 to 80 days, sounds right. Okay, so, so, the, the so in the scenario where you're in your last year and the qualifying period, your term limited, and the qualifying period opens up for people to run in February, how would that work? If, if you, you're in your last year of, of an expired term and you resign in January, for example? Is that what you're talking about? Like now. If, if, you, if you resign, say I resign in September, October, November, December, January, that's three to four months. Right. The period to run for that term limited seat opens up in February. No, if this, if this were adopted, then you're gonna have more than six months left remaining in your term, so then a special election is opened up. The okay, state so it that. would apply to someone who is term limited where the election period opens up for people to run for the seat in February. 
it's it's not tied to the February date. It's tied to to the departure date of the council member. And if more than six months remained in the term otherwise, then the election commission sets a special election within 75 to 80 days. Well, all I'm saying is, I hope the scenario doesn't result in somebody being elected at the end of somebody's term and then all of a sudden you've got people running for a seat that you just, it's, it, it just won't work. <laughs> your, your time is up, Council Member. Thank okay. you for finishing that sentence. Thank um, you. Council Member Swope. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Councilor, I think all due respect to uh, Council Lady Johnson, let me see if I can clarify what you're just saying because you're going down the right path on this one. All due respect to the committee, thank you for the hard work. This is an almost impossible thing to fix and you've done a great job so far, but I question anything less than one year term uh, or, one, or 12 months remaining because here's what will happen in the case of Council Lady Johnson. If this passes November 2nd, that leaves right at eight months before August elections in 2019, which would trigger a special election to be held within 75 to 85 days by the Election Commission, which would put that election in February of 2019. So at the same time you've got people pulling papers for Council Lady Johnson's seat, you've got a special election being held for somebody to hold that office from February till August. So I, I all due respect to the work being done by the committee, I think six months is way too short. I think eight months isn't quite long enough. And while there's still problems with one year, I do believe it's the job of the councils at large to fill in that position for one year should that happen. So I don't know that we want to go down this rabbit hole just yet. Thank you. Thank you. So we are, I don't see, whoops. I didn't see anyone in the queue, but now I do. Council Member Mina Johnson. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem. I think uh, Council Member Swap attached uh, a very interesting scenario. But uh, if we adopt uh, this charter amendment, and if we, this measure was set on November 6 ballot, and if uh, we, uh, you know, as a border pass this, it, it does not mean it's going to enact right away, does it? We can say it should start, uh, you know, certain day. Can it be done? What the measure passed? Do we have to adapt immediately? Yeah, the measure goes into effect upon adoption by the public. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Councilmember Rosenberg. Thank you, Madam President. So under the scenario Councilman Swope mentioned, the special election would be in January, which is 75 to 80 days from the beginning of November. And then that district would have representation from January all the way until the next council member is seated in September. Otherwise, if you look at, if you look at the scenario of Council Lady Johnson, there is a, an at-large who is going to be required for seven months, for 12 months, but for an extra seven or eight months, who does not live in Southeast Nashville, responsible for taking care of all the needs of that district, responsible for understanding all the zoning matters, for understanding the ins and outs of the district, and for somehow voting the interests of the county and of that district in countywide matters. And at the same time, they're running for re-election. So, which I, Think, which is a lot to ask, and I think it's unfair to any district to be unrepresented for an entire year. Imagine your district, a district council member, imagine all the work you did, do, and imagine nobody there to do it, nobody to mind the store in the way you can, or doing so while splitting duties and running for re-election at the same time. I think that, that's, that it's a an important thing for us, for our districts to be represented. And, and eight months, you know, I agree. You know, if you feel six months is too short, then I think placing this amendment uh, that Council Lady, Johnson, uh, Council Lady Mina Johnson has offered is a wise step. Thank you. Thank Council you. Member Purdue. Is there a motion on the floor? There is a, mo well, is it, there's a, 
Yes, there are two. There's the, the motion for the amendment and there's the eight month amendment is the motion that we're, that we're currently considering and discussing. Correct. Well, y'all call me at home and let me know how it comes out. <laughs> Were you calling the question? Did he call a question? I didn't hear it. <laughs> I can't now. No. no, I don't talk too much to call a question. Okay. I learned that already. There you go. So we have several other members in the queue. Let's discuss it. Council Member Brett Withers. Thank you. Um, I just, with all due respect, I'm just not in, in support of that particular component. I, Personally, I believe that that is the role of at-large. I think that at-larges understand when they run as at-large that they need, may need to fill in for a while, um, for an extensive while for a, a district council member should there be a vacancy. Um, we've had a, an unusual and probably historic amount of turnover in this council from folks rolling off of district uh, to other roles. District one is now on, you know, I'm, I'm running out of fingers of how many council members we've had in that district. Um, and when we just look at the um, the expense, frankly, that, that could happen, uh, what what I personally am, am committed to for my district, I can't speak for anyone else, but I'm com I ran for district six, I'm staying in district six. I, I have no other plans to pursue other things other than district six. That's just me, um, but I, I, I'm just not comfortable with that uh, at this time for this particular amendment. I appreciate the work on it, but I'm not ready to support this particular charter amendment. Thank you. Okay, we are discussing the eight-month amendment right now. I'm not comfortable even with eight, okay. the eight-month version. Thank you for that. So, thank you. so I have several other people in the queue. Count, Council Member Sledge, do you want to speak on the eight-month? You're recognized. Call the question. Oh. <laughs> okay, the question's been called. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, we are voting on the eight-month amendment to the um, to the general yeah amendment B. Uh, so all those and it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor of the eight-month amendment? Any, well, we, we, do we have to do the amendments by voice vote? No, I it, mean you can do the amendments. We by can voice do this by voice vote. Okay. Sure. So all those in favor? We said aye. All those opposed? No. I think. This is on the eight-month amendment. That's what we're voting on. I think I need a voice vote. I have no idea what that. Yeah. Can we amend the amendment? That's what you're doing, uh, yeah. That would be a very late filed amendment which would require a suspension of the rules. And we've already we've already called the question and we're voting on it, so. But it was an unfair or unclear result, so you're gonna wanna board. It's an unclear result, so we need to. Um, you can to Madam Clerk, can you reset the machine for the amendment to amendment B? You do. Because I can't tell what just happened. We had a lots of eyes and a lots of nose. Okay, okay. We could raise hands or we could just. Yes, sir. Does the, uh, what is the vote threshold on the amendment to the amendment, 21 or 27? The majority. The majority. Majority of those, majority of those voting. Majority. Okay, thank you. Good question. So we are voting on the amendment to amendment B that would change the six month period to an eight month period. That is what we are voting on right now. Machines Correct. are open. Please vote speedily. All right, and we all voted. Good, Madam Clerk, can you close the machines? Twenty-four in favor and ten against, two abstentions. So the eight-month amendment passes. We are now Councilmember Rosenberg. You're recognized. Give me just a minute. Yeah, I, yes, sir. I, Thank you, Madam President. Um, with respect to Councilman Withers' point, I would note that a district council race uh, costs under $50,000 typically, and that sometimes vacancies are, un are created in an unplanned manner. Um, and with that, I... I uh, would uh, renew my, uh, I'll leave it open for discussion. Okay. Thank we, you. There are a number of people in the queue. I don't know if you're left over, so I'll just run through who's next. Uh, Council Member Swope, do you wish to speak again? You don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's late. I can't help myself. Go Usually I'm up on the phone right about now. Go for it. Council, this is a question for you. Can I make an amendment to this amendment B from yeah. the floor? Suspend the rules and have to have unanimous consent. 
then I'm going to ask to suspend the rules. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> We just triggered two more elections. <laughs> I'm tired of yeah. Councilmember Pradmore. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem. You know, uh, all joking aside, this is a making amendments to the, to our charter is serious business, mm -hmm. and I would seriously, uh, all right, I'm going to make the motion that we defer until if it's if it's not going to interfere with the next election. I'd like to make a motion that it, that we uh, defer to the next meeting. Council, uh, Mr. Jamison, can you tell us if we have, you, you we have wait that, for a deferral? You have that breathing room. You have one, one meeting, minute. so you have to have this submitted and it's certified as adopted by council. You have to have that to the clerk and she has to get that to the election commission 75 days before the election. And she'll have two days to do that if you defer this until the 21st. Well, I think there's a lot of us with some gray matter in our brain that's uh, not developing, functioning very well, so I just, Considering the circumstances, I'd like to uh, renew my motion. So we have a motion for deferral. I would like just some clarification. If we defer this piece, do we defer the entire He's resolution? The, whole thing. Uh, the entire resolution. Whole shoot and match. Okay. Yes. That's what you're mo moving yes. to defer. Yes. Pro tem. Okay. We have a motion for deferral. On the floor, there are lots of people in the queue for discussion. We are now discussing the motion for deferral. I will go through the list. Councilmember Purdue. Call for the question. You're calling the question on the motion to defer. That's what's on the table. A motion to defer takes two thirds. Take a, you can do a voice vote, but it takes two thirds. I can, I can revoke that. The motion. <laughs> okay. For the, the motion for previous question takes two thirds. Okay, the motion for previous question on. No. Amendment B. I'm withdrawing my motion there. I'm just asking that in respect of these people sitting in the back that's been sitting here since 5 and 5.30 yesterday afternoon, that we do defer this for next meeting or meeting after next or some other time so these folks can get stopped by the Cracker Barrel on the way home and have breakfast. I'm sure they'll appreciate that. Waffle House. Uh, now, Cracker Barrel will be open by the time you get there. <laughs> okay, remind me where we are. So now we have a motion to defer. Okay, we have a motion to defer, uh, but we are still discussing it. So next is Councilmember Pridemore. You've already spoken, correct? Uh, Councilmember Rosenberg, you're back up. Thank you, Madam President. Um, this is not the first time we've done this. We've this has gone through eight committee meetings already. Um, we only have one more shot at this. My concern is that if we take this to the next meeting, that a parliamentary move that has been used in the past could be used to kill it um, at the next meeting. So I know it's late, but we're all grown-ups who, who signed up to, to get the people's business done, and I'd like to do that, please. And I'd urge you to vote against the Motion to defer. Thank you. Councilmember Glover, you speaking on the motion to defer. So, Mr. Jamison, just very quickly, it, it, let me make sure I understand. It takes 27 votes. So if we if we don't like this, we don't have to vote for the, because we're going to take each one of these individually, correct? Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Councilmember Karen Johnson. Whoop. I was just trying to understand what was the deferral on the bill as amended with Mina's amendment on it. I don't know. I, did, I was just trying to. <laughs> the whole resolution. The whole resolution. As amended. We didn't get that far. It, we would be deferring before we finished, oh, okay. completed that business. Okay, thank you. We are stopping mid-tracks. So there's no one else. Oh, Council Member Elrod. Just quickly, uh, Mr. Jameson, what is the difference in what this would be changing in the charter? Um, it was specifically Amendment B now that, or now that it is amended. That way we know what we will be voting on. So okay, probably best to tell you currently what's in the charter is if there's a vacancy that lasts for more than a year for the mayor, for the district council member, you have to have a special election for vice mayor and at large, that just remains vacant until the next general election. We are mo voting on the motion to defer. This question was not directly related. 
it seemed relevant to answer that question. The, very briefly, the essential change would be you'd now tweak that to say you would have a special election if the mayor was out for 12 months, if the vice mayor was out 24 months, and the district council member was out uh, six months. Okay. Other questions eight, on eight the months, motion? Eight months. Excuse me. Sorry. Motion to defer. So we are on the motion to defer. Councilman Rosenberg, do you have anything else to say before we vote on the motion to defer? All those in favor of a deferral, please raise your hand, but say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Machine vote. We love machine votes. Okay, we are voting on the motion to defer the charter resolution and then take it up again in one meeting. All those in favor to defer, vote yes. If you want to keep going, vote no. So yes is defer, no is keep, keep discussing it tonight. <laughs> Has everyone voted? Yes, ma'am. Clerk, please close the machines. Twenty-two in favor, fourteen against. So that is a majority. We are deferring one meeting. All right, we are continuing on resolutions that were taken off consent. I believe we are to RS 2018-1328, sponsor Shulman, Vercher, and Sledge. This issues general obligation bonds of the Metro government in an aggregate principal amount of not to exceed $50 million. Council Member Shulman. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem. Let me make sure I find it. Um, um, uh, so the committee report, the budget committee um, voted to defer to the first meeting in September and re-refer to budget and finance. It was 11 four, zero against, and that's what I would move to do. Okay, uh, we'll need a couple other committee reports. Council Member Swope. Codes, fairs, farmers, market voted to defer to the first meeting in September, five, four, zero against. Thank you, Council Member Hurt. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Conventions, tourism, and public entertainment facilities also voted five in favor of deferral until the first meeting in September and zero against. Council Member Schilling. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem. I would move to defer to the uh, first meeting in September and re-refer back to budget and finance. And um, are there any other committees that would like to have it re-referred? Any other committees that wanted to re-refer? So we're not re-referring to codes or to it are, tourism. It, it would uh, automatically. Madam Pro Tem, I think it automatically just does that. Okay, yeah. automatically we refers to all those. Okay, so we're voting on a motion to defer to the first meeting in September. That's all those in favor of deferral? Aye. Any opposed? Great, yay for a voice mic. Next, we are on RS 2018-1329, sponsors Shulman and Vercher. This appropriates $200,000 from the juvenile court to various nonprofit organizations selected to receive community partnership fund grants. Uh, Council Member Shulman. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem. Need a committee report? Committee report is budget and finance. We move to approve this 1140 against, and I would move for approval. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Glover, do you wish to speak on this one? Yes, just okay. very briefly. I, and I know it's late and we're tired. Um, I could not get my analysis open yesterday. For some reason, I had it in my mind this was uh, federal grants, and it's not. It's local. We didn't honor the COLA. We, uh, in fact, they've sent out a thing asking departments to save uh, in the police department 1.9 million. So I, I just want to make sure as I go on, and I'm not going to talk on the others, but I'm, I'm a, a no on 29 through 33. Thank you. Duly noted. Thank you. Um, Council Member Freeman. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair. Um, Mr. Jamison, <clears throat> I had some problems with this as well, so I'm glad you uh, pulled these. These were in the, well, this, we, this was in the budget that we just went through, correct? That's correct. If we vote these down, do we have to, do we have to honor these or can we have to go back and change that budget? 
we don't have to change the budget and we don't have to honor these, but these were budgeted for purposes of making these allocations. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Seeing no one else in the queue, Council Member Shulman. Uh, thank you, Madam Pro Tem. I do have one question, make sure I got this with Mr. Jamison. Um, do we know if these, um, have these grants been, will they actually have been designated at the time? That we know I don't that? know, I would have to defer to finance. Okay. Uh, I wonder if Mr. Mr. Cooper can just answer that. Uh, these, were, these were four pots of money in the budget to be competitively um, awarded. They've gone through the competitive process and these are the nonprofit organizations that were selected. Right. So, the, so the budget just had the four lump sums and this is appropriating it from those accounts to the nonprofits. Madam Pro Tem, I'm just, uh, one more question. So they've actually been designated. We actually know who the entities are that will receive them. Correct, yes, okay. they're all identified. Then uh, Madam Pro Tem, I would um, again I renew my motion okay. to, um, to approve. I have a few more people in the, in the queue. Uh, Council Member Swope. Thank you. It's five tranches of money, correct, not four? For a total of a million dollars? And do we know who's receiving this? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is just community partnership fund grants. I the Council analysis. Member, it, it, um, it is listed in the analysis for each of the um, pots of money, um, the, the 200,000 that went uh, to juvenile court, there was 200,000 to the Office of Family Safety, uh, 200,000 to Nashville Public Thank Library, to the Public Health Department, to the Social Services Department, and then under each of those departments, the awards and the organizations are listed in the analysis. And it's, in this particular instance, it would be the juvenile court that awards that $200,000. Um, sorry, I don't know okay. my numbers, I'm forgetting my numbers. All right, thanks. The, oh yeah. Um, Seeing no other, People in the queue, Council Member Schumann. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem. I would renew my motion. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Ayes have it. Next is RS 2018 1330, sponsors Schulman Vercher. Appropriates 200000 from the Office of Family Safety to various nonprofit organizations selected to receive community partnership fund grants. Councilmember Shulman. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem. Uh, the Budget and Finance Committee approved this 11 4 0 against. I would move for approval. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Then we could make a point of order. I still think the ayes have it. Yeah. Next is RS 2018 1332. Sponsor Shulman Vercher appropriates 200000 from the Metro Public Health Department to various nonprofit organizations selected to receive community partnership fund grants. Councilmember Shulman. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem. Uh, budget and Finance approved this one 11 4 0 against. Move for approval. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Just for the fun of it, let's have a voice vote. I don't, I'm sorry, can we have a machine vote just to? Yeah, you need a. On all of them, I would say let's do the machine vote and if it tells us that it was not as we thought we heard, then can we do them out of order? Sure, you, okay. 38, okay. Let's start with 1230, 1332 is what we are on. 1331. We are voting on Metro Health Department grant. You were, okay. Uh, Madam Pro Tem, we are actually on 1331. Pardon me, I scratched it out too quickly. We are on 1331, which is the Nashville Public Library. Is that correct? Correct. We are on 13, uh, 2018, 1331, and we are, I've asked for a motion to approve. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. And we are gonna have a machine vote. All those in favor, vote accordingly. Has everyone voted? <laughs> We're waiting. Oh, and you need to record it. Okay, we'll go back. Okay, Madam Clerk, can you close the machines? 26 in favor, seven against, two abstentions. Okay, um, there are several people in the queue and for the clerk's benefit because she needs to know who the no votes are, we will, we will back up. 
and record the votes on 2028 and no, 29. Those are vote 29. They have already passed. The um, the clerk needs to note to record the no votes. I will check with council. Rule 38 requires if there's an abstention or no vote on a resolution, you have a roll call. I, my apologies, as I was talking to another council member at the time, I don't know if anybody abstained or voted no on 29, 30, or There 31. were no votes. Okay, then I would have. Okay. So, operator error, we will, we will go back. There were not abstentions, there were no votes. Correct. That is correct. Or no votes or only or no abstentions. Votes. I'm going to ask Mr. Jamison to say that one more time. Right. Rule 38 says you have a roll call vote if there is any abstention or negative vote on a resolution or on an ordinance on second or third reading. We went through two without the with the on votes vote, and I apologize. These are resolutions. One more time, Mr. Jamison. Rule 38 requires a roll call vote for three reasons. Number two is if there is any abstention or negative vote on a resolution or an ordinance on second or third reading. Okay, is everyone clear on that? I apologize for the right. confusion. So we are backing up to record the votes of 1328. I would just ask that you do the same thing you did before. 1329. So, Madam Pro Tem, yes, uh, just to clarify and make sure we got this right, do we need to, uh, and this is to Mr. Jamison, do we need to rescind our actions on 1329 and 1330? No, the vote's not it? recognized okay. under the rules. You'll just go to a roll call vote on 1329, 1330, if there was an abstention. All right. Okay. So, um, so we're clear. Madam Pro Tem, if it's okay, we will go back to um, RS 2018 1329. 29. Okay. And we will okay. just simply redo it. So is everyone clear on that? We are back on 1329. Because there were no votes, we require a voice vote. I have several people in the queue. I will recognize them before we vote. Council Member Angie Henderson. Yes. I wasn't wanting to be acknowledged. I apologize. I thought you were asking. OK. Council Member Gilmore. Thank you, Speaker Pro Tem. I am trying to understand the process because we're on 1331, why are we going two back? The reason we are going two back is because there was a no vote on the resolution and that requires a machine vote. And we did not request that machine vote and so we are going back to get that machine vote right now. Okay, but had we gotten the original vote, we would not have to have gone when, back. When there was a no vote on voice vote, should I should have said we need a machine vote. Got you. And so okay. I'm belatedly saying it, and we are belatedly doing okay, it. Okay, that's fine. I'm just trying to understand the process. No, I think that's on. important. Okay, thank you. That's okay. Everybody everybody clear. It is late, and this is confusing. So we are on 1329. Council Member Schumann. Move for approval. Move approval. We are going to have a machine vote. We hope. as soon as the machine is ready. All right. Okay. Has everyone voted? Has everyone voted? Has everyone voted? Okay, good to know. Everyone who's going to vote. All of, um, Madam Clerk, please close the machine. 29 in favor, 5 against. Okay. Bill passes. But now we are on RS 30, uh, 2018, 1330. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem. Um, again, budget and finance approved this one 11 4 0 against. Move for approval. Thank you. We are going to have a roll call vote. Uh, Councilmember Roberts, do you wish to speak on this? Is, can Mr. Jamison clarify where this money is appropriated if we do not approve it? If we, if we don't approve it, it stays within the, the designated the Office of Family Safety. 
Any other questions? Seeing none, we are on a voice vote on 1330. Madam Clerk, would you open the machine? Has everyone voted? Okay, Madam Clerk. 28 in favor, five against. Bill passes. Okay, now we're back on track. 1331, we did correctly with a machine vote. So now we're on 13, 2018, 1332. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem. Um, on this one, uh, budget and finance review to approve this one 11 4 0 against. I would move for approval. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Oh, I'm sorry. Back to 2018 1332. Sponsor Shulman Vircher appropriates $200,000 from the Metro Public Health Department to various nonprofit organizations selected to receive community partnership fund grants. Mr. Shulman. Okay. Uh, again, budget approve this one 11 4 0 against. Move for approval. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? No. To be machine vote? On the board. Okay, Madam Clerk, please close the machines. 27 in favor, six against. Motion, bill passes. Next is RS 2018 1333. Sponsor Shulman and Vircher appropriates $200,000 from the Metro Social Services to various nonprofit organizations selected to receive community partnership fund grants. Councilmember Shulman. Yeah, thank you, Madam Pro Tem. Budget approved this one 11 4 0 against. I would move for approval and just go ahead and call for the roll call vote. <laughs> okay. It's been moved and seconded. We'll just have a roll call vote. Mm. We're good. Has everyone voted? <laughs> Maybe so. All right. Madam Clerk, please close the machines. 26 in favor, 7 against. Resolution passes. Hallelujah. Now we are on RS 2018 1338, sponsors Shulman, Vircher, Roberts, and Withers. This approves a contract between Metro and N4 Incorporated to provide maintenance and support of workforce time and attendance software for the Metro Police Department. Council Member Shulman. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem. Uh, budget and Finance approved this one 11 4 0 against. I need other committee reports. Thank you, Mr. Withers. Thank you, um, Madam President. The Personnel, Public Information, Human Relations, and Housing Committee met this afternoon. Uh, our committee recommended a deferral for one meeting, uh, four in favor of a deferral, zero against. Thank you. Public Safety, Beer, and Regulated Beverages, Councilmember Roberts. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem. Public Safety, Beer, and Regulated Beverages voted five in favor, zero against. Thank you. Um, we have some discussion. Councilmember Schumann. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem. So um, obviously there's a um, move to defer on this one. Um, so um, I think it's an automatic deferral. Rule 24. Rule 24, automatic deferral. I guess I was going to explain why, but if, if would you right. like to explain why? If, if that would be okay, I just know that our whole committee uh, is looking at budgetary uh, considerations and efficiency, and so our committee just wanted to have a little bit more information from IT and per perhaps from the department uh, about why this particular uh, software is needed, and if uh, at the conclusion of this contract if there might be opportunities to consolidate this into another existing software system. That's what our committee just wanted that more information about efficiency op uh, options going forward. Thank you. Thank you. And then I renew my motion to defer. It's an automatic deferral. Okay, automatic deferral. Don't even vote. 
Next, we are on RS 2018-1356. Sponsors Glover expresses the intention of the Metro Council to suspend action on any agreement related to any lease and redevelopment of the Nashville Fairgrounds until all necessary procedures have been completed. Council Member Glover. Too many microphones, just a second. Councilman Glover. Okay, thank you, thank you, Chair. We're all tired. I mean, we, we've talked about this in committee. We've all, we've discussed it. There's really nothing more to, to do. Committee report. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, committee report. Sorry okay. about that. Thank you. Councilman Schulman. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem. Uh, budget uh, disapproved this for four and five against. Thank you. Codes, uh, Councilmember Swope. Codes, Fairs Farmers Market passed this for four, zero, or one against. Planning, Zoning, Historical, Council Member Bedney. RS 2018-1356. I have it down there. Did we did. Do you have that for down for planning? Um, I'll show 1356 on the results. I'm just following my script. Let us check. No, ma'am, it wasn't reviewed by the committee. Okay, it, was it wasn't on the, the agenda. We'll correct that. Okay, all committee reports are in. Councilmember Glover. All right. Like I said, we're, we're tired. We, we've, we've had a long conversation about this in committee and everything else, and so I'm not going to prolong it. Uh, I think it, it's non-binding, but I also think it sends the message that says, yes, we're going to be diligent as we go forward with this and uh, make sure we're trying to do the right thing for the taxpayers. Thank you. So Thank with you. that, I renew my motion okay. to uh, to approve. All right, we have a little bit of discussion. Council Member Sledge. Per Rule 8, I ask for one meeting deferral. That is automatic. Excuse me? It's automatic. O automatic deferral. This is an automatic deferral. Okay, <laughs> can we have discussion on that, Council Member? No. Nope, no. automatic no. deferral, we're done. We're done. I should know that. First reading. Okay, we are finally on to bills on first reading. We're halfway Hallelujah. through the agenda. We're halfway through the agenda. <laughs> we'll be done by next week. <laughs> <laughs> Without objection, we'll take all bills on first reading together. If there is no objection, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right. Now we're on to bills on second reading. Yes, Councilmember Sledge. I've, I've, I've been told I need to do this from a legal standpoint. So on um, Bill 2018-1290, which we just passed on first reading, um, I need to give public notice that on Monday, August 27th at 6 p.m., we will be taking up that bill as a special hearing, um, the public hearing for it on second reading here in the council chambers. So, perfect. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. This brings us to bills on second reading. We'll begin with BL 2018-1142. Sponsor is Murphy. Can I find her? Committee reports, please. I think I forgot to read the caption. Hold on. This amends the Metro Code to require notice to Metro Council members of fund request within that district uh, budget and finance. Council Member Shulman. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem. Budget approve this one, 11 4 zero against. Move for approval. Been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Bill is recommended. Now we are on to BL 2018-12-2. Sponsor is Elrod, amends the Metro Code to regulate operators of systems of shared urban motility, mobility devices, such as bicycles and scooters, and to establish a permitting system for same. Council Member Elrod. Committee reports, please. Let's see. Council member Hagar. No, let's see. You've been approved. You were re-referred. Let me start with public safety. Council member Roberts. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem. So in a strange twist of fate, public safety, beer, and regulated beverages voted to defer, but we voted 2-2. Two -two. So we have no recommendation. Okay, no recommendation. Um, traffic and parking. Council member Hagar. Uh, traffic and parking on BL 2018-1202, passed 540 five, against. Okay, Councilmember Elrod. 
Thank you, ma'am. Um, I would um, move, or excuse me, let me back up. The Public Works Committee recommended approval um, with amendments A and B, uh, 10 in favor, zero against. And I would uh, move approval of the substitute on second reading with, a, uh, with an explanation. This is the second substitute. Okay, you're recognized. Yes, ma'am. All right, so this is the bill, the ordinance on shared urban mobility devices for, uh, to be brief, we'll call it the scooter bill. Uh, although the bill is also dealing with um, electric bikes and regular traditional bikes. I also want everyone to keep that in mind. Basically, this sets up a permitting process for companies to come to Nashville to be able to rent these from an app from your phone. Many cities have passed an ordinance such as this in various forms. I would argue that the version that is before you today is one of the most stringent in the country with, and gives um, our city government some of the, uh, a, a lot of tools and a lot of leeway and a lot of leverage to be able to regulate this as it goes along. It is a pilot project ordinance. Um, a operator gets a permit for one year and there are uh, fees that the operator has to pay to Metro for an application fee and also a per vehicle fee. Excuse me. Um, as uh, the, and let me, um, I can go into some detail on it, but let me, there are several provisions I want to point out of how Metro can regulate this goes along. There are a lot of things regarding um, the prohibition on sidewalks that companies have to do extensive education of their riders, uh, those that rent the vehicles. Um, but I think one of the biggest things um, that I want to point out is how much Metro can regulate this as it goes along. Um, the TLC, the Traffic Licensing Commission, is the main uh, committee or commission that's going to be regulating these. They're allowed to promulgate regulations to interpret and administer the uh, ordinance. Uh, the Traffic and Parking Commission can determine um, block faces or areas where uh, parking is prohibited. They can also, um, there's already a prohibition in the ordinance uh, that follows state law where you can't ride these on sidewalks um, in a business district and the Traffic and Parking Commission can expand that, dis that uh, area and uh, to not get into the technicality of it, but we follow the state definition and basically a business district means what, about what you would think it would. Um, a, um, I went through that. Um, after a notice and a hearing, the TLC can take disciplinary action, including revocation, suspension, or prohibition um, against any permit holder um, if, uh, who fails to comply with this ordinance or any other Metro code. And the staff, not just the TLC, but the staff is authorized to take temporary action until the hearing is held. Uh, the Metro government and MNPD um, with the amendment can, uh, can set up any rules or procedures or protocol in, 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 with, in the event of extreme weather and emergencies and special events. And a very catch-all is the Traffic Licensing, um, Transportation Licensing Commission and its staff and the Traffic and Parking Commission and its staff has the power and authorized to do all things and acts and things necessary or convenient to implement this ordinance, compel compliance with the ordinance, or to promote and protect public safety and to ensure the right-of-way is not impeded. Also, um, and even um, larger than that is there are a couple clauses that I think are important. One. And these are some of the lessons we've learned, I think, from the short-term rental debate, is no operator is guaranteed a second year of a permit. They have to reapply and go through the entire process again. But also, um, it is in the ordinance that any operator would have to comply with any, uh, any subsequent ordinance or resolution um, dealing, with, um, these, um, dealing with these vehicles. So I think that was uh, something that we learned from the short-term rental debate. Um, these devices, I think, and these vehicles uh, are going to be something that, uh, yes, will be used by tourists, but the, as they increase in number, these are going to be used by people that actually live here in Nashville. It'll be, there's anti-clustering prohibition in the ordinance that requires that as you increase your numbers over a certain threshold, you can't, um, you can't have so many within a square mile. And so that will um, push them out further outside of the downtown area, the West End, um, East Nashville, so that more folks that actually live here in Nashville have access to them. And that will mean, um, you know, that I believe will take cars off the street. In the short time that Bird was here, about four weeks, I believe, 
The average car trip, or excuse me, the average scooter trip was 1.9 miles. For a lot of folks, that may be walking, but I think for a lot of other folks uh, in our hilly uh, terrain and hot weather, that's them driving their personal car or taking a ride share, uh, an Uber or Lyft. Uh, before you is uh, that I'm sponsoring two amendments. The first one is strictly a cleanup amendment, and and I will move that with a brief explanation of that amendment. So I move um, passage of Amendment A. Amendment A. Okay, it's been moved in second. Brief explanation. Thank you, ma'am. It makes, <clears throat> excuse me, it makes no substantive uh, um, changes that uh, are impactful in any way, except perhaps um, it tightens the regulation or the requirement that um, in the ordinance, there, is, there are caps where these uh, companies have so many scooters or bicycles that they can have. Um, currently in the ordinance, it's 400 in the first two months, up to 800 in months three and four, and then um, 1,000 in five and six. The, this amendment, it does a lot of things, but um, one of the things I think is important that it uh, clarifies is that no company can increase their numbers of their fleet unless they are meeting a certain threshold, an average utilization threshold is what it's called in the ordinance. Basically what that means is the fleets have to prove, and there's extensive um, data sharing requirements, it's about a page, page and a half in the ordinance, that these companies have to provide data to Metro. That's going to be uh, publicly available not only to the TLC, but other parts of Metro. It's going to be uh, for, furnished to ITS. And some of that, I think, will be live, even um, be able to see in live time. Uh, but you can um, see where they're going, how many, how long the trips are, and, and that kind of thing. And so we'll be able to see how many trips that are being taken a day. And, and the industry has recommended a threshold of what they've seen in other cities is three trips um, a day in a, for a scooter, two for an electric bike, one for a traditional bike. Now that may be so, that may be a good threshold, and that's the temporary one that is set in the ordinance with the TLC, and the many ways that they can regulate this as we go forward can change that. So um, the main thing that this, one of the main things that this uh, amendment does, it clarifies no company can increase their fleet whatsoever, not only um, through the average utilization threshold that they're, that they're actually being used, but also the, at the suggestion of uh, Council Lady Allen, is that they are basically kept in compliance with the ordinance. The TLC can set certain, certain thresholds on the number of violations they have of the ordinance or other, metro, or other parts of the Metro Code. Basically, they have to be in good standing. They have to continue to be good actors, and which um, was, I think, an intentional part on myself to try to have a carrot and stick uh, approach with the ordinance where the operators you know, want to have more scooters or bikes on the street so they can increase, of course, their revenue. But it's also um, the stick that if they aren't good actors, if they aren't educating their users to stay off the sidewalks, um, if they aren't um, enforcing the prohibition on certain parking requirements that the TLC, the Traffic and Parking Commission have, they cannot increase their fleet. So with that, I move Amendment A, which is mainly a housekeeping um, amendment. Been moved and seconded. Councilmember Sledge, did you want to speak or is that left over? No, this is me the, asking to be ab abstaining on every vote. Okay. Sorry, I can hardly speak right now. Um, so, yeah, I need to be marked as abstaining. abstaining. Thank you. Okay, duly noted. Thank you. And seeing no other discussion, all those in favor of Amendment A? Aye. Any opposed? Great. All right, Councilmember Elrod. Thank you, ma'am, and I appreciate everyone's indulgence. Um, now, we, these uh, amendments are going to get a little bit more into the substantive part. Uh, Amendment B basically um, lowers the overall cap in the ordinance, but speeds up the um, time in which um, vehicles can get on the street. Um, right now in the ordinance, uh, it's a 400, 800, 1,200 over the course of about six months. This um, lowers it to, to 1,000 over the course of three months. The thought being that, um, you know, we've, this uh, ordinance has been, uh, delayed a couple of times, and we, I think that there is at least a, I believe, a market desire to have these on the street and to try to, um, you know, incorporate them into the city. But again, you know, with under the uh, amendment, the, it starts with 500. And, you know, we need to have, I believe, a certain number, uh, like 400, like 500, um, on our streets so that they're not just downtown, they're not just on West End, or perhaps in East Nashville. And I think primarily used by tourists, that the more of them that are here, they'll actually have to be spread out more, uh, you know, in farther places uh, in the city and be used by actually Nashvillians. And they, because I think that these will, 
are not going to be like our golf carts or pedal taverns or pedicabs, um, that, which are primarily used by tourists or those visiting here. That these are going to be, yes, used somewhat by tourists, but going to be used by people that actually live here in Nashville. But to do that, we have to have a certain number so that the, um, the anti-clustering provision kicks in, but also um, so that there is a uh, more of a, the market um, basically spreads out um, across the city. So under the amendment, the, the company would have uh, the ability to start with 500. Um, they will be able to go to 750 in the second month, 1,000 in the third. But again, well, with the previous amendment as clarified, they cannot increase their fleet unless they are being used, unless they are meeting a threshold that is set in the ordinance temporarily, and then the TLC, and there are many ways that they can regulate this um, after we pass it. They can set that utilization threshold higher or lower um, based upon you know, input from the public, from public works, from the mayor's office, from Walk Bike Nashville, whoever it is. So I would move approval of Amendment B. Been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Amendment is passed. Councilmember Elrod. Thank you, ma'am. That is all of the amendments that, I, uh, that I'm sponsoring. So I, I leave it to you. There are some other people in the queue. So, Council Member Swope. Thank you. One question for, well, first off, uh, Councilman Elrod, you've done a great job with this. Um, this was a very complex issue that you put together in a matter of, like, weeks rather than months. But I have one serious question. What about liability? Is it the company, is the company liable if tourist A gets on a scooter, runs into a Lamborghini, and causes $6,000, $8,000, $10,000, $100,000 worth of damage? Who pays for the Lamborghini? Mr. Jameson, can you answer that? The uh, insurance company probably for the uh, uh, operator, but the uh, provisions of the Second substitute and the amended version thereof require one million and two million caps, uh, automobile and commercial coverage per incident. Um, so presumably there would be adequate coverage um, in that instance. Thank you. And the converse question I have regarding liability is what happens if tourist A gets on a scooter and gets run over by a pedal tavern? A pedal tavern, or or a truck, or a car, or anything else. Uh, how do we deal with that? So, uh, assuming the negligence of the pedal tavern operator, then that entity would be liable. But what happens if it isn't the negligence? What happens if it is the negligence of tourist A on the scooter? Then it's Case in point, the first day these were on the road, I literally almost hit two of them, and I'm. Really glad I didn't, but, and I'm not against this at all. I think there are great means of, of inner city transportation as long as we can clarify who's responsible for what. We're a, what, um, what judges would call a modified comparative fault uh, state that looks at literally on a 100% score what percentage of the accident fault was attributable to you versus the operator of the other vehicle. And then, depending on those percentages, juries award or don't liability. But can we assume from what you just said that the city doesn't hold any liability in any of this? Yeah, I mean, I'm excluding any theories where the traffic light was malfunctioning or the sidewalk was broken. But if it's purely operator error, the city's not uh, exposed. Good. Then I, I ask all of you to vote yes for this. Thank you. Councilmember O'Connell. Thank you, Madam President. We did not, um, just for lack of time, we did not cover all of the amendments in uh, public works. It wasn't for, I think, lack of interest. Uh, I know, for instance, you have several. Uh, I, I don't know if you're going to review any of those, but I did have a couple here. Um, I had intended to move a sunset provision, but one thing that has been pointed out to me is that uh, the way this is worded, if we go to July 31st, this would sunset literally the week before what is likely an election uh, next year, which I think might complicate this for discussion. So the future policy thing, I, I guess I'd look to Mr. Jamison for some guidance here. Uh, could we, I guess if we were to 
try to resolve that um, conflict of, of timing, which might be suboptimal, um, we'd basically be looking at a suspension of the rules next week to do that, correct? You could. Um, alternatively, you could adopt the sunset provision and amend that any time by a later ordinance. I got it. Um, yeah, I think I might revisit this and, and not move this at this time. Um, the uh, I did want to move Amendment L after our um, public meeting on this. I, I had a number of people approach me and ask why we were uh, going with a fine lower than what we are allowed to assess here. And so I did want to increase this fine again just to sort of to Councilman Swope's point, I think I had a number of residents as well as um, downtown employees uh, express concern about their either collisions or near collisions. Uh, and I think it is fully appropriate here uh, to use the, the strongest tools we have to incent good behavior. So I would like to move Amendment L, which basically just increases what is a $25 fine to $50 fine. been moved and seconded. I'm sorry. Uh, there are other people in the queue. If that is on this amendment, raise your hand. If not, let's go ahead and vote on the amendment. Councilman Elrod, do you want to say something about the amendment? Councilman Elrod. Thank you, ma'am. Um, first, real quick, to Councilman Swope's question, there is an indemnification clause that the, that the companies have to file with the Metro, which is typical for the pedal taverns and, and carriages. Um, so, and I, it somewhat goes to a point that I want to speak on this, is that you know, these are new um, as far as renting scooters or bikes through an app. But I think you, we also need to think of it as, a, as a similar to a car rental, is that a car rental company has, you know, you have to have insurance, you have to have a valid driver's license, you have to follow the rules of the road, and the insurance company has, absolutely has a responsibility to make sure the rider, or the, excuse me, the driver, the, the renter, um, is in full compliance, but it is eventually on the personal responsibility of the person driving that car to follow um, the rules of the road and to operate it in a safe manner. Um, the reason that it is at $25 is, in, and this is a fine that is a $25 fine that is in the ordinance, and the fine can be uh, for any improper operation or parking of a scooter or bike that is uh, rented under this ordinance. Um, there's a clarification in Amendment A that, that we adopted that was at the suggestion of uh, MNPD of the Traffic and Parking Commission. That is an, um, a clarification that that is in addition to any other state or metro code that we have. So, you know, you may be proper, improperly using this on a sidewalk and get a $25 fine, which is actually assessed to the company, and then the company decides whether or not to charge it to the rider, but you can still get charged for the DUI. Um, so, but it is set at $25, at least for me, is that, uh, is um, at least for bird i'll use that because that's an example that i know is it's 15 minutes or excuse me 15 cents a minute to operate a bird so if you op i think it's like a dollar to start up so if you get on a bird you're on it for you know just a handful of minutes it's you know just a few bucks so a 25 dollars fine i believe personally is going to be as much a deterrent um for the uh, small amount that you're already spending on that ride, a $25 fine is gonna be as much of a deterrent as a $50 fine. Additionally though, it is my hope that these are gonna be used in um, you know, areas that desperately need alternative and uh, more, more inexpensive modes of transportation. And with these $25 fines, they're gonna be assessed on the company and it's gonna be up to the company whether or not to assess it on that rider, whether they improperly um, use it on a sidewalk or in some other manner or improperly parked it. Um, there may be folks that are going to say, well, I've got a $25 fine, you know, on my app. Okay, I can pay that. But if it's a $50 fine, I think that will increase the number of folks that are going to say, okay, I'm not going to use this anymore. So it was, it was in tandem between trying to make it, uh, you know, a fine that I think will be enough of a deterrent and be affordable, um, you know, affordable in the sense of, you know, they'll take the ding and use it again instead of they take the ding but don't use it again and don't pay the fine. So, you know, that's the reason it's at $25. Um, I understand, you know, that it's uh, most fines that we have, 
in Metro and in state law are $50 fines, but this being something new and across the country, I think this is the first time of one of these ordinances that we're putting actually a fine in uh, an ordinance like this um, to actually find the user, because that was a, a problem that other cities have about enforcement about on sidewalks. Um, so I would uh, ask that you vote against the amendment and keep it at $25. Thank you. Thank you. And Councilmember Johnson, is this on the, not, okay. Then, uh, Madam President, I think I would renew my motion here uh, with another brief comment uh, in response to the chairman. We've already seen this in action. Uh, parking violations were as frequent as moving violations for usage of these, and I frankly see no reason, despite the newness of the policy, to respond with weakness and what we already know were violations of, the, of what were metro ordinances that caused this company not to be able to operate in Nashville until we got this policy framework in place. So I would encourage colleagues to support the maximum available fine. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kendall, do you want to speak on this amendment? I just wanted to get some clarification. Who, who, who enforces this? Is this going through a traffic court when you talk about fines? And MTL, Transportation I mean, Licensing Commission, and the police department. A parking? Traffic, Transportation Licensing Commission and the police department. Okay, so if a person gets a ticket for parking a scooter improperly, that goes to traffic court? Yep. $50 fine? Well, 25 or 50 uh -huh. depending on... Okay. Whereas you may have a, a car that gets ten dollar fine, right? I don't eleven. It doesn't? Who, who who where do you go to pay it? I mean what the company it the fine is assessed to the operator. So it's automatic. In other words, if 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 a ticket gets on the, the bike, the person just goes and pay pays the uh Money it is up to the operator, say Bird or Lime, as to whether or not they pass on the fine to the user. The, the fine itself actually gets assessed to the operator, not the user. Okay, now wh what are the other kinds of fines that you would have for operation other than parking? Uh, on a sidewalk? Or? Potentially, you're right. If you were seen and uh, caught riding <laughs> on a sidewalk where you were not supposed to be, you could pick up such a fine. Okay, I guess, I guess my question is, if, if you operating a motor vehicle and, and violate the law, then you have an opportunity to go to court and defend that. <laughs> Here you don't. It sounds like you just go pay a fine. Well, at this point, that is the, dip, the primary difference would be uh, that you are, that the citation in a, in a motor vehicle scenario is issued directly to the driver. In this case, it is not issued to the operator. The vehicle is, op it is issued to the platform operator, the company, basically. Okay. Okay, uh, Council Member Blaylock, is this on the amendment? Okay, you're recognized. We can add an increased fee later on, isn't that correct, Mr. Jameson? I'm sorry, what's that? We can add this uh, a higher fee at a later date, correct? You can't, you can't increase the fine over 50, if that's what you're asking. Well, if we pass LROD's, then we could come back later on that's and true, yes. increase it. Yes. So for the sake of this being a new item for our city, you know, I would like for us to give it a shot at the $25. And so I please uh, ask y'all to vote for El with Elrod. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Withers, is this on the amendment? It is. Uh, in this one, I, I'm in agreement with uh, Councilmember Bloylock that um, because you can be you know, let, let's try this for a little while and try to get some data and see what compliance is like, and then we can revisit this in the future. I'm comfortable with the 25 at this at this time at that level. Thank you. Councilmember Swope, do you want to speak on the amendment? I do. Thank okay. you. Um, I, I stand with the sponsor on this one, all due respect, Councilman McConnell. Uh, we can always raise this later, but we can't lower it in the future. So I, I as Council Lady Blaylock just said, let, let's start at a moderate level at $25. If this were being assessed to the person actually riding or using the scooter, that we'd have to go chase down and get to show up in traffic court, I would just, I, I would go with the highest fine no demand. But it's not, it's being assessed on the company that owns the scooter, and that's simply a matter of, I'm gonna guess, paperwork, is that correct? Or are we gonna take, 
in this in this instance is the bird instance. Are we going to take a credit card from bird and just hammer it every time they get a fine? We have not worked that detail out yet. I bet we have a contract with them. I mean, we'll have a. Will there be an oper there, there'll be an operations contract with correct. the operating company, correct? Then I, I, I stand in support of the $25 fee and can't support this amendment. Thank you. Okay. Council Member Henderson. Thank you, Madam President. I rise in support of Amendment L. Um, I, I fully support scooters in Nashville, but I think uh, because this goes to the operator, um, the onus is on them to encourage their users um, to use good practices to remind them through the app and reinforce that and in their advertisements, not on sidewalks, how to park them and so forth. And so if it is more um, punitive than that, then makes the operator, uh, you know, work harder, frankly, um, to uh, uh, encourage best practices. Um, and Councilman Swope, yes, we can lower the fee later. So just in the way that we could increase it by amending the bill later, we could also lower the fee later if we were to see that um, there was problem with this and I think uh, you know I do support scooters in Nashville as do uh, many of my constituents but people do have legitimate um, concerns about this and I think the community um, you know much like in the short-term rental uh, conversation with these sort of uh, companies and providers want to see um, that we are using the law to the maximum extent to hold these companies accountable um, because they are using our public right of way. So I support Amendment L and encourage my colleagues to do the same. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Pardue. Call for a question. Surprise, surprise. Okay, the question's been called. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? We are voting on Amendment whatever number from Councilmember O'Connell L, uh, which would raise the fine from $20 to $50. All those in favor of Amendment L say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. I think it fails. Okay. We are back on any other amendment. Councilmember O'Connell. I, I did have one late filed amendment that I did run by um, at least one of the platforms, which is uh, amendment, I, I don't know if it picked up a, a number, but it basically says that the operators need to be capable of remotely disabling the use of one of these devices. Um, and I believe the operators are gonna have this capability, but this is again, a, a safety precaution uh, for a variety of, of reasons if they're, in a you know in a scenario where one of the vehicles it actually was a, a liability situation for the operator the ability to remotely disable one to prevent use uh, without requiring the uh, the user of the vehicle uh, is is again this is one of those things that came out of a review of consistency with NACTO guidelines that came out when we were first starting to seriously discuss this so I would like to move that amendment. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion on the amendment? Council Member Mina Johnson, do you want to speak on this amendment? No. Uh, Actually, Council Member Bedney. A point, point of order, I point. believe I need to move to suspend the rules. So. Okay, sorry. You need to move to suspend the rules. Is there an objection to the suspension of the rules? Seeing none, we are back on that All amendment. Right, perfect, thank you. Uh, Council Member Bedney, did you want to speak on this amendment or something else? We're on this amendment. Okay, we'll come, we'll come back to you. Okay, so seeing no more discussion on the amendment, uh, to ask the companies be able to, I'm seeing a hand wave, so you're, you're new. Council Member Swope. Sorry, I've taken an interest in this one. You yeah. have. Do we actually know if the operator can remotely disable these things? We do know for a fact that Bird can. I have not specifically checked with Lyme, but I'm, I'm pretty sure based on where Bird was with the technology that they can do this, and I think it's something we're, we're within reason to require. And if, if the sponsor can answer this question, has the sponsor had this, or the sponsor of this amendment, had the conversation with Bird if they're capable, if they're willing to do this? Uh, well, they, they have the technical capability and therefore I think did not see this as, as in any way uh, in, an extra or onerous obligation. All right, thank you. That's so, okay. No more discussion on that amendment. We are voting on amendment, late filed amendment. Didn't have a number yet. Okay, all those in favor of the amendment? Aye. Any opposed? Amendment passes. Okay, that is it for amendments. We have a few people in the queue who want to speak in general. Council Member Amina Johnson. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem. Uh, I would like to offer one more amendment that is uh, specifically uh, prohibit motorized uh, device to be operated in a green way. I don't think it's uh, original uh, or amended uh, 
portion of A did not specifically... Uh, There's an amendment that does that. Yes, so I would like to offer Amendment D uh, that will specifically uh, prohibit uh, motorized uh, shared of um, uh, SUMD <laughs> to be operated in a green way. So I would like to offer that amendment for just common reason. Thank you. I'm going to let Mr. Jameson provide some information about state law on greenways. The um, state law on this entire issue is uh, somewhat uh, conflicting uh, through several provisions. Um, our office prepared a chart of every type of device and then every type of venue you could possibly ride that device on, greenways, sidewalks, streets, um, and there's, you'd hard, be hard pressed to find um, consistency in the state law. One of the state laws, however, provides, this is 558-205, that there can be no motor vehicles as broadly defined allowed in bike lanes. So Amendment D, which says no operation on a sidewalk where there's a bike lane adjacent to it, what's implicit is that you would then ride the scooter in the bike lane, and that's prohibited under, under state law. Probably not intentional at the time, but the way they define motor vehicles would capture scooters. That's a problem. Thank you. So in that case, <laughs> could I ask for suspension of the rule and just specifically remove uh, electric uh, SUMD out of Greenway. Scratch off all the bike lane or sidewalk reference, just strictly remove from the Greenway. Would that be possible? We can move to suspend the rules. Take so we have a motion to suspend the rules. Any objection? And just for clarification, um, what we're left with is no electric scooters on greenways. That and how does state law address that? Um, I'm not aware of any restriction in that uh, realm um, with respect to state law. So. Okay. Okay. Councilmember Elrod. It's hard to know. I have lots of lots of people that are waiting to talk on other things. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I apologize. I was not paying attention. I'll be honest, um, because I was talking to someone. But is it is it just defined out down to scooters, or is it any SUMD? Scooters. Motorized. Okay, then that also includes electric bicycles. Um, electric scooters. So, and I think there. Um, uh, and I meant to check before tonight, but I think motorized vehicles are already prohibited on greenways. According to Greenway rules, yeah. which is different from a metro ordinance, and I had heard something about state law with That's reference correct. to and Greenways. Her, her amendment was specific to electric scooters, not bikes. Okay. That's what I heard. Well, I guess I would be a... I think with some of the confusion of the amendment, I'd like to see the, what the language says specifically because of the, some of the definitional terms in the ordinance. But also, I would, you know, this is the TLC can set up rules where and when they can operate. I think there's an amendment later on that they can't operate after dark. The ordinance gives clear authority to the TLC and the Traffic and Parking Commission where they can uh, basically set when and where these can operate. And just, you know, for clarity, I guess, uh, you know, it, uh, I guess I'll commit to the, if, if it's not already prohibited by, you know, Metro Code or policy on not allowing them on um, greenways, then I'll support an amendment on, you know, a third reading. But, you know, there are a lot of folks, I think, you know, particularly Walk Bike Nashville would, you know, object because it could prohibit, um, you know, depending on how it's worded, um, e-bikes, you know, you know, bikes that have a small electric motor in them from um, being used on greenways, which I don't think is the intent. But that's why I'd like to see, the, you know, the language before we move forward and not necessarily do it on the fly. So for that reason, at least personally for myself, I'll be voting against it, not because I want them on the greenway, just because I want to make sure that we're clear as we go forward how we do it. Thank you. So, Councilmember Johnson, do you want to clarify? Yes. Uh, so because this is not the uh, budget or adjoining bill, we cannot amend at the third reading. So. This is the only chance if we want to add any amendment. So my, if with the help, uh, Mr. Jameson, my intention was no uh, motorized scooter in Greenway. 
that, Sorry. if we can kind of clarify that for me, that would be great. Um, you would be able to amend on there with suspension of the rules if understood the sponsor's uh, welcoming of that. Um, I, I'm not aware of any specific provision with respect to scooters on greenways. Um, I think there is a provision with respect to no motorized vehicles on greenways. If that captures motorized scooters, I would just have to double check. But if that's the nature of the amendment, you can offer it tonight or attempt it on third. Thank you. So for, it seems like everybody's on the same page. We are all agree we don't need any scooter running in the greenway. And to be sure, I, assuming if I want to offer it and make it sure, you would uh, grant suspension of the rule at the next meeting. So I will withdraw this motion. And I would like us to confirm, uh, indeed, it's prohibited. If it's not, uh, we have opportunity to uh, amend at the third reading. OK, so that motion is withdrawn. Thank you. Councilmember Bednick. I was going to make an amendment to her amendment, but she withdrew. Y'all can work on that before third reading. Yeah. That sounds good. OK, thank you. Um, OK, so Council Member Freddie O'Connell, do you have anything left that you would? OK, you're recognized. I do just want to reiterate to colleagues here, um, you know, I think this is one of those issues that has some uniqueness to downtown in the sense of there is not an issue we have talked about in the three years of this term that has evoked uh, passion quite like this. I mean, I, I have heard from people, I mean, and this is with only a few hundred of these devices operating uh, for a matter of weeks, but the number of near collisions, the number of people riding in groups on sidewalks at high speeds, I know, and credit to Councilman Elrod, uh, and the, the many stakeholders here who have brought us into pretty close consistency with uh, NACTO guidelines. But this is why, again, that fine issue matters to me, why some of these other details matter a great deal, is that for not just residents downtown where we do truly now have 10,000 people living, uh, but all the way out to Midtown as well, where I, I started to hear from folks. I mean, this. This ultimately becomes a quality of life issue. And so I think the ideal here is to try to advantage those people for whom this is actually a last mile transportation uh, opportunity and, and to leverage the mobility innovation that is, that is coming to Nashville in this regard while also minimizing the, the quality of life disruptions from uh, frankly, poor uh, poor consideration of the, the impact on quality of life by the platform operators and too many of their users during the first run. So, um, you know, I, I, <laughs> I hope that this policy gives us uh, the opportunity uh, to, to rectify some of the quality of life issues that were trampled the first time out. Uh, but I, I do think we need to pay real careful attention to this, uh, including uh, recognition that this is a pilot uh, rather than just an ongoing policy that we will never revisit. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Swope, back again. Oh, call the question. Good for you. So I believe that we are on the bill as amended. And Mr. Jamison, can you review which amendments we, we agreed have, to? Uh, we have Amendment A from Councilman Elrod, essentially the omnibus uh, amendment, Amendment B. Uh, that addresses the caps, uh, tweaks them slightly, uh, and amendment, uh, that's it. I'm sorry, the late file from Councilman O'Connell that applied the disabling uh, technology. Gotcha. Okay, so Council Member Elrod, do you want to move your bill as admitted? I would move my bill, and just I want to state for the record, that, and um, this is a pilot project. For me, it absolutely is, and I made a com uh, commitment to the Traffic and Parking Commission. I want to make a commitment to this body. For me, it is a pilot project. Uh, as things come up, I hope the TLC and the Traffic and Parking Commission and other parts of Metro government, um, you know, make changes either to policies or to how we deal with these um, in the appropriate manner. Um, because there are going to be hiccups, there are going to be growing pains. These are not going to prohibit, you know, while we prohibit them on sidewalks in the business district and we have a fine um, for them and the app. Uh, companies uh, or the uh, scooter and bike companies uh, will educate their members or their, excuse me, their riders. There will still be some that will be written on sidewalks and there will have to be, you know, a learning of the public that, you know, where those, uh, the proper spot for those are on our streets and not on sidewalks. Um, but I would commit to this body that as things come up, 
Um, you know, if we need to tweak it in whatever kind of way, um, I'll be engaged or not. This is not something for me personally that this is a set it and forget it. Um, one of the first things I started working on uh, on the council was uh, pedal taverns, it's about regulating the, those hours, but also um, trying to keep our right of ways open. That's our streets, our sidewalks, um, and that those belong to the motoring, walking, biking public, not necessarily any private company, whether it's a scooter, a bike developer, you know, or whoever else. So I just wanted to make that um, public commitment. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. And did you move your I bill? I moved my, yes, ma'am, I that moved was, it. That was why I called on you. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's been moved and seconded, seeing no further discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Bill is passed. Awesome. Uh, next is BL 2018-1281, sponsors Henderson and Murphy, not in that order. This amends the Metro Code to codify a sexual harassment awareness and training requirement for employees and certain contractors. Council Member Murphy. Uh, committee reports, please. Council Member Withers. Thank you. Um, the P Personnel, Public Information, Human Relations, and Housing Committee met this afternoon, and at the request of the sponsor, our committee voted to defer to the first um, meeting in October. Uh, we voted to defer four in favor, a zero against. Thank you. Does budget have a report on this? Uh, budget also had a report. I'm not, it's not sure on the calendar, but we did actually take it up. Um, thank you, Madam Pro Tem. We did the exact same thing at the request of the sponsor, deferred to the first meeting in October. First meeting 11 in four, October. Zero against. Okay. Council Member Murphy. And I would also like to, to move to defer it to the first meeting in October. We are waiting on some more information from the administration and departments to make sure this bill is accurate and, um, and something that we can fiscally do because regardless of the fiscal costs, we need to enact a lot of this legislation and we'll leave the rest for later. So it's been moved and second to defer to the first meeting in October. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Bill is deferred. Next is BL 2018-1282, sponsors Mendez, Shulman, Bircher, and Pridemore. This amends the Metro Code to establish a new section regarding appraisals of real property prior to disposition. Council Member Mendez. Committee report, please. Councilmember Shulman. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem. Uh, budget approved uh, this as amended, 11 4 0 against. Councilmember Mendez. I'd like to uh, move approval with a brief explanation and then also offering an amendment. Okay. okay. You recognize? Um, so uh, this uh, does two things. Um, uh, it makes it so when we get, when we're required to get appraisals for real estate, um, for something we have to approve. Um, there's two different kinds of appraisals for professional uh, appraisers. One is called an appraisal report and the other is a restricted use report. Um, sometimes we get restricted use reports, sometimes we get full appraisals which have more information. This would require that we get full appraisals. Um, secondly, when we get appraisals now, um, they uh, most frequently state the current value before any rezoning. And this would require that um, when we get an appraisal, it should state the current value as well as what the value will be after any planned zoning changes. Um, you all know that uh, whenever we get um, uh, zonings that have to go through in order to get a deal closed, that's because value changes depending on what the zoning change will be. It's important to know what Metro is giving and getting in real estate transactions, and the purpose of this is to get us better appraisals. Um, with that, I'd offer, um, there's an amendment that uh, was requested by Metro Water Services um, to exempt flood buyback properties um, from this requirement, um, and that's because the point of flood buybacks is to pay what the current value is um, before we essentially decrease the value by um, with the buyback. So I'd like to move the amendment that's in the package first. Okay. Second. Then moved and seconded. Councilman O'Connell, do you want to speak on the amendment? Okay, I'll come back to you then. Um, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Amendment passes. Council Member Mendez. I'd like to move the bill as amended. Okay. Council Member O'Connell, do you want to speak on that? Yes, please. Okay. Thank you, Madam President. I guess this is probably first a question for the sponsor. Uh, I don't know if, if I would need to go to the administration and or finance on it after that. Um, I get, so in reading the analysis, um, it, it basically suggests that this is for any disposition. So with the bill as now doubly amended, I mean, I guess, right, the, that point about buybacks, are there any other 
um, you know, kind of uh, unusual circumstances in which we would have, you know, a, a bizarre scenario like a uh, something, I, I know of one case, for instance, in, in District 19 already where we've got a, a property that was constructed with full federal share funds that, uh, you know, you could do through a federal transfer. How, how I mean, does it, is the intent for this to apply across the board with um, the, the parameter being there uh, as a hard and fast rule? What, you know, if, if we did get into a, a water buyback type of situation, how, how would this affect the overall uh, flow of property transactions for scenarios where we needed to do something uh, or had an opportunity to do something that is, is sort of not in the traditional vein of property transactions? Thank you. Uh, two things. Um, uh, one is uh, Metro Finance, I think, first saw this uh, five weeks ago before it got filed. Um, and uh, the only comment we've gotten from um, any, any department is from Metro Water Services. Um, so um, nobody's identified uh, one, you know, one of those odd scenarios you're talking about. And then the second thing to know is um, uh, something this doesn't impact is um, there's, there's relatively uh, arcane rules about when we get appraisals and when we don't. Um, and I'm not going to try after midnight to describe the ins and outs of that. Um, but this doesn't change when we're required to get an appraisal in any way, shape, or form. It just says when we get one, it's got to be a full report, and it's got to have the perspective value after the anticipated zoning change. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, all those in favor of the bill as amended. Any opposed? Bill is passed. Uh, next is BL 2018-1283, sponsor is Murphy. Amends the Metro Code to restrict the use of proceeds from the sale of real property owned by the Metro government. Councilmember Murphy. Please. Councilmember Shulman. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem. At the request of the sponsor, um, budget uh, agreed to defer to the second meeting in September 1140 against. Thank you. Councilmember Murphy. Yes, at the request of the administration, I agreed to defer this to the second meeting in September and look forward to discussing it with each and every one of you. Thank you. We have a motion to defer. All those in favor? Any opposed? Bill is deferred. Next is BL 2018-1284, sponsors Kendall, Shulman, Vercher, and others. This authorizes the Department of Water and Sewerage Services to provide public water service improvements for region homes, proposed development, as well as other existing properties in the area. Uh, Council Member Kendall. Where are you? Thank you. Did you get me? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, committee reports. Council Member Shulman. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem. Budget approved 11 4 0 against. Planning and Zoning, Council Member Bedney. The Planning Committee recommended approval 11 4 0 against. Public Works, Council Member Elrod. Public Works recommend approval 10 in favor, 0 against. Thank you. Council Member Kendall. I'm going to move approval. Is it true? Ms. Roberts says that we get time and a half after 12 o'clock. Absolutely. Thank you. Is there more pizza back there? So it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Bill's, Bill's been. Next is BL 2018-1285. Sponsors O'Connell, Bednay, and Elrod. This abandons a portion of alley number 572 right-of-way. Council Member O'Connell. Thank you, Madam President. I'd like to open the public hearing. I <laughs> All those in favor? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to request committee reports, please. Okay, Council Member uh, Bedney. Uh, the committee recommended approval, 11 4 0 against. Thank you. Planning uh, Public Works, Council Member Railroad. Public Works recommended approval, 10 in favor, 0 against. Thank you, Council Member Hagar. Travis and Parking approve, 5 4 0 against. Thank you, Council Member O'Connell. Thank you, Madam President. I'd like to move approval. Been moved and seconded. Any, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Bill's passed. Next is BL 2018-1286, sponsors Syracuse, Bednay, and Elrod. This abandons a portion of Cliffdale Road right-of-way. Council Member Syracuse. Uh, thank you, Madam Pro Tem. Committee reports, please. Thank you. Council Member Bedney. At 1.36 in the morning, the committee recommend the approval 11 for zero against. Thank you. Council Member Elrod. 
Sorry. Public works recommended approval. Ten in favor, zero against. Thank you. Council Member Hagar. Cabin and parking approved, five, four, zero against. Council Member Syracuse. Thank you. Move approval. Been moved and seconded. All in favor? Any opposed? Bill's passed. Next is bills on third reading. Yay. All right. Next is BL 2016 to 19 sponsors, Bednay, Karen Johnson, and others. This cancels a portion of the Forest View PUD planned unit development and by changing 7.84 acres from R10 to RS10 zoning for property located at Forest View Drive unnumbered east of Murfreesboro Pike. Because this was disapproved, we will need a roll call vote. Council Member Karen Johnson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Actually, I am asking because I did receive information at 6.33 p.m. tonight from the property owner, uh, some new information in regards to this property. So I will be sharing that with the residents in the area before I decide on the action. So I'm asking for a one meeting deferral. Do I have a second? Then moved and seconded. All in favor, one meeting deferral. Any opposed? Bill is deferred. Next is Substitute Bill BL 2016-287, sponsors Haywood. This changes 2.47 acres from AR 2A and CS and 15.6 acres to SP zoning to permit heavy equipment sales and repair and all uses permitted by the CS zoning district except alternative financial services uses, non-residential drug treatment facilities, a bar or nightclub, and pawn shops and clubs, and 1.43 acres from CS zoning to AR 2A zoning for property located at 7435 Old Hickory Boulevard. Council Member Haywood. With all committee reports in, I move for approval. Is there a second? second? It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? Bill is recommended. Thank Passed. You. Next is BL 2018-1139. Uh, Council Member Syracuse approves the Donaldson Transit Oriented Redevelopment District. Council Member Syracuse. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem. Uh, I have an amendment I'd like to submit with uh, explanation. All right. All right, thank you. you okay, recognize? folks, that this amendment before you has three elements. I'm gonna go, go through them. A um, little bit of recap first. As you recall, last time this was bef before us, I proposed an amendment to this MDHA plan that made the Design Review Committee better balanced with local representation. That's that always been uh, my goal in, within the the spirit of the, the state authorizing legislation. So after meetings with MDHA, uh, this amended MDHA plan and Metro ordinance that you have before you achieves that, um, but without the previous amendment, that would have been a major change to the plan, which would have required it to go back to MDHA board for approval, and then potentially even another public hearing at council. So what we've got here, in fact, uh, there are aspects that, that I like it better. Uh, instead of uh, nominating two members to the mayor's office for approval as any board or commission, I now get to directly appoint three uh, to the DRC, one of which is a property owner in the TOD, which follows the structure of other d design review committees, um, and then two um, are members of the 15th district. Um, so the amendment includes letters of appointment that, that you'll see in your... Uh, in our little, little system here, uh, that actually, for transparency, names the members of the, the folks in the, in the Donaldson community that, that will serve on the Donaldson TOD DRC. The third amendment, uh, the third element, sorry, of, of the amendment is a memorandum of understanding between MDHA and planning. And after passage of this, MDHA and uh, planning will work together, hire a consultant to study best practices across the nation for how efficient DRC processes should work, especially when they coexist with things like a downtown code, a UZO, a UDO, an SP, and then you add in a TOD, and things could potentially get a little clunky. So there is uh, an agreement that there is potentially ways that we could really streamline this. And this isn't just for the Donaldson TOD, but would impact all redevelopment districts. So that's, that's a benefit to all. Um, so, you know, we, we've been around and around this. Um, this makes logical sense that Donaldson was the first TOD in the state of Tennessee uh, and, and here in Nashville. This downtown Donaldson urban design overlay that we've had for almost a year uh, envisioned a transit-oriented development area around Donaldson Station. The UDO, which is the community's vision for the future, 
will be the guiding document for design standards. That was another reason why it made sense for us to be the first one. And any updates to the, to the UDO will be followed by the TOD. So it's the community's vision. Um, the Music City Star ridership, second piece, continues to increase. Investment in the star was a priority in all three scenarios of the regional transportation plan in motion. Uh, third, investment in the TOD brings to the heart of Donaldson's commercial business district and highlights the regional cooperation. That's one of the things we heard about in the whole transportation improvement program. Where is there a regional uh, cooperation? It's happening right here between Wilson County and Davidson County as we continue to make investments in new and existing train stations to support and substantiate future public investment. This is not just another redevelopment district that benefits developers. This is fundamental community building that benefits both multi-generational and new neighbors in Donaldson and everyone in Davidson County. Three examples. Donaldson's starting to see growth and development and increased property values. The argument has been made that Donaldson is already affordable, so we shouldn't exacerbate the affordability by encouraging more development. To me, that's a myopic argument. At best, it seems to purport that Donaldson lives in a static bubble. Donaldson, like so many communities across Middle Tennessee, is growing and developing and occurring. This is going to continue to happen with or without the TOD. If you look at statistics across the nation for what happens to properties that develop all, or, along rail lines, property values surge. So as multifamily developments occur around Donaldson Station, ensuring we preserve an element of affordability, it's critical for sustainable and equitable growth and development along our transit corridors. This Donaldson TOD will accomplish that. The Donaldson TOD is a critical component of implementing the UDO, which, as I said, is the community's vision for the future. The infrastructure, which is a piece of the TIF, is in and around Donaldson Plaza and Donaldson Station goes back roughly 60 years. Um, it, 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 so the new library is the first project that will take advantage of the TOD's TIF availability to support a true civic anchor for downtown Donaldson. It'll be a catalyst for future private development. Next, the Donaldson TOD is a critical component for supporting long-term ground lease between the Regional Transit Authority and Penrose Properties, where they have a, a, um, a, a deal in place that's waiting for this, to be able to put affordable housing around the Donaldson station. So once this is passed, our RTA, the Penrose team, MDHA, Planning, Public Works, and other departments will begin in earnest to start to create Davidson County's first true multimodal transit center. Um, with that, I ask for your support. Move Thank approval. you. We do have a few people in the queue. Councilmember Cooper. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. I will be <clears throat> quick. Appreciate that it's late. Anyone who voted against the property tax increase last June, that was a difficult vote, should not be voting for this bill because you're making that problem of funding our basic responsibilities even worse. And absolutely, this makes our problems worse. This freezes revenue for Metro and gives any revenue growth away to developer incentives which are not needed. Only a fraction is going to affordable housing. This is the wrong role for MDHA in Nashville. Just because MDHA can give money away, they've been promoted into a role they really shouldn't have. The property owners there, I believe, I've been to several meetings, the property owners there don't want it. Only the inbound developers do. And we're taking fundamentally a tool designed for empty, blighted, valueless property with no people living there and imposing it on Donaldson, one of the most desirable and fastest growing cities in America. Now this is a city also that's used to dealing with the Planning Commission, but now they're being given over to MDHA and it's more cloaked process. Now this is contradictory to the spirit of Metro, to all of us being here. We shouldn't be a city of silos, freezing any tax revenue available for the rest of the city, for our whole community, and then spending that increment on favored developers in special districts. Now do TIF loans work? Well we can't tell because MDHA didn't even keep adequate records to measure whether we got what we incentivized in the past. That's what the last audit showed before the audit committee. And also this is gonna shock people who voted in the transit referendum, 
because it's enacting what was, in fact, the least popular part of the transit plan. So I, again, I just, it's late at night, and I appreciate everybody's attention, but this is not the right vote for the fiscal health of the city. Councilmember Bidding. Okay, so uh, this is kind of like a housekeeping thing. At the planning uh, committee, and also uh, Councilmember Mendez and I had discussed of hosting a meeting to talk about this legislation, just like we just did on the on the fairgrounds. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we were waiting on getting the final information from uh, MDHA, so we could have all the information available to you for you to learn and ask questions and get informed before uh, coming to the council. So because I make that commitment to you all, I need your help in deciding if you still wanna have that meeting or not. And so I'm going to ask for the deferral of one meeting to schedule a meeting in the coming weeks to talk about it. If you don't think you need a meeting, just vote against my uh, deferral request. If you think you need a meeting, then vote for the deferral. It won't hurt my feelings, I just need to know that you know that I honor my commitment to y'all to have that meeting, and so I wanna make a motion to defer for one meeting to be able to have a meeting uh, to discuss this plan. But please, only vote for it if you really wanna have that meeting. If you don't, just vote against it, I'll be fine. Thank you. So we have a motion to defer. There are several people in the queue. Do you wanna speak on the motion? Council Member Freddie O'Connell. Okay, uh, Council Member Freeman, not on the motion. Uh, Council Member Syracuse, on the motion to defer. You're recognized. I think we can do both. Thank you. Um, I, I'm, I'm fine to have that meeting. Um, I think we can talk about TOD from a broad perspective. What lessons learned here and how we go forward and, and, and apply it, because I think it is a useful tool throughout the county. Um, but there are two things. We are in a due diligence period here with uh, holiday properties and the implementation of the Donaldson Library as part of the Donaldson uh, Plaza Master Plan. Uh, we're getting pr pretty close to where Metro uh, needs to hit some timelines, and I'm getting a little worried that it's, it's going to compromise that project. The other thing that it's potentially gonna compromise is the, the deal with, uh, at, at the RTA, at Donaldson Station with, with RTA. Um, obviously, they're looking forward to utilizing the TOD to put affordable housing in and around the, the, the station. So I, I would ask you to, to not defer, but at the same time, I absolutely wanna honor Councilman Bedney's commitment to having a, a meeting to talk about this. I, I think we can still do that. So I'd appreciate if, if we do not defer. Thank you. Any other council members seeking recognition on the motion to defer? Seeing none, we are voting on the motion to defer. All in favor of deferral, say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Let's do a um, machine vote. We are voting on the motion to defer for the purpose of holding an informational meeting. So we are voting to defer. If you vote yes, that would mean we would defer one meeting. If you vote no, that means we will go ahead and vote second reading tonight. Has everyone voted? I believe so. Madam Clerk, can you close the machine? 18 in favor, 15 against, two abstentions. Deferral passes. So. We are on BL 2018-1182, sponsors Karen Johnson. I'm gonna clear out the queue. Thank this you. was, I, I gotta read the caption. Disapproved by the Planning Commission 5 to 1. This changes 1.22 acres from R10 to OL zoning for property located at 355 Bell Road. Council Member Johnson. Committee report. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Bedney. Um, the committee recommended approval 7-4, one against. Thank you, Council Member Johnson. Thank you, I would like to move uh, for approval with a brief explanation. Thank you, you're recognized. Okay, uh, as you see, the committee voted in favor of this. Also, uh, when we had the public hearing, there was no one in opposition. Let me remind everybody, no one in opposition. 
my community is overwhelmingly in support of this change. We had a community meeting with the planning representatives present, and we discussed several options at that community meeting with the planning staff. And the community did not want a policy change, and they would like for this corridor um, to develop in this manner, and this one house is next to a power line, so nothing can be built next to it. Across the street, there are OL properties and a church and a daycare. So with that, I've um, distributed the picture to show you the house and the property next door, which is the power lines. And this property faces Bell Road. It is the last property. It has uh, con uh, townhomes across from it and then commercial and OL uses. So with that, I ask for your support of my community. Thank you. Thank you. We have a motion. Is there a second? second. And moved and seconded. We will need a roll call vote on this. Madam Clerk, if you'll open the machines. This will take 27 votes to pass. So if everybody would run back to your desk and vote real quick, that would be helpful. I believe everyone in the room has voted. Oh, did I do that? <laughs> okay. No, no, we close the machines. 29 in favor and three abstentions. Bill passes. Next is BL 2018-1200. Sponsors Hastings O'Connell. This amends the Metro Code regarding hotels and rooming houses. Councilmember Hastings. Thank you, Madam uh, President. At this time, uh, are all committee reports in? Yes, they are. Okay. With all committee reports reporting, and would like to move for approval. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Councilmember Murphy. I'm sorry. I meant to speak on this on second reading at our last meeting, but um, I was out of the room, and I have spoken with the sponsor. I did try to think through if there was an amendment that I could um, offer that I think would alleviate my concerns. My concern here is this seems to be doing two main things. One, which is really great about mandating receipts for payment and things like that. But the second part of this is that we're telling what is most likely smaller businesses what type of currency that they can receive in payment um, for, for the, the rooms and services. And so um, I know this is very strange coming from most of, coming from me for, for y'all that know me. Um, but I just, I have a problem telling small businesses what type of, of currency they can um, and can't take and taking that choice away from, from small businesses. So I'm gonna be voting no on this one um, and, and maybe some, we can work something out in the future uh, that is, that is uh, more, more business friendly. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no one else in the queue, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Any opposed? Technically, technically, voice vote. I'm sorry, machine vote, technically. It's okay. We're getting good at this. All right. Has everyone voted? <laughs> All right. Okay, Madam Clerk, can you close the machines? 28 in favor, four against. Bill passes. Next is Substitute Bill 2018-1238. Sponsors Sledge changes 1.03 acres from R6 to MULA zoning for properties located at 353, 355, 357 Glenrose Avenue, and 354 Hester Avenue. Council Member Sledge. Move approval. Is there a second? Second. Good. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? 
Bill passes. Next is BL 2018-1246 as amended by Virtue and Withers. This adopts a five-year consolidated plan and 2018 action plan for housing and community development and authorizes the mayor to submit the consolidated plan and 2018 action plan to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Council Member Virtue. She's not here. Councilman Withers. Let me find you. Withers. Withers. Oh, sorry. Council Member Withers. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to, with all committee reports being in, I'd like to uh, move approval of the bill as amended. As amended. Is there a second? It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Any opposed? Bill is passes. Next is BL 2018-1255, sponsors Withers, amends the code pertaining to payroll deductions for benefits administered, administered by the Metro Employee Benefit Board. Council Member Withers. Uh, thank you. Once again, with all committee reports being in, I would like to move approval of the bill on third and final reading. Been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Bill passes. Next is BL 2018-1256, sponsors Allen, Swope, and others. This amends the Metro Code to reinstate allowances for properties in a natural state. Council Member Swope. <laughs> thank Just you. Move approval. <laughs> um, with all committee reports in, I move approval. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Bill passes. Thank you. Next is BL 2018-1257. Sponsors Kendall, Vercher, and others. This approves a lease agreement between Metro and the Christine P. Nall Living Trust for the building located at 337-339-21st Avenue North. Council Member Kendall. It was... Council Member Roberts. Mm -hmm. Oh, Council Member Kendall's on his way. All committee reports are in. Which one? Move approval. Move for approval. Sec <laughs> then move and second it. All in favor? Any opposed? Bill is recommended. Next is BL 2018-1258. Sponsors Robert Schulman, Vercher, and others. This authorizes the acquisition of right-of-way easements, drainage easements, temporary construction easements, and property rights for use in public pro projects for purposes of the James Avenue sidewalk project. Council Member Roberts. I'd like to move for approval. Then moved and seconded. All in favor? Any opposed? Bill passes. Next is BL 2018-1259, sponsors Allen, Vercher, and others. This authorizes the acquisition and right-of-way of easements, drainage easements, temporary construction easements, and property rights for use in public projects for purposes of the 25th Avenue South Sidewalk Improvements. Council Member Elrod, I think you're a sponsor. Can you move this one for me? I move it. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Any opposed? Bill's recommended. I get my sidewalk. Next is BL 2018-1260. Sponsors Anthony Davis, Bircher, and others. This authorizes the acquisition of right-of-way easements, drainage easements, temporary construction easements, and property rights for use in public projects for the purpose of the Stratford Avenue sidewalk improvement projects. Council Member Anthony Davis. Thank you. Move approval. Been moved and seconded. All in favor? Any opposed? No bills passes. Next is BL 2018-1261, sponsors Elrod, Vercher, and Bednay. This authorizes the acquisition of right-of-way easements, drainage easements, temporary construction easements, and property rights for use in public projects for purposes of the Walford Drive sidewalk improvements. Council Member Elrod. Yeah. Been moved and seconded. All in favor? Any opposed? Bill passes. Next is BL 2018-1262, sponsors Bednay. Bednay and Elrod. This authorizes the acquisition of certain right-of-way easements, drainage easements, temporary construction easements, and property rights for use in public projects for purposes of the Hobson Pike sidewalk improvement. Council Member Bednay. I thought I heard my name. You did. Uh, I move to approve. Been moved and seconded. All in favor? Any opposed? Bill passes. Next is BL 2018-1263. Sponsors O'Connell, Bednay, and Elrod. This abandons existing sewer main and easements and to accept new combined sewer main, combined sewer manholes, and easement for property located at 10 11th Avenue South. Council Member O'Connell. Thank you, Madam President. Just for old time's sake, I'd like to see if we could do these committee reports again. Sure. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. I'd like to move approval. This is moved and seconded. All in favor? Any opposed? Bill is passed. Next is BL 2018-1264. Sponsors Kendall, Bednay, and Elrod. This also authorizes Pacific 35th and Peoria LLC to install, construct, and maintain aerial and underground encroachments in the right-of-way located at 350 22nd Avenue North. Councilmember Kendall. Oh my God. Councilmember Bednay. I wanted to know if we could do $49.99 for the fine for the scooters. Sure. <laughs> 
That vote is, ship is sailed. Oh, sorry, I'm on the wrong legislation. Right. I move to approve. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Any opposed? Nope, bill passes. Next is BL 2018-1265, sponsors O'Connell, Ben Day, and Elrod. This abandons a portion of Ewing Avenue and Allen 197 right-of-way. Council Member O'Connell. Thank you, Madam President. I'd like to move approval. Been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Bill's passed. Next is BL 2018-1266, sponsors Hastings, Ben Day, and Elrod. This abandons a portion of Alley 1623 right-of-way. Council Member Hastings, bring us home. Thank you, Madam President. Would like to move for approval. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Bill is recommended. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Whoa! Sorry. Oh my gosh, there's one more sheet. Thank you. Next is BL 2018-1267. Sponsors Syracuse, Bed and Elrod. This abandons a portion of Blue Hills Drive right of way. Councilmember Syracuse, I apologize. That's all right, thank you, move approval. Been moved and seconded, all in favor? Any opposed? No, is there any other business before the council? Councilmember O'Connell. Yeah, I personally I think it's a little late for us to be considering this matter and I'd like to move to defer one meeting. I'm, actually, I'll, I'll move to withdraw after that second. All right, is there a motion to adjourn? We are adjourned. Go home. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit Nashville.gov.